Chapter 25 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 25 Beginning of the Seven Days McDowell coming, but not yet. McClellan resolves on flank movement to the James River. Preparations Battle of Gaines Mill The movement goes on. McClellan charges Stanton with intent to sacrifice the army. On the 26th, the day upon which I had decided as a time for our final advance, the enemy attacked our right in strong force and turned my attention to the protection of our communications and depots of supply. The event was a bitter confirmation of the military judgment which had been reiterated to my superiors from the inception and through the progress of the Peninsular Campaign. I notified the Secretary of War in the following dispatch. 12M. I have just heard that our advanced cavalry pickets on the left bank of Chickahominy are being driven in. It is probably Jackson's advanced guard. If this be true, you may not hear from me for some days, as my communications will probably be cut off. The case is perhaps a difficult one, but I shall resort to desperate measures and will do my best to outmaneuver, outwit, and outfight the enemy. Do not believe reports of disaster, and do not be discouraged if you learn that my communications are cut off, and even Yorktown in possession of the enemy. Hope for the best, and I will not deceive the hopes you formerly placed in me. On the same day I received the following dispatches from the Secretary of War. 6 p.m. Arrangements are being made as rapidly as possible to send you 5,000 men as fast as they can be brought from Manassas to Alexandria and embarked which can be done sooner than to wait for transportation at Fredericksburg. They will be followed by more if needed. McDowell, Banks, and Fremont's force will be consolidated as the Army of Virginia and will operate promptly in your aid by land. Nothing will be spared to sustain you, and I have undoubting faith in your success. Keep me advised fully of your condition. 12.20 p.m. Your telegram of 6.15 has just been received. The circumstances that have hitherto rendered it impossible for the government to send you any more reinforcements than has been done have been so distinctly stated to you by the President that it is needless for me to repeat them. Every effort has been made by the President and myself to strengthen you. King's Division has reached Falmouth. Shields Division and Ricketts Division are at Manassas. The President designs to send a part of that force to aid you as speedily as it can be done. The following was sent at 2.30 p.m. Your dispatch and that of the President received. Jackson is driving in my pickets, etc., on the other side of the Chickahominy. It is impossible to tell where reinforcements ought to go, as I am yet unable to predict result of approaching battle. It will probably be better that they should go to Fort Monroe, and thence according to state of affairs when they arrive. It is not probable that I can maintain telegraphic communication more than an hour too longer. But 5,000 of the reinforcements spoken of in these communications came to the Army of the Potomac, and these reached us at Harrison's Bar after the seven days. In anticipation of a speedy advance on Richmond, to provide for the contingency of our communications with the depot at the White House being severed by the enemy, and at the same time to be prepared for a change of the base of operations to James River, if circumstances should render it advisable, I had made arrangements more than a week previous on the 18th to have transports with supplies of provisions and forage under a convoy of gunboats sent up James River. They reached Harrison's Landing in time to be available for the Army on its arrival at that point. Events soon proved this change of base to be, though most hazardous and difficult, the only prudent course. Early on the 25th, General Porter was instructed to send out reconnoitering parties towards Hanover Courthouse, to discover the position and force of the enemy, and to destroy the bridges on the Tullampotomy as far as possible. Up to the 26th of June, the operations against Richmond had been conducted along the roads leading to it from the east and northeast. The superiority of the James River route as a line of attack and supply is too obvious to need exposition. My own opinion on that subject had been early given. The dissipation of all hope of the cooperation by land of General McDowell's forces deemed to be occupied in the defense of Washington, their inability to hold or defeat Jackson, 
disclosed an opportunity to the enemy and a new danger on my right, and to the long line of supplies from the White House to the Chickahominy, and forced an immediate change of base across the peninsula. To that end, from the evening of the 26th, every energy of the army was bent. Such a change of base in the presence of a powerful enemy is one of the most difficult undertakings in war, but I was confident in the valor and discipline of my brave army, and knew that it could be trusted equally to retreat or advance, and to fight the series of battles now inevitable, whether retreating from victories or marching through defeats. And, in short, I had no doubt whatever of its ability, even against superior numbers, to fight its way through to the James and get a position whence a successful advance upon Richmond would again be possible. Their superb conduct through the next seven days justified my faith. On the same day, 26th, General Van Vliet, Chief Quartermaster of the Army of the Potomac, by my orders telegraphed to Colonel Ingalls, Quartermaster at the White House, as follows. Run the cars to the last moment, and load them with provisions and ammunition. Load every wagon you have with subsistence, and send them the savages' station by way of Bottoms Bridge. If you are obliged to abandon White House, burn everything that you cannot get off. You must throw all our supplies up the James River as soon as possible, and accompany them yourself with all your force. It will be of vast importance to establish our depots on James River without delay if we abandon White House. I will keep you advised of every movement so long as the wires work. After that, you must exercise your own judgment. All these commands were obeyed. On the 26th, orders were sent to all the corps commanders on the right bank of the Chickahominy to be prepared to send as many troops as they could spare on the following day to the left bank of the river. General Franklin received instructions to hold General Slocum's division in readiness by daybreak of the 27th, and, if heavy firing should at that time be heard in the direction of General Porter, to move at once to his assistance without further orders. At noon on the 26th, the approach of the enemy, who had crossed above Meadow Bridge, was discovered by the advanced pickets at that point, and at 12.30 p.m. they were attacked and driven in. All the pickets were now called in, and the regiment and battery at Mechanicsville withdrawn. Meade's brigade was ordered up as reserve in rear of the line, and shortly after, Martindale's and Griffin's brigades of Morell's division were moved forward and deployed on the right of McCall's division, towards Shady Grove Church, to cover that flank. Neither of these three brigades, however, were warmly engaged, though two of Griffin's regiments relieved a portion of Reynolds' line just at the close of the action. The position of our troops was a strong one, extending along the left bank of Beaver Dam Creek, the left resting on the Chickahominy and the right in thick woods beyond the upper road from Mechanicsville to Cold Harbor. The lower, or river, road crossed the creek at Ellison's Mill. Seymour's brigade held the left of the line from the Chickahominy to beyond the mill, partly in woods and partly in clear ground, and Reynolds the right, principally in the woods and covering the upper road. The artillery occupied positions commanding the roads and the open ground across the creek. Timber had been felled, rifle pits dug, and the position generally prepared with a care that greatly contributed to the success of the day. The passage of the creek was difficult along the whole front and impracticable for artillery, except by the two roads where the main efforts of the enemy were directed. At 3 p.m. he formed his line of battle, rapidly advanced his skirmishers, and soon attacked our whole line, making at the same time a determined attempt to force the passage of the upper road, which was successfully resisted by General Reynolds. After a severe struggle, he was forced to retire with very heavy loss. A rapid artillery fire with desultory skirmishing was maintained along the whole front, while the enemy massed his troops for another effort at the lower road about two hours later, which was likewise repulsed by General Seymour with heavy slaughter. The firing ceased and the enemy retired about 9 p.m., the action having lasted six hours, with entire success to our arms. But few, if any, of Jackson's troops were engaged on this day. The portion of the enemy encountered were chiefly from the troops on the right bank of the river, who crossed near Meadow Bridge and at Mechanicsville. The information in my possession soon after the close of this action convinced me that Jackson was really approaching in large force. The position on Beaver Dam Creek, although so successfully defended, had its right flank too much in the air and was too far from the main army to make it available to retain it longer. I therefore determined to send the heavy guns at Hogan's and Gaines' houses over the Chickahominy during the night, 
with as many of the wagons of the Fifth Corps as possible, and to withdraw the Corps itself to a position stretching around the bridges, where its flanks would be reasonably secure, and it would be within supporting distance of the main army. General Porter carried out my orders to that effect. It was not advisable at that time, even had it been practicable, to withdraw the Fifth Corps to the right bank of the Chickahominy. Such a movement would have exposed the rear of the army, placed as between two fires, and enabled Jackson's fresh troops to interrupt the movement to James River by crossing the Chickahominy in the vicinity of Jones Bridge before we could reach Malvern Hill with our trains. I determined then to resist Jackson with the Fifth Corps, reinforced by all our disposable troops in the new position near the bridgeheads, in order to cover the withdrawal of the trains and heavy guns, and to give time for the arrangements to secure the adoption of the James River as our line of supplies in lieu of the Pomonkey. The greater part of the heavy guns and wagons having been removed to the right bank of the Chickahominy, the delicate operation of throwing the troops from Beaver Dam Creek was commenced shortly before daylight and successfully executed. Meade's and Griffin's brigades were the first to leave the ground. Seymour's brigade covered the rear with the horse batteries of Captains Robertson and Tinball, but the withdrawal was so skillful and gradual, and the repulse of the preceding day so complete, that although the enemy followed the retreat closely and some skirmishing occurred, he did not appear in front of the new line in force till about noon of the 27th, when we were prepared to receive him. About this time, General Porter, believing that General Stoneman would be cut off from him, sent him orders to fall back on the White House and afterwards rejoin the army as best he could. On the morning of the 27th of June, during the withdrawal of his troops from Mechanicsville to the selected position already mentioned, General Porter telegraphed as follows. I hope to do without aid, though I request that Franklin or some other command be held ready to reinforce me. The enemy are so close that I expect to be hard-pressed in front. I hope to have a portion in position to cover the retreat. This is a delicate movement, but relying on the good qualities of the commanders of divisions and brigades, I expect to get back and hold the new line. This shows how closely Porter's retreat was followed. Notwithstanding all the efforts used during the entire night to remove the heavy guns and wagons, some of the siege guns were still in position at Gaines House after sunrise, and were finally hauled off by hand. The new position of the Fifth Corps was about an arc of a circle, covering the approaches to the bridges which connected our right wing with the troops on the opposite side of the river. Morell's division held the left of the line in a strip of woods on the left bank of the Gaines Mill stream, resting its left flank on the descent to the Chickahominy, which was swept by our artillery on both sides of the river, and extending into open ground on the right towards New Cold Harbor. In this line, General Butterfield's brigade held the extreme left, General Martindale's joined his right, and General Griffin, still further to the right, joined the left of General Sykes' division, which, partly in the woods and partly in open ground, extended in rear of Cold Harbor. Each brigade had in reserve two of its own regiments. McCall's division, having been engaged on the day before, was formed in a second line in rear of the first. Meade's brigade on the left near the Chickahominy, Reynolds' brigade on the right covering the approaches from Cold Harbor and dispatch station to Sumner's Bridge, and Seymour's in reserve to the second line still further in rear. General P. St. G. Cook, with five companies of the 5th Regular Cavalry, two squadrons of the 1st Regular Cavalry, and three squadrons of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry, Lancers, were posted behind a hill in rear of the position and near the Chickahominy, to aid in watching the left flank and defending the slope to the river. The troops were all in position by noon, with the artillery on the commanding ground, and in the intervals between the divisions and brigades. Besides the division batteries, there were Robertson's and Tinball's horse batteries from the artillery reserve, the latter posted on the right of Sykes' division, and the former on the extreme left of the line in the valley of the Chickahominy. Shortly after noon, the enemy was discovered approaching in force, and it soon became evident that the entire position was to be attacked. His skirmishers advanced rapidly, and soon the fire became heavy along our whole front. At 2 p.m., General Porter asked for reinforcements. Slocum's division of the 6th Corps was ordered to cross to the left bank of the river by Alexander's Bridge and proceed to his support. General Porter's first call for reinforcements through General Barnard did not reach me, nor his demand for more axes through the same officer. 
By 3 p.m. the engagement had become so severe and the enemy were so greatly superior in numbers that the entire second line and reserves had been moved forward to sustain the first line against repeated and desperate assaults along the whole front. At 3.30, Slocum's division reached the field and was immediately brought into action at the weak points of our line. On the left, the contest was for the strip of woods running almost at right angles to the Chickahominy, in front of Adams' house, or between that and Gaines' house. The enemy, several times, charged up to this wood, but were each time driven back with heavy loss. The regulars of Sykes' division, on the right, also repulsed several strong attacks. But our own loss under the tremendous fire of such greatly superior numbers was very severe, and the troops, most of whom had been under arms more than two days, were rapidly becoming exhausted by the masses of fresh men constantly brought against them. When General Slocum's division arrived on the ground, it increased General Porter's force to some 35,000, who were probably contending against about 70,000 of the enemy. The line was severely pressed in several points, and as its being pierced at any one would have been fatal, it was unavoidable for General Porter, who was required to hold his position until night, to divide Slocum's division and send parts of it, even single regiments, to the points most threatened. About 5 p.m., General Porter, having reported his position as critical, French's and Mars' brigades of Richardson's division, 3rd Corps, were ordered to cross to his support. The enemy attacked again in great force at 6 p.m., but failed to break our lines, though our loss was very heavy. About 7 p.m., they threw fresh troops against General Porter with still greater fury, and finally gained the woods held by our left. This reverse, aided by the confusion that followed an unsuccessful charge by five companies of the 5th Cavalry, and followed, as it was, by more determined assaults on the remainder of our lines, now outflanked, caused a general retreat from our position to the hill in rear, overlooking the bridge. French's and Mars brigades now appeared, driving before them the stragglers who were thronging towards the bridge. These brigades advanced boldly to the front, and by their example, as well as by the steadiness of their bearing, reanimated our own troops and warned the enemy that reinforcements had arrived. It was now dusk. The enemy already repulsed several times with terrible slaughter, and hearing the shouts of the fresh troops, failed to follow up their advantage. This gave an opportunity to rally our men behind the brigades of Generals French and Marr, and they again advanced up the hill ready to repulse another attack. During the night, our thin and exhausted regiments were all withdrawn in safety, and by the following morning all had reached the other side of the stream. The regular infantry formed the rear guard, and about six o'clock on the morning of the 28th crossed the river, destroying the bridge behind them. Although we were finally forced from our first line after the enemy had been repeatedly driven back, yet the object sought for had been obtained. The enemy was held at bay. Our siege guns and material were saved, and the right wing had now joined the main body of the army. The number of guns captured by the enemy at this battle was 22, three of which were lost by being run off the bridge during the final withdrawal. Great credit is due for the efficiency and bravery with which this important arm of the service, the artillery, was fought, and it was not until the last successful charge of the enemy that the cannoneers were driven from their pieces or struck down and the guns captured. Dietrichs, Cowarkhams, and Grimm's batteries took the position during the engagement in the front of General Smith's line on the right bank of the stream, and with a battery of siege guns served by the 1st Connecticut Artillery, helped to drive back the enemy in front of General Porter. So threatening were the movements of the enemy on both banks of the Chickahominy that it was impossible to decide until the afternoon where the real attack would be made. Large forces of infantry were seen during the day near the old tavern on Franklin's right, and threatening demonstrations were frequently made along the entire line on this side of the river, which rendered it necessary to hold a considerable force in position to meet them. On the 26th, a circular had been sent to the corps commanders on the right bank of the river, asking them how many of their troops could be spared to reinforce General Porter after retaining sufficient to hold their positions for 24 hours. General Heinzelman replied, I think I can hold the entrenchments with four brigades for 24 hours. That would leave two brigades disposable for service on the other side of the river, but the men are so tired and worn out that I fear they would not be in a condition to fight after making a march of any distance. Telegrams from General Heitzelman on the 25th and 26th had indicated that the enemy was in large force in front of Generals Hooker and Kearney, and on the Charles City Road, 
Longstreet, Hill, and Hooger. And General Heitzelman expressed the opinion on the night of the 25th that he could not hold his advance position without reinforcements. General Keyes telegraphed, As to how many men will be able to hold this position for 24 hours, I must answer. All I have, if the enemy is as strong as ever in front, it having at all times appeared to me that our forces on this flank are small enough. On the morning of the 27th, the following dispatch was sent to General Sumner. General Smith just reports that six or eight regiments have moved down to the woods in front of General Sumner. At 11 o'clock a.m., General Sumner telegraphed, The enemy threatens an attack on my right near Smith. At 12.30 p.m., he telegraphed, Sharp shelling on both sides. At 2.45 p.m., Sharp musketry firing in front of Burns. We are replying with artillery and infantry. The man on the lookout reports some troops drawn up in line of battle about opposite my right and Smith's left. The number cannot be made out. In accordance with orders given on the night of the 26th, General Slocum's division commenced crossing the river to support General Porter soon after daybreak on the morning of the 27th. But as the firing in front of General Porter ceased, the movement was suspended. At 2 p.m., General Porter called for reinforcements. I ordered them at once, and at 3.25 p.m. sent him the following. Slocum is now crossing Alexander's Bridge with his whole command. Enemy has commenced an infantry attack on Smith's left. I have ordered down Sumner's and Heitzelman's reserves, and you can count on the whole of Slocum's. Go on as you have begun. During the day, the following dispatches were received, which will show the condition of affairs on the right bank of the Chickahominy. General Franklin telegraphed, General Smith thinks the enemy are massing heavy columns in the clearings to the right of James Garnett's house and on the other side of the river opposite it. Three regiments are reported to be moving from Sumner's to Smith's front. The arrangements are very good made by Smith. Afterwards, he telegraphed, The enemy has begun an attack on Smith's left with infantry. I know no details. Afterwards, the following, the enemy has opened on Smith a battery of three pieces to the right of the White House. Our shells are bursting well, and Smith thinks Sumner will soon have a crossfire upon them that will silence them. Afterwards, at 5.50 p.m., the following was sent to General Keyes. Please send one brigade of Couch's division to these headquarters without a moment's delay. A staff officer will be here to direct the brigade where to go. Subsequently, the following was sent to Generals Sumner and Franklin. Is there any sign of the enemy being in force in your front? Can you spare any more force to be sent to General Porter? Answer at once. At 5.15 p.m. the following was received from General Franklin. I do not think it prudent to take any more troops from here at present. General Sumner replied, If the general desires to trust the defense of my position to my front line alone, I can send French with three regiments and Mar with his brigade to the right. Everything is so uncertain that I think it would be hazardous to do it. These two brigades were sent to reinforce General Porter, as has been observed. At 5.25 p.m., I sent the following to General Franklin. Porter is hard-pressed. It is not a question of prudence, but of possibilities. Can you possibly maintain your position until dark with two brigades? I have ordered eight regiments of Sumners to support Porter, one brigade of couches to this place. Heinzelman's reserve to go in rear of Sumner. If possible, send a brigade to support Porter. It should follow the regiments ordered from Sumner. At 7.35 p.m., the following was sent to General Sumner. If it is possible, send another brigade to reinforce General Smith. It is said three heavy columns of infantry are moving on him. From the foregoing dispatches, it will be seen that all disposable troops were sent from the right bank of the river to reinforce General Porter and that the corps commanders were left with smaller forces to hold their positions than they deemed adequate. To have done more, even though Porter's reserve had been prevented, would have had the still more disastrous result of imperiling the whole movement across the peninsula. The operations of this day proved the numerical superiority of the enemy, and made it evident that while he had a large army on the left bank of the Chickahominy, which had already turned our right and was in position to intercept communications with our depot at the White House, he was also in large force between our enemy and Richmond. I therefore effected a junction of our forces. This might probably have been executed on either side of the Chickahominy, and if the concentration had been effected on the left bank, it is possible we might, with our entire force, have defeated the enemy there. 
but at that time they held the roads leading to the White House, so that it would have been impossible to have sent forward supply trains in advance of the army in that direction, and the guarding of those trains would have seriously embarrassed our operations in the battle we would have been compelled to fight, if concentrated on that bank of the river. Moreover, we would at once have been following by the enemy's forces upon the Richmond side of the river operating upon our rear, and if, in the chances of war, we had been ourselves defeated in the effort, we would have been forced to fall back to the White House and probably to Fort Monroe, and as both our flanks and rear would then have been entirely exposed, our entire supply train, if not the greater part of the army itself, might have been lost. The movements of the enemy showed that they expected this, and as they themselves acknowledged, they were prepared to cut off our retreat in that direction. I therefore concentrated all our forces on the right bank of the river. During the night of the 26th and morning of the 27th, all our wagons, heavy guns, etc. were gathered there. It may be asked why, after the concentration of our forces on the right bank of the Chickahominy, with a large part of the enemy drawn away from Richmond upon the opposite side, I did not, instead of striking for James River, 15 miles below that place, at once march directly on Richmond. It will be remembered that at this juncture the enemy was on our rear, and there was every reason to believe that he would sever our communications with the supply depot at the White House. We had on hand but a limited amount of rations, and if we had advanced directly on Richmond, it would have required considerable time to carry the strong works around that place, during which our men would have been destitute of food, and even if Richmond had fallen before our arms, the enemy could have still occupied our supply communications between that place and the gunboats, and turned the disaster into victory. If, on the other hand, the enemy had concentrated all his forces at Richmond during the progress of our attack, and we had been defeated, we must in all probability have lost our trains before reaching the flotilla. The battles which continued day after day in the progress of our flank movement to the James, with the exception of the one at Gaines Mill, were successes to our arms, and the closing engagement at Malvern Hill was the most decisive of all. On the evening of the 27th, of June, I assembled the corps commanders at my headquarters and informed them of the plan, its reasons, and my choice of route and method of execution. General Keyes was directed to move his corps, with its artillery and baggage, across the White Oak Swamp Bridge and to seize strong positions on the opposite side of the swamp to cover the passage of the other troops and trains. This order was executed on the 28th by noon. Before daybreak on the 28th, I went to Savage's Station and remained there during the day and night, directing the withdrawal of the trains and supplies of the Army. Orders were given to the different commanders to load their wagons with ammunition and provisions and the necessary baggage of the officers and men, and to destroy all property which could not be transported with the Army. Orders were also given to leave with those of the sick and wounded who could not be transported a proper complement of surgeons and attendants, with a bountiful supply of rations and medical stores. The large herd of 2,500 beef cattle was, by the chief commissary, Colonel Clark, transferred to the James River without loss. On the morning of the 28th, while General Franklin was withdrawing his command from Golding's Farm, the enemy opened upon General Smith's division from Garnett's Hill, from the valley above, and from Gaines Hill on the opposite side of the Chickahominy, and shortly afterwards, two Georgia regiments attempted to carry the works about to be evacuated, but this attack was repulsed by the 23rd New York and the 49th Pennsylvania Volunteers on picket and a section of Mott's Battery. Porter's Corps was moved across White Oak Swamp during the day and night and took up positions covering the roads leading from Richmond towards White Oak Swamp and Long Bridge. McCall's division was ordered on the night of the 28th to move across the swamp and take a proper position to assist in covering the remaining troops and trains. During the same night, the Corps of Sumner and Heitzelman and the Division of Smith were ordered to an interior line, the left resting on Key's old entrenchments and curving to the right so as to cover Savage's station. General Slocum's division of Franklin's Corps was ordered to Savage's station in reserve. They were ordered to hold this position until dark of the 29th in order to cover the withdrawal of the trains and then to fall back across the swamp and unite with the remainder of the army. On the 28th, I sent the following to the Secretary of War. 
Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Savages Station, June 28, 1862, 12.20 a.m. Honorable E.M. Stanton, Secretary of War. I now know the full history of the day. On this side of the river, the right bank, we repulsed several strong attacks. On the left bank, our men did all that men could do, all that soldiers could accomplish. But they were overwhelmed by vastly superior numbers, even after I brought my last reserves into action. The loss on both sides is terrible. I believe it will prove to be the most desperate battle of the war. The sad remnants of my men behave as men. Those battalions who fought most bravely and suffered most are still in the best order. My regulars were superb, and I count upon what are left to turn another battle in company with their gallant comrades of the volunteers. Had I 20,000 or even 10,000 fresh troops to use tomorrow, I could take Richmond. But I have not a man in reserve, and shall be glad to cover my retreat and save the materiel and personnel of the army. If we have lost the day, we have preserved our honor, and no one need blush for the Army of the Potomac. I have lost this battle because my force was too small. I again repeat that I am not responsible for this, and I say it with the earnestness of a general who feels in his heart the loss of every brave man who has been needlessly sacrificed today. I still hope to retrieve our fortunes, but to do this, the government must view the matter in the same earnest light that I do. You must send me very large reinforcements, and send them at once. I shall draw back to this side of the Chickahominy, and think I can withdraw all our materiel. Please understand that in this battle we have lost nothing but men, and those the best we have. In addition to what I have already said, I only wish to say to the President that I think he is wrong in regarding me as ungenerous when I said that my force was too weak. I merely intimated a truth which today has been too plainly proved. If at this instant I could dispose of 10,000 fresh men, I could gain the victory tomorrow. I know that a few thousand more men would have changed this battle from a defeat to a victory. As it is, the government must not and cannot hold me responsible for the result. I feel too earnestly tonight. I have seen too many dead and wounded comrades to feel otherwise than that the government has not sustained this army. If you do not do so now, the game is lost. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. G. B. McClellan End of chapter 25Chapter 26 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 26. Continuation of the Seven Days Battles. Allen's Field. Savage's Station. White Oak Swamp. Charles City Crossroads. Glendale. Malvern Hill. The Army at Harrison's Landing. The headquarters camp at Savage's Station was broken up early on the morning of the 29th and moved across White Oak Swamp. As the essential part of this day's operation was the passage of the trains across the swamp and their protection against attack from the direction of Newmarket and Richmond, as well as the immediate and secure establishment of our communications with the gunboats, I passed the day in examining the ground, directing the posting of troops, and securing the uninterrupted movement of the trains. In the afternoon, I instructed General Keyes to move during the night to James River and occupy a defensive position near Malvern Hill to secure our extreme left flank. General F.J. Porter was ordered to follow him and prolong the line towards the right. The trains were to be pushed on towards James River in rear of these corps and placed under the protection of the gunboats as they arrived. A sharp skirmish with the enemy's cavalry early this day on the Quaker Road showed that his efforts were about to be directed towards impeding our progress to the river, and rendered my presence in that quarter necessary. The difficulty was not at all with the movement of the troops, but with the immense trains that were to be moved virtually by a single road and required the whole army for their protection. With the exception of the cavalry affair on the Quaker Road, we were not troubled during this day south of the swamp but there was severe fighting north of it. 
General Sumner vacated his works at Fair Oaks on June 29th at daylight and marched his command to Orchard Station, halting at Allen's Field between Orchard and Savage's Station. The divisions of Richardson and Sedgwick were formed on the right of the railroad facing towards Richmond, Richardson holding the right and Sedgwick joining the right of Heintelman's Corps. The first line of Richardson's division was held by General French, General Caldwell supporting in the second. A log building in front of Richardson's division was held by Colonel Brooks with one regiment, 53rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, with Hazard's battery on an elevated piece of ground a little in rear of Colonel Brooks' command. At 9 a.m. the enemy commenced a furious attack on the right of General Sedgwick, but were repulsed. The left of General Richardson was next attacked, the enemy attempting in vain to carry the position of Colonel Brooks. Captain Hazard's battery, and Pettit's battery, which afterwards replaced it, were served with great effect, while the 53rd Pennsylvania kept up a steady fire on the advancing enemy, compelling them at last to retire in disorder. The enemy renewed the attack three times, but were as often repulsed. General Slocum arrived at Savage's Station at an early hour on the 29th, and was ordered to cross White Oak Swamp and relieve General Key's Corps. As soon as General Key's was thus relieved, he moved towards James River, which he reached in safety with all his artillery and baggage, early on the morning of the 30th, and took up a position below Turkey Creek Bridge. During the morning, General Franklin heard that the enemy after having repaired the bridges, was crossing the Chickahominy in large force and advancing towards Savage's Station. He communicated this information to General Sumner at Allen's Farm and moved Smith's division to Savage's Station. A little after noon, General Sumner united his forces with those of General Franklin and assumed command. I had ordered General Heinzelman, with his corps, to hold the Williamsburg Road until dark, at a point where were several field works and a skirt of timber between these works and the railroad. Through a misunderstanding of his orders, and being convinced that the troops of Sumner and Franklin at Savage's Station were ample for the purpose in view, Heinzelman withdrew his troops during the afternoon, crossed the swamp at Brackett's Ford, and reached the Charles City Road with the rear of his column at 10 p.m. On reaching Savage's Station, Sumner's and Franklin's commands were drawn up in line of battle in the large open field to the left of the railroad, the left resting on the edge of the woods and the right extending down to the railroad. General Brooks, with his brigade, held the wood to the left of the field, where he did excellent service, receiving a wound but retaining his command. General Hancock's brigade was thrown into the woods on the right and front. At 4 p.m. the enemy commenced his attack in large force by the Williamsburg Road. It was gallantly met by General Burns' brigade, supported and reinforced by two lines in reserve, and finally by the New York 69th, Hazard's, and Pettit's batteries again doing good service. Osborne's and Bram Hall's batteries also took part effectively in this action, which was continued with great obstinacy until between 8 and 9 p.m., when the enemy were driven from the field. Immediately after the battle, the orders were repeated for all the troops to fall back and cross White Oak Swamp, which was accomplished during the night in good order. By midnight, all the troops were on the road to White Oak Swamp Bridge, General French with his brigade acting as rear guard, and at 5 a.m. on the 30th, all had crossed, and the bridge was destroyed. On the afternoon of the 29th, I gave to the Corps commanders their instructions for the operations of the following day. Porter's Corps was to move forward to James River, and with the Corps of General Keyes, to occupy a position at or near Turkey Bend, on a line perpendicular to the river, thus covering the Charles City Road to Richmond, opening communication with the gunboats, and covering the passage of the supply trains, which were rushed forward as rapidly as possible upon Haxall's plantation. The remaining corps were pressed onward and posted so as to guard the approaches from Richmond, as well as the crossings of the White Oak Swamp over which the army had passed. General Franklin was ordered to hold the passage of the White Oak Swamp Bridge and cover the withdrawal of the trains from that point. His command consisted of his own corps with General Richardson's division and General Nagley's brigade, placed under his orders for the occasion. General Slocum's division was on the right of the Charles City Road. On the morning of the 30th, I again gave to the Corps commanders within reach instructions for posting their troops. I found that, notwithstanding all the efforts of my personal staff and other officers, the roads were blocked by wagons, and there was great difficulty in keeping the trains in motion. 
The engineer officers whom I had sent forward on the 28th to reconnoiter the roads had neither returned nor sent me any reports or guides. Generals Keyes and Porter had been delayed, one by losing the road and the other by repairing an old road, and had not been able to send any information. We then knew of but one road for the movement of the troops and our immense trains. It was therefore necessary to post the troops in advance of this road as well as our limited knowledge of the ground permitted, so as to cover the movement of the trains in the rear. I then examined the whole line from the swamp to the left, giving final instructions for the posting of the troops and the obstruction of the roads towards Richmond, and all corps commanders were directed to hold their positions until the trains had passed, after which a more concentrated position was to be taken up near James River. Our force was too small to occupy and hold the entire line from the White Oak Swamp to the river, exposed as it was to be taken in reverse by a movement across the lower part of the swamp, or across the Chickahominy below the swamp. Moreover, the troops were then greatly exhausted and required rest in a more secure position. I extended my examinations of the country as far as Hacksall's, looking at all the approaches to Malvern, which position I perceived to be the key to our operations in this quarter, and was thus enabled to expedite very considerably the passage of the trains and to rectify the positions of the troops. Everything being then quiet, I sent aides to the different corps commanders to inform them what I had done on the left, and to bring me information of the condition of affairs on the right. I returned from Malvern to Hacksall's, and having made arrangements for instant communication from Malvern by signals, went on board of Commander Rogers' gunboat, lying near, to confer with him in reference to the condition of our supply vessels and the state of things on the river. It was his opinion that it would be necessary for the army to fall back to a position below City Point, as the channel there was so near the southern shore that it would not be possible to bring up the transports, should the enemy occupy it. Harrison's Landing was, in his opinion, the nearest suitable point. Upon the termination of this interview, I returned to Malvern Hill, and remained there until shortly before daylight. On the morning of the 30th, General Sumner was ordered to march with Sedgwick's division to Glendale, Nelson's farm. General McCall's division, Pennsylvania Reserves, was halted during the morning on the New Market Road, just in advance of the point where the road turns off to Quaker Church. This line was formed perpendicularly to the New Market Road, with Meade's brigade on the right, Seymour's on the left, and Reynolds' brigade, commanded by Colonel S.G. Simmons of the 5th Pennsylvania, in reserve. Randall's regular battery on the right, Kern's and Cooper's batteries opposite the center, and Dietrich's and Cowerham's batteries of the artillery reserve on the left, all in front of the infantry line. The country in General McCall's front was an open field, intersected towards the right by the New Market Road and a small strip of timber parallel to it. The open front was about 800 yards, its depth about 1,000 yards. On the morning of the 30th, General Heintzelman ordered the bridge at Brackett's Ford to be destroyed, and trees to be felled across that road and the Charles City Road. General Slocum's division was to extend to the Charles City Road. General Kearney's left to connect with General Slocum's left. General McCall's position was to the left of the Long Bridge Road, in connection with General Kearney's left. General Hooker was on the left of General McCall. Between 12 and 1 o'clock, the enemy opened a fierce cannonade upon the divisions of Smith and Richardson and Nagley's Brigade at White Oak Swamp Bridge. This artillery fire was continued by the enemy through the day, and he crossed some infantry below our position. Richardson's division suffered severely. Captain Ayers directed our artillery with great effect. Captain Hazard's battery, after losing many cannoneers, and Captain Hazard being mortally wounded, was compelled to retire. It was replaced by Pettit's battery, which partially silenced the enemy's guns. General Franklin held his position until after dark, repeatedly driving back the enemy in their attempts to cross the White Oak Swamp. At two o'clock in the day, the enemy were reported advancing in force by the Charles City Road, and at half past two o'clock, the attack was made down the road on General Slocum's left, but was checked by his artillery. After this, the enemy, in large force comprising the divisions of Longstreet and A.P. Hill, attacked General McCall, whose division, after severe fighting, was compelled to retire. General McCall, in his report of the battle, says, About half past two, my pickets were driven in by a strong advance, after some skirmishing, without loss on our part. 
At three o'clock, the enemy sent forward a regiment on the left center and another on the right center to feel for a weak point. They were under cover of a shower of shells and boldly advanced, but were both driven back, on the left by the 12th Regiment and on the right by the 7th Regiment. For nearly two hours, the battle raged hotly here. At last, the enemy was compelled to retire before the well-directed musketry fire of the reserves. The German batteries were driven to the rear, but I rode up and sent them back. It was, however, of little avail, and they were soon after abandoned by the cannoneers. The batteries in front of the center were boldly charged upon, but the enemy was speedily forced back. Soon after this, a most determined charge was made on Randall's battery by a full brigade, advancing in wedge shape, without order, but in perfect recklessness. Somewhat similar charges had, I have stated, been previously made on Cooper's and Kern's batteries by single regiments, without success they having recoiled before the storm of canister hurled against them. A like result was anticipated by Randall's battery, and the 4th Regiment was requested not to fire until the battery had done with them. Its gallant commander did not doubt his ability to repel the attack, and his guns did, indeed, mow down the advancing host, but still the gaps were closed, and the enemy came in upon a run to the very muzzles of his guns. It was a perfect torrent of men, and they were in his battery before the guns could be removed. Two guns that were indeed successfully limbered had their horses killed and wounded, and were overturned on the spot, and the enemy, dashing past, drove the greater part of the 4th Regiment before them. The left company, B, nevertheless, stood its ground, with its captain, Fred A. Conrad, as did likewise certain men of other companies. I had ridden into the regiment and endeavored to check them, but with only partial success. There was no running, but my division, reduced by the previous battles to less than 6,000, had to contend with the divisions of Longstreet and A.P. Hill, considered two of the strongest and best among many of the Confederate Army, numbering that day 18,000 or 20,000 men, and it was reluctantly compelled to give way before heavier force accumulated upon them. General Heinzelman states that about 5 o'clock p.m., General McCall's division was attacked in large force, evidently the principal attack, that in less than an hour the division gave way, and adds, General Hooker, being on his left, by moving to his right, repulsed the rebels in the handsomest manner with great slaughter. General Sumner, who was with General Sedgwick in McCall's rear, also greatly aided with his artillery and infantry in driving back the enemy. They now renewed their attack with vigor on General Kearney's left, and were again repulsed with heavy loss. This attack commenced about 4 p.m. and was pushed by heavy masses with the utmost determination and vigor. Captain Thompson's battery, directed with great precision, firing double charges, swept them back. The whole open space, 200 paces wide, was filled with the enemy. Each repulse brought fresh troops. The third attack was only repulsed by the rapid volleys and determined charge of the 63rd Pennsylvania, Colonel Hayes, and half of the 37th New York Volunteers. General McCall's troops soon began to emerge from the woods into the open field. Several batteries were in position and began to fire into the woods over the heads of our men in front. Captain de Russi's battery was placed on the right of General Sumner's artillery with orders to shell the woods. General Burns' brigade was then advanced to meet the enemy and soon drove him back. Other troops began to return from the White Oak Swamp. Late in the day, at the call of General Kearney, General Taylor's 1st New Jersey Brigade, Slocum's Division, was sent to occupy a portion of General McCall's deserted position, a battery accompanying the brigade. They soon drove back the enemy, who shortly after gave up the attack, contenting themselves with keeping up a desultory firing till late at night. Between 12 and 1 o'clock at night, General Heintzelman commenced to withdraw his troops, and soon after daylight, both of his divisions, with General Slocum's division and a portion of General Sumner's command, reached Malvern Hill. On the morning of the 30th, General Sumner, in obedience to orders, had moved promptly to Glendale, and upon a call from General Franklin for reinforcements, sent him two brigades, which returned in time to participate and render good service in the battle near Glendale. General Sumner says of this battle, The Battle of Glendale was the most severe action since the Battle of Fair Oaks. About 3 o'clock p.m. the action commenced, and after a furious contest, lasting till after dark, the enemy was routed at all points and driven from the field. The rear of the supply trains and the reserve artillery of the army reached Malvern Hill about 4 p.m. 
At about this time, the enemy began to appear in General Porter's front, and at five o'clock advanced in large force against his left flank, posting artillery under cover of a skirt of timber, with a view to engage our force at Malvern Hill, while with his infantry and some artillery he attacked Colonel Warren's brigade. A concentrated fire of about thirty guns was brought to bear on the enemy, which, with the infantry fire of Colonel Warren's command, compelled him to retreat, leaving two guns in the hands of Colonel Warren. The gunboats rendered most efficient aid at this time and helped to drive back the enemy. It was very late at night before my aides returned to give me the results of the day's fighting along the whole line and the true position of affairs. While waiting to hear from General Franklin, before sending orders to Generals Sumner and Heintzelman, I received a message from the latter that General Franklin was falling back, whereupon I sent Colonel Colburn of my staff with orders to verify this, and if it were true, to order in General Sumner and Heintzelman at once. He had not gone far when he met two officers sent from General Franklin's headquarters with the information that he was falling back. Orders were then sent to Generals Sumner and Heintzelman to fall back also, and definite instructions were given as to the movement which was to commence on the right. The orders met these troops already en route to Malvern. Instructions were also sent to General Franklin as to the route he was to follow. General Barnard then received full instructions for posting the troops as they arrived. I then returned to Hacksall's and again left for Malvern soon after daybreak. Accompanied by several general officers, I once more made the entire circuit of the position, and then returned to Hacksall's, whence I went with Commander Rogers to select the final location for the army and its depots. I returned to Malvern before the serious fighting commenced, and after riding along the lines and seeing most cause to feel anxious about the right, remained in that vicinity. The position selected for resisting the further advance of the enemy on the 1st of July was with the left and center of our lines resting on Malvern Hill, while the right curved backwards through a wooded country towards a point below Hacksaw's on James River. Malvern Hill is an elevated plateau about a mile and a half by three-fourths of a mile in area, well cleared of timber and with several converging roads running over it. In front are numerous defensible ravines, and the ground slopes gradually towards the north and east to the woodland, giving clear ranges for artillery in those directions. Towards the northwest, the plateau falls off more abruptly into a ravine which extends to James River. From the position of the enemy, his most obvious lines of attack would come from the direction of Richmond and White Oak Swamp, and would almost of necessity strike us upon our left wing. Here, therefore, the lines were strengthened by massing the troops and collecting the principal part of the artillery. Porter's Corps held the left of the line, Sykes' division on the left, Morrell's on the right. With the artillery of his two divisions advantageously posted, and the artillery of the reserve so disposed on the high ground that a concentrated fire of some sixty guns could be brought to bear on any point in his front or left. Colonel Tyler also had, with great exertion, succeeded in getting ten of his siege guns in position on the highest point of the hill. Couch's division was placed on the right of Porter. Next came Kearney and Hooker. Next Sedgwick and Richardson. Next Smith and Slocum. Then the remainder of Key's Corps, extending by a backward curve nearly to the river. The Pennsylvania Reserve Corps was held in reserve, and stationed behind Porter's and Couch's position. One brigade of Porter's was thrown to the left of the low ground to protect that flank from any movement direct from the Richmond Road. The line was very strong along the whole front of the open plateau, but from thence to the extreme right the troops were more deployed. This formation was imperative, as an attack would probably be made upon our left. The right was rendered as secure as possible by slashing the timber and by barricading the roads. Commander Rogers, commanding the flotilla on James River, placed his gunboats so as to protect our flank and to command the approaches from Richmond. Between 9 and 10 a.m. the enemy commenced feeling along our whole left wing, with his artillery and skirmishers, as far to the right as Hooker's division. About 2 o'clock a column of the enemy was observed moving towards our right, within the skirt of woods in front of Heitzelman's corps, but beyond the range of our artillery. Arrangements were at once made to meet the anticipated attack in that quarter, but though the column was long, occupying more than two hours in passing, it disappeared and was not again heard of. The presumption is that it retired by the rear and participated in the attack afterwards made on our left. About 3 p.m. a heavy fire of artillery opened on Kearney's left and Couch's division 
speedily followed up by a brisk attack of infantry on Couch's front. The artillery was replied to with good effect by our own, and the infantry of Couch's division remained lying on the ground until the advancing column was within short musket range, when they sprang to their feet and poured in a deadly volley which entirely broke the attacking force and drove them in disorder back over their own ground. This advantage was followed up until we had advanced the right of our line some seven or eight hundred yards, and rested upon a thick clump of trees, giving us a stronger position and a better fire. Shortly after four o'clock, the firing ceased along the whole front, but no disposition was evinced on the part of the enemy to withdraw from the field. Caldwell's brigade, having been detached from Richardson's division, was stationed upon Couch's right by General Porter, to whom he had been ordered to report. The whole line was surveyed by the general, and everything held in readiness to meet the coming attack. At six o'clock, the enemy suddenly opened upon Couch and Porter with the whole strength of his artillery, and at once began pushing forward his columns of attack to carry the hill. Brigade after brigade, formed under cover of the woods, started at a run to cross the open space and charge our batteries. But the heavy fire of our guns, with the cool and steady volleys of our infantry, in every case sent them reeling back to shelter and covered the ground with their dead and wounded. In several instances, our infantry withheld their fire until the attacking column, which rushed through the storm of canister and shell from our artillery, had reached within a few yards of our lines. They then poured in a single volley and dashed forward with the bayonet, capturing prisoners and colors and driving the routed columns in confusion from the field. About seven o'clock, as fresh troops were accumulating in front of Porter and Couch, Marr and Sickles were sent with their brigades, as soon as it was considered prudent to withdraw any portion of Sumner's and Heintzelman's troops, to reinforce that part of the line and hold the position. These brigades relieved such regiments of Porter's Corps and Couch's division as had expended their ammunition, and batteries from the reserve were pushed forward to replace those whose boxes were empty. Until dark, the enemy persisted in his efforts to take the position so tenaciously defended, but despite his vastly superior numbers, his repeated and desperate attacks were repulsed with fearful loss, and darkness ended the Battle of Malvern Hill, though it was not after nine o'clock that the artillery ceased its fire. The result was complete victory. During the whole battle, Commander Rogers added greatly to the discomfiture of the enemy by throwing shell among his reserves and advancing columns. It was necessary to fall back still further in order to reach a point where our supplies could be brought to us with certainty. As before stated, in the opinion of Commander Rogers, commanding the gunboat flotilla, this could only be done below City Point. Concurring in his opinion, I selected Harrison's Bar as the new position of the Army. The exhaustion of our supplies of food, forage, and ammunition made it imperative to reach the transports immediately. The greater portion of the transportation of the Army having been started for Harrison's landing during the night of the 30th of June and 1st of July, the order for the movement of the troops was at once issued upon the final repulse of the enemy at Malvern Hill. The order prescribed the movement by the left and rear, General Key's Corps, to cover the maneuver. It was not carried out in detail as regards the divisions on the left, the roads being somewhat blocked by the rear of our trains. Porter and Couch were not able to move out as early as had been anticipated, and Porter found it necessary to place a rear guard between his command and the enemy. Colonel Averill, of the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry, was entrusted with this delicate duty. He had under his command his own regiment and Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan's brigade of regular infantry and one battery. By a judicious use of the resources at his command, he deceived the enemy so as to cover the withdrawal of the left wing without being attacked remaining himself on the previous day's battlefield until about 7 o'clock of the 2nd of July. Meantime, General Keyes, having received his orders, commenced vigorous preparations for covering the movement of the entire army and protecting the trains. It being evident that the immense number of wagons and artillery carriages pertaining to the army could not move with celerity along a single road, General Keyes took advantage of every accident of the ground to open new avenues and to facilitate the movement. He made preparations for obstructing the roads after the army had passed, so as to prevent any rapid pursuit, destroying effectually Turkey Bridge on the main road, and rendering other roads and approaches temporarily impassable by felling trees across them. He kept the trains well closed up, 
and directed the march so that the troops could move on either side of the roads, not obstructing the passage, but being in good position to repel an attack from any quarter. His dispositions were so successful that, to use his own words, I do not think more vehicles or more public property were abandoned on the march from Turkey Bridge than would have been left, in the same state of the roads, if the army had been moving towards the enemy instead of away from him. And when it is understood that the carriages and teams belonging to this army, stretched out in one line, would extend not far from forty miles, the energy and caution necessary for their safe withdrawal from the presence of an enemy vastly superior in numbers will be appreciated. The last of the wagons did not reach the site selected at Harrison's Bar until after dark on the 3rd of July, and the rear guard did not move unto their camp until everything was secure. The enemy followed up with a small force, and on the 3rd threw a few shells at the rear guard, but were quickly dispersed by our batteries and the fire of the gunboats. Great credit must be awarded to General Keyes for the skill and energy which characterized his performance of the important and delicate duties entrusted to his charge. High praise is also due to the officers and men of the 1st Connecticut Artillery, Colonel Tyler, for the manner in which they withdrew all the heavy guns during the seven days and from Malvern Hill. Owing to the crowded state of the roads, the teams could not be brought within a couple of miles of the position, but these energetic soldiers removed the guns by hand for that distance, leaving nothing behind. So long as life lasts, the survivors of those glorious days will remember with quickened pulse the attitude of that army when it reached the goal for which it had striven with such transcendent heroism. Exhausted, depleted in numbers, bleeding at every pore, but still proud and defiant, and strong in the consciousness of a great feat of arms heroically accomplished, it stood ready to renew the struggle with undiminished ardor whenever its commander should give the word. It was one of those magnificent episodes which dignify a nation's history and are fit subjects for the grandest efforts of the poet and the painter. Footnote. In the evening before his sudden death in the night, General McClellan had been occupied in preparing, from his memoirs, an article for the Century Magazine. Among the manuscript, which we found next morning lying as he left it, the paragraph above, commencing with the words, So long as life lasts, appeared to be the last work of his pen. The last words he wrote were thus this final expression of his admiration for the Army of the Potomac. I have thought fit to insert them here. W.C.P. End footnote. This movement was now successfully accomplished, and the Army of the Potomac was at last in position on its true line of operations. With its trains intact, no guns lost save those taken in battle when the artillerists had proved their heroism and devotion by standing to their guns until the enemy's infantry were in their midst. During the seven days, the Army of the Potomac consisted of 143 regiments of infantry, 55 batteries, and less than eight regiments of cavalry, all told. The opposing Confederate Army consisted of 187 regiments of infantry, 79 batteries, and 14 regiments of cavalry. The losses of the two armies from June 25th to July 2nd were Confederate Army, 2,823 killed, 13,703 wounded, 3,223 missing, 19,749 total. Army of the Potomac, 1,734 killed, 8,062 wounded, 6,053 missing, 15,849 total. The Confederate losses in killed and wounded alone were greater than the total losses of the Army of the Potomac in killed, wounded, and missing. No praise can be too great for the officers and men who passed through these seven days of battle, enduring fatigue without a murmur, successfully meeting and repelling every attack made upon them, always in the right place, at the right time, and emerging from the fiery ordeal a compact army of veterans, equal to any task that brave and disciplined men can be called upon to undertake. They needed now only a few days of well-earned repose, a renewal of ammunition and supplies, and reinforcements to fill the gaps made in their ranks by so many desperate encounters, to be prepared to advance again with entire confidence to meet their worthy antagonists in other battles. It was, however, decided by the authorities at Washington, 
against my earnest remonstrances to abandon the position on the James and the campaign. The Army of the Potomac was accordingly withdrawn. It was not until two years later that it again found itself under its last commander at substantially the same point on the bank of the James. It was as evident in 1862 as in 1865 that there was the true defense of Washington, and it was on the banks of the James that the fate of the Union was to be decided. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 27. Private Letters. June 26th to August 23rd, 1862. June 26th, 2 p.m. Trent's. Yesterday I wished to advance our picket line and met with a good deal of opposition. We succeeded fully, however, and gained the point with but little loss. The enemy fought pretty hard, but our men did better. I was out there all day taking a personal direction of affairs, and remained until about 5.30 p.m. when I returned to camp, and met on my way the news that Stonewall Jackson was on his way to attack my right and rear. I rode over to Porter's soon after I reached camp and returned about 2.30 a.m. At three, I started off again and went to the front, where an attack was expected by some. Finding all quiet, I rode all along the lines and returned here. You may imagine that I am rather tired out. I think that Jackson will attempt to attack a rear. Have just received the positive information that Jackson is en route to take us in rear. You probably will not hear for some days, but do not be at all worried. General McClellan's headquarters, June 26, 1862. Telegram, in cipher, care of Mr. Eckert, who will regard it as private and strictly confidential, and forward it privately to my wife. Dear Nell, I may not be able to telegraph or write to you for some days. There will be a great stampede, but do not be alarmed. There will be severe fighting in a day or two, but you may be sure that your husband will not disgrace you and I am confident that God will smile upon my efforts and give our arms success. You will hear that we are pursued, annihilated, etc. Do not believe it, but trust that, that success will crown our efforts. I tell you this, darling, only to guard against the agony you would feel if you trusted the newspaper reports. Telegram, June 27th, 1.15 p.m. Heavy firing in all directions. So far we have repulsed them everywhere. I expect wire to be cut any moment. All well and very busy. Cannot write today. Telegram, McClellan's headquarters, June 27th. Have had a terrible fight against vastly superior numbers. Have generally held our own, and we may thank God that the Army of the Potomac has not lost its honor. It is impossible as yet to tell what the result is. I am well, but tired out. No sleep for two nights, and none tonight. God bless you. Telegram, McClellan's Headquarters, June 28th. We are all well tonight. I fear your uncle has been seriously hurt in the terrible fight of yesterday. They have outnumbered us everywhere, but we have not lost our honor. This army has acted magnificently. I thank my friends in Washington for our repulse. June 29th, 3 p.m., in the field. I send you only a line to say that I still think God is with us. We have fought a terrible battle against overwhelming numbers. We have held our own, and history will show that I have done all that man can do. June 30, 7 p.m., Turkey Bridge. Well, but worn out. No sleep for many days. We have been fighting for many days and are still at it. We have fought every day for five days. July 1st, Haxel's Plantation. The whole army is here, worn out and war-worn after a week of daily battles. I have still very great confidence in them and they in me. The dear fellows cheer me as of old as they march to certain death, and I feel prouder of them than ever. July 2nd, Berkeley, James River. 
I have only energy enough left to scroll you a few lines to say that I have the whole army here, with all its materiel and guns. We are all worn out and haggard. My men need repose, and I hope we'll be allowed to enjoy it tomorrow. Your poor uncle was killed at the Battle of Gaines Mills on Friday last. We are well, but very tired. July 2nd, 11 p.m. I will now take a few moments from the rest which I really need and write at least a few words. We have had a terrible time. On Wednesday, the serious work commenced. I commenced driving the enemy on our left and by hard fighting gained my point. Before that affair was over, I received news that Jackson was probably about to attack my right. I galloped back to camp, took a fresh horse, and went over to Porter's camp, where I remained all night making the best arrangements I could, and returned about daybreak to look out for the left. On Thursday afternoon, Jackson began his attack on McCall, who was supported by Porter. Jackson being repulsed, I went over there in the afternoon and remained until 2 or 3 a.m., I was satisfied that Jackson would have force enough next morning to turn Porter's right, so I removed all the wagons, heavy guns, etc. during the night and caused Porter to fall back to a point nearer the force on the other side of the Chickahominy. This was most handsomely effected, all our material being saved. The next day, Porter was attacked in his new position by the whole force of Jackson, Longstreet, Ewell, Hill, and Whiting. I sent what supports I could, but was at the same time attacked on my own front and could only spare seven brigades. With these we held our own at all points after most desperate fighting. It was on this day that your poor uncle, Colonel Russell, was killed, gallantly leading his regiment. He was struck in the breast and died in a few hours. Clitz fell that day also. John Reynolds was taken prisoner. I was forced that night to withdraw Porter's force to my side of the Chickahominy, and therefrom to make a very dangerous and difficult movement to reach the James River. I must say good night now, for I am very tired, and may require all my energies tomorrow. July 4th, Berkeley. You will understand before this reaches you the glorious yet fearful events which have prevented me from writing. We have fine weather today, which is drying the ground rapidly. I was quite stampeded yesterday just before your father left. A report came to me that the enemy were advancing in overwhelming numbers and that none of my orders for placing the troops in position and reorganizing them had been carried out. I at once rode through the camps, clear in front of them, to let them see that there was no danger. They began to cheer as usual and called out that they were all right and would fall to the last man for Little Mac. I saw where the trouble was, halted all the commands, looked at the ground, and made up my mind what the true position was. Started Smith at a double-quick to seize the key point, followed by a battery of horse artillery at a gallop. They went up most beautifully, opened on the enemy, drove him off after 18 rounds, and finally held the place. I pushed Slocum's division up in support, hurried off Heinzelman's corps to take its position on Franklin's left, supported by Keyes still further to the left, and came back to camp a little before dark with a light heart for the first time in many days. I am ready for an attack now. Give me 24 hours even, and I will defy all secession. The movement has been a magnificent one. I have saved all our materiel, have fought every day for a week, and marched every night. You can't tell how nervous I became. Everything seemed like the opening of artillery, and I had no rest, no peace, except when in front with my men. The duties of my position are such as often to make it necessary for me to remain in the rear. It is an awful thing. I have re-established the playing of bands, beating the calls, etc., by way of keeping the men in good spirits, and have ordered the national salute to be fired today at noon from the camp of each corps. I have some more official letters to write, so I must close this, and must soon start to ride around the lines. July, blank, Monday, 7.30 a.m. I have had a good, refreshing night's sleep. We are to have another very hot day, it is already apparent. I am writing in my shirt sleeves and with tent walls raised, etc. Our army has not been repulsed. We fought every day against greatly superior numbers, and were obliged to retire at night to new positions that we could hold against fresh troops. The army behaved magnificently. Nothing could have been finer than its conduct. July 8th. 
The day is insufferably hot, intense, so much so that I have suspended all work on the part of the men. I have written a strong, frank letter to the President, which I send by your father. If he acts upon it, the country will be saved. I will send you a copy tomorrow, as well as of the other important letters, which I wish you to keep as my record. They will show, with the others you have, that I was true to my country, that I understood the state of affairs long ago, and that, had my advice been followed, we should not have been in our present difficulties. I have done the best I could. God has disposed of events as to him seem best. I submit to his decrees with perfect cheerfulness, and as sure as he rules, I believe that all will yet be for the best. Midnight. Everything is quiet now. None awake, save the sentinels. I am alone with you and the Almighty, whose good and powerful hand has saved me and my army. The terrible moments I have undergone of late I regard as part of the cross I have to bear, and with God's help will endure to the end when my task is finished. I place myself in his hands, and with a sincere heart say his will be done. Oh, how ardently I pray for rest. Rest with you. I care not where, only that I may be alone with you. We are to have service at headquarters tomorrow morning, and I will endeavor to have it every Sunday hereafter. Footnote. The following order will be read with interest in this connection. General Orders Number 7. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Washington, September 6, 1861. The Major General Commanding desires and requests that in future there may be a more perfect respect for the Sabbath on the part of his command. We are fighting in a holy cause and should endeavor to deserve the benign favor of the Creator. Unless in the case of an attack by the enemy or some other extreme military necessity, it is commended to commanding officers that all work shall be suspended on the Sabbath, that no unnecessary movements shall be made on that day, that the men shall, as far as possible, be permitted to rest from their labors, that they shall attend divine service after the customary Sunday morning inspection, and that officers and men shall alike use their influence to ensure the utmost decorum and quiet on that day. The general commanding regards this as no idle form. One day's rest in seven is necessary to men and animals. More than this, the observance of the holy day of the God of mercy and of battles is our sacred duty. George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. End footnote. July 9th, 9.30 p.m., Berkeley. I telegraphed you briefly this afternoon that I thought Secesh had retired. This opinion seemed to be fully confirmed, at least to the extent of his having fallen back a certain distance. He is not within six or seven miles of us, even with his cavalry, and considerably further with his infantry. I am not sorry, on the whole, that he has gone, for the reason that it will enable my men to rest tranquilly just what they need. I do not expect to receive many reinforcements for some time. Even Burnside's men are halted at Fortress Monroe by order of the President. His Excellency was here yesterday, and left this morning. He found the army anything but demoralized or dispirited, in excellent spirits. I do not know to what extent he has profited by his visit, not much I fear. I will enclose with this a copy of a letter I handed him which I would be glad to have you preserve carefully as a very important record. My camp is now immediately on the banks of the James River in the woods. 7 a.m., 10th. Rose a little before 6th. I do not know what paltry trick the administration will play next. I have honestly done the best I could. I leave it to others to decide whether that was the best that could have been done, and if they find anyone who can do better, and perfectly willing to step aside and give way. I would not for worlds go through that horrid work again, when, with my heart full of care, I had to meet everybody with a cheerful smile and look as light-hearted as though nothing were at stake. Telegram, Berkeley, July 10th, 1862. We are all very well and in good spirits. Secesh has gone off and left us for the present. Klitz is certainly in Richmond, recovering from his wounds. If properly supported, I will yet take Richmond. Am not in the least discouraged. Am in better health than for many months. Your father returned to Washington two days ago. July 12th. 
I am sure that God will bring us together again in this world, but whether so or not, we will try so to live that we may be reunited in that world where we can be happy forever and never again be parted. In this weary world, I have seen but little happiness save what I have enjoyed with you. How very happy our first year of married life was when we were together. So the baby has more teeth? I suppose when I come back I shall find her handling a knife and fork. When will she begin to say a word or two? I hope she will not begin to do much before I come home. I want to have the fun and satisfaction of watching her progress in life and the development of her accomplishments. I enclose with this letter from Stanton and my reply, which I want you to preserve very carefully with my other archives, as it may be important. July 13th, Sunday, 7.45 a.m. I have ordered all labor suspended today to give the men a chance to think of all they have gone through. We are to have service today by the chaplain of Gregg's Regiment, Pennsylvania Cavalry. Next Sunday, I think I will invite Mr. Neal to preach for us, provided there is any attendance today. I enclose this in an envelope with some letters I send you. One from Bishop McElvain, which will gratify you, I know. Another from some poor fellow in Indiana who has named his child after me. If you choose to send out some little present to it, well and good. 1.30 p.m. Had service this morning by the chaplain of Gregg's Regiment, the Reverend Mr. Egan, an Episcopal clergyman of Philadelphia. There never was such an army, but there have been plenty of better generals. When I spoke about being repulsed, I meant our failure to take Richmond. In no battle were we repulsed. We always at least held our own on the field if we did not beat them. I still hope to get to Richmond this summer, unless the government commits some extraordinarily idiotic act. But I have no faith in the administration, and shall cut loose from public life the very moment my country can dispense with my services. Don't be alarmed about the climate. It is not at all bad yet, and we are resting splendidly. The men look better every day. So you want to know how I feel about Stanton and what I think of him now? I will tell you with the most perfect frankness. I think I may do the man injustice. God grant that I may be wrong for I hate to think that humanity can sink so low. But my opinion is just as I have told you. He has deceived me once. He never will again. Are you satisfied now, lady mine? I ever will hereafter trust your judgment about men. Your woman's tact and your pure heart make you a better judge than my dull apprehension. I remember what you thought of Stanton when you first saw him. I thought you were wrong. I now know you were right. Enough of the creature. Since I reached here, I have received about 8,500 or 9,000 fresh troops. My losses in the battles will not be over 12,000. Burnside has 8,000, about, at Fortress Monroe, where he was detained by order of the President. He has been in Washington and will probably be here himself tonight, when I will know the views of the President. The probability is that I will attack again very soon, as soon as some losses are supplied. I also wish first to get off all the sick and wounded. 11.30 p.m. Have just been at work dictating my report of the recent operations. Got as far as bringing Porter back across the Chickahominy. Please reply to Mr. Blank and say that I thank him and feel deeply grateful for his trust and kind feeling and that I am glad to say that there is no reason for despondency on account of my present position. I flatter myself that this army is a greater thorn in the side of the rebellion than ever, and I most certainly, with God's blessing, intend to take Richmond with it. I trust that we have passed through our darkest time, and that God will smile upon us and give us victory. July 15th, 7.30 a.m. I was amused at a couple of telegrams yesterday urging me to the offensive, as if I were unwilling to take it myself. It is so easy for people to give advice. It costs nothing. But it is a little more difficult for poor me to create men and means, and to wipe out by mere wishes the forces of the enemy. I confess that I sometimes become provoked. I had quite an adventure in a small way last night that was rather ludicrous. I yesterday sent a flag of truce after some wounded men. Schweitzer going on the boat. Well, it appears that he and the doctor on board, between them, allowed a young English nobleman to come down with them, and Raymond was discreet enough to bring him up to headquarters, 
and was apparently quite proud of his prize, wished me to see him. Upon inquiry, I found that he came from Richmond, had no papers or passports, save a pass from the Secesh Secretary of War, and acknowledged that he had surreptitiously slipped into Richmond a couple of weeks ago. This was a pretty kettle of fish. I did not like to hang the young rascal for a spy, for fear of getting up a row with England. I determined he should not go through, so this morning I sent him back to Secessia, and told him to try it again at his peril. The young man was exceedingly disgusted, and has, I presume, by this time come to the conclusion that the fact of being an Englishman is not everywhere a sufficient passport. July 17th, A.M. Generals Dix and Burnside are both here. Burnside is very well, and if the President permits, will bring me large, respectably, reinforcements. I am quite well today, a little disgusted at the stupidity of the people in Washington. You need not be at all alarmed as to my being deceived by them. I know that they are ready to sacrifice me at any moment. I shall not be at all surprised to have some other general made commander of the whole army, or even to be superseded here. 7 p.m. You ask me when I expect to reach Richmond and whether I shall act on the offensive this summer? I am at the mercy of the government. After the first 9,000 or 10,000 men sent to me, they have withheld all further reinforcements. Burnside is halted at Fortress Monroe. With his own troops and those of Hunter, he can bring me some 20,000 troops, but I have no idea of the intentions of the government. If I am reinforced to that extent, I will try it again with the least possible delay. I am not at all in favor of baking on the banks of this river, but am anxious to bring matters to an issue. You need not be at all alarmed lest any of these people flatter me into the belief that they are my friends. It's mighty little flattery or comfort I get out of any of them in these days, I assure you. So you like my letter to the President? I feel that I did my duty in writing it, though I apprehend it will do no good whatever but it clears my conscience to have spoken plainly at such a time. You do not feel one bit more bitterly towards those people than I do. I do not say much about it, but I fear they have done all that cowardice and folly can do to ruin our poor country, and the blind people seem not to see it. It makes my blood boil when I think of it. I cannot resign so long as the fate of the Army of the Potomac is entrusted to my care. I owe a great duty to this noble set of men, and that is the only feeling that retains me. I fear that my day of usefulness to the country is past, at least under this administration. I hope and trust that God will watch over, guide, and protect me. I accept most resignedly all he has brought upon me. Perhaps I have really brought it on myself, for while striving conscientiously to do my best, it may well be that I have made great mistakes that my vanity does not permit me to perceive. When I see so much self-blindness around me, I cannot arrogate to myself greater clearness of vision and self-examination. I did have a terrible time during that week, for I stood alone without anyone to help me. I felt that on me rested everything, and I felt how weak a thing poor mortal erring man is. I felt it sincerely, and shall never, I trust, forget the lesson. It will last me to my dying day. I am very well now, perfectly well, and ready for any amount of fatigue that can be imagined. July 18th, 7.45 a.m. We are to have another very hot day, I fancy. No air stirring, and the atmosphere close and murky. I don't at all wish to spend the summer on the banks of this river. We will fry or bake. If our dear government will show some faint indication of brains or courage, we can finish the work in a short time. I am so sorry that poor Prince is going blind. It is a great pity. I flattered myself that when I become a poor blind soldier, a second Belisarius, Prince would probably lead me about. 9 p.m. I am inclined now to think that the President will make Halleck commander of the army, and that the first pretext will be seized to supersede me in command of this army. Their game seems to be to withhold reinforcements, and then to relieve me for not advancing, well knowing that I have not the means to do so. If they supersede me in the command of the Army of the Potomac, I will resign my commission at once. If they appoint Halleck commanding general, I will remain in command of this army as long as they will allow me to, 
provided the army is in danger and likely to play an active part. I cannot remain as a subordinate in the army I once commanded any longer than the interests of my own Army of the Potomac require. I owe no gratitude to anyone but my own soldiers here, none to the government or to the country. I have done my best for the country. I expect nothing in return. They are my debtors, not I theirs. If things come to pass as I anticipate, I shall leave the service with a sad heart for my country, but a light one for myself. But one thing keeps me at my work, love for my country and my army. Surely no general had ever better cause to love his men than I have to love mine. Confidential to William H. Aspinwall, Esquire, Berkeley, July 19, 1862. My dear Mr. Aspinwall, I again find myself in a position such that I may ere long have to tax your friendship for me. I have reason to believe that General Halleck is to be made Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and, if I am not mistaken, I think I detect the premonitory symptoms of still further changes. I can get no replies from Washington to any of my dispatches. Burnside and his troops are taken out of my hands. I receive no reinforcements, and no hope of them is held out to me. The game, apparently, is to deprive me of the means of moving, and then to cut my head off for not advancing. In other words, it is my opinion that I will be removed from the command of this army in a short time. The present feeling is, I think, merely a continuation of the inveterate persecution that has pursued me since I landed on the peninsula, weakening my command so as to render it inadequate to accomplish the end in view, and then to hold me responsible for the result. I am quite weary of this. If I am superseded in the command of the Army of the Potomac, I shall resign my commission in the service feeling that I can no longer be of use. On the contrary, only in the way. Looking forward to that event, my main object in writing to you is to ask you to be kind enough to cast your eyes about you to see whether there is anything I can do in New York to earn a respectable support for my family. I have no exaggerated ideas or expectations. All I wish is some comparatively quiet pursuit, for I really need rest. Pretty much everything I had has been sacrificed in consequence of my re-entering the service, and when I leave it, I must commence anew and work for my support. That I am quite willing to do. I know that I need not apologize for troubling you in regard to this matter. Please regard this as confidential, except with Mr. Alsop and Mr. Bartlett. I am, my dear sir, most sincerely your friend, George B. McClellan. July 20th a.m. Went on the hospital steamer to see Klitz yesterday. He is doing very well. I saw all the officers and men on board and tried to cheer them up. The visit seemed to do them a great deal of good, and it would have done you good to see how the poor suffering fellows brightened up when they saw me. I wonder whether the baby will know me. I fear that she will be afraid of me and won't come to me. Would not that be mortifying? I hope the dear little thing will take to me kindly. I should feel terribly if she should refuse to have anything to do with me. Bless her sweet little ladyship. She must be a great comfort to you, and we will be happier than any kings and queens on earth if we three are permitted to be together again, and that before May changes much. I want so much to see her again while she is a baby, before she begins to talk and walk and be human. P.M. Which dispatch of mine to Stanton do you allude to? the telegraphic one in which I told him that if I saved the army I owed no thanks to anyone in Washington, and that he had done his best to sacrifice my army? It was pretty frank, and quite true. Of course they will never forgive me for that. I knew it when I wrote it, but as I thought it possible that it might be the last I ever wrote, it seemed better to have it exactly true. The President, of course, has not replied to my letter, and never will. His reply may be, however, to avail himself of the first opportunity to cut my head off. I see it reported in this evening's papers that Halleck is to be the new general-in-chief. Now let them take the next step and relieve me, and I shall at once more be a free man. Later. I believe it is now certain that Halleck is commander-in-chief. I have information this evening from Washington from private sources, which seem to render it quite certain you will have to cease directing your letters to me as commanding United States Army, and let the address be commanding the Army of the Potomac. 
quite as proud a title as the other, at all events. I shall have to remove the three stars from my shoulders and put up with two. Eh bien, it is all for the best, I doubt not. I hope Halleck will have a more pleasant time in his new position than I did when I held it. This, of course, fixes the future for us. I cannot remain permanently in the army after the slight. I must, of course, stick to this army as long as I am necessary to it. I have tried to do my best, honestly and faithfully, for my country. That I have, to a certain extent, failed, I do not believe it to be my fault, though my self-conceit probably blinds me to many errors that others see. But one useful lesson I have learned to despise earthly honors and popular favors as vanities. I am content. I have not disgraced my name, nor will my child be ashamed of her father. Thank God for that. I shall try to get something to do which will make you comfortable, and it will be most pleasant and in the best taste for me that we should lead hereafter a rather quiet and retired life. It will not do to parade the tattered remnants of my departed honors to the gaze of the world. Let us try to live for each other and our child, and to prepare for the great change that sooner or later must overtake us all. I have had enough of earthly honors and place. I believe I can give up all and retire to privacy once more, a better man than when we gave up our dear little home with wild ideas of serving the country. I feel that I have paid all that I owe her. I am sick and weary of all this business. I am tired of serving fools. God help my country. He alone can save it. It is grating to have to serve under the orders of a man whom I know by experience to be my inferior. But so let it be. God's will be done. All will turn out for the best. My trust is in God, and I cheerfully submit to His will. July 22, 7.30 a.m. While I think of it, be very careful what you telegraph, and tell your father the same thing. I have the proof that my secretary reads all my private telegrams. If he has read my private letters to you also, his ears must have tingled somewhat. I am about doing a thing today which will, I suppose, cause the abolitionists and my other friends to drive the last nail in my official coffin. You know that our sick and wounded in Richmond are suffering terribly for want of proper food, medicines, and hospital supplies. I have ordered a boatload of all such things. Lemons, tea, sugar, brandy, underclothing, lint, bandages, chloroform, quinine, ice, etc., etc., to be sent up to General Lee today, to be used at his discretion for the sick and wounded of both armies. I know he would not and could not receive them for our men alone. Therefore, I can only do it in the way I propose, and trust to his honor to apply them properly, half and half. I presume I will be accused now of double-dyed treason, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, etc. What do you think of it? Am I right or wrong? I see that the Pope bubble is likely to be suddenly collapsed. Stonewall Jackson is after him, and the young man who wanted to teach me the art of war will, in less than a week, either be in full retreat or badly whipped. He will begin to learn the value of entrenchments, lines of communication, and of retreat, bases of supply, etc. July 22nd. It is a lovely afternoon, bright and sunny, a pleasant breeze blowing, and everything charming to the eye. The old river looks beautiful today, as bright as when John Smith Esquire and my dusky ancestress, Madame Pocahontas Rolf, née Powhatan, paddled her canoe and children somewhere in this vicinity. If it were not for the accompaniments and present surroundings, it would delight me beyond measure to have you here to see the scenery and some of the fine old residences which stud its banks. The men of two or three generations ago must have lived in great state and comfort here. I suspect they had a pretty good time, interrupted only by the chills and fever, bad luck in gambling and horse racing, and the trouble of providing for their woolly-headed dependents. July 23rd. There is now no doubt about Hollick being made commander-in-chief. The other change will, I feel sure, follow in a very few days, perhaps a week. Popularity, Nell, is a humbug. What good has been done to me or to the country by my popularity in the North? It has not prevented my enemies from withholding all support from me. It did not hinder them from almost ruining my army. It brings me not a man. It will not be worth a breath of air to prevent Halleck being put in my place. July 24th. 
Your father arrived this evening. Took a long ride in the sun today. Our men look better than ever, like real veterans now. Tough, brown, and fearless. I hear nothing yet from Washington, and must confess that I am as indifferent as possible to what they do. If they reinforce me, I am ready to fight harder than ever, and will give Secesh a sharp rub for his capital. If they make it necessary for me to resign, I am quite ready to do so. I presume I shall learn something tomorrow about the destination of Burnside. I can then enable you to guess how matters will go. I am yet in complete ignorance, being no longer taken into the confidence of the powers that be. You ask me whether my self-respect will permit me to remain longer in the service after Halleck's appointment. It will permit me to remain only so long as the welfare of the Army of the Potomac demands, no longer. Don't mind these things. I bide my time. Whatever God sends me, be it defeat and loss of rank, or be it success and honor, I will cheerfully submit to. May God help me in this. July 25th. Started out early in the morning to review Porter's Corps, and spent several hours at it in the hot sun. Then I went to visit the wounded from Richmond. Then I heard that Halleck was here, and was obliged to return to see my master. I think Halleck will support me and give me the means to take Richmond. I am not to be relieved from the command of this army. At least, that does not seem to be the present intention. July 26, 9 p.m. From 9 this morning until 6.30 this evening, I have been among the sick and wounded. More than a thousand came from Richmond last night and were in the steamer. I saw every one of the poor fellows, talked to them all, heard their sorrows, tried to cheer them up, and feel that I have done my duty towards them. If you could have seen the poor, maimed, brave fellows, some at the point of death, brightened up when they saw me and caught my hand, it would have repaid you for much of our common grief and anxiety. It has been the most harrowing day I ever passed, yet a proud one for me too. I realized how these men love and respect me, and I trust that many a poor fellow will sleep more soundly and feel more happily tonight for my visit to them. It makes me feel that they are not forgotten or neglected when their general comes to see them and console them. My men love me very much. What a terrible responsibility this imposes upon me. I pray that God will give me strength to bear it and the wisdom to do what is best. It is an awful load that is imposed upon me by the trust and affection of these poor fellows. End of Part 1, Chapter 27「Twenty Seven of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter Twenty Seven, Part Two. July Twenty Seventh. I can't tell you how glad I am that I went to see all those poor wounded men yesterday. Another batch will come tonight, and I will, if possible, go to see all of them tomorrow morning. I regard it as a duty I owe the poor fellows. Rather a hard one to perform, but still one that cannot be neglected. You ask me whether I advise the President to appoint Halleck. The letter of which I sent you a copy is all that ever passed on the subject, either directly or indirectly. Not another word than is there written. We never conversed on the subject. I was never informed of his views or intentions and even now have not been officially informed of the appointment. I only know it through the newspapers. In all these things the President and those around him have acted so as to make the matter as offensive as possible. Fitz Porter has stuck through it all most nobly. He is all that I thought him, and more. Nothing has depressed him. He is always cheerful, active, and ready. July 28th, 9.15 a.m. Some 500 wounded came down last night, and this morning I am going out to the boats to see them. I have collected an armful of papers to give the poor fellows. 9.30 p.m. I am very tired, for I saw and talked to every one of the wounded men today, being occupied all day at it. Between the closeness of the cabins and being on my feet so long, I am quite weary. I enclose with this some lines a poor wounded fellow handed me yesterday and begged me to accept. They were written while he was lying wounded and under fire. I don't know that the poetry possesses any particular merit, but the incident is interesting. 
My friend was of the Hibernian persuasion. Queer fellows those Irish are. There is a vein of humor in everything they do, even when suffering from wounds and sickness. I sometimes can hardly keep from laughing when talking with some poor fellow who is desperately wounded. So strangely and peculiarly do they describe things. I think I will go to the general hospital today and see how those poor fellows are getting on. I am still on my back awaiting a decision from Washington. Burnside is still kept from me. I am getting no reinforcements and presume that Burnside will be ordered to Washington the first thing I know. Then I shall be in a pretty predicament, too strong to remain here and too weak to advance. P.M. I hear nothing as yet from Washington and begin to believe that they intend and hope that I and my army may melt away under the hot sun. Secesh is very quiet of late, scarcely even a cavalry skirmish. He is almost too quiet for good, and must be after some mischief. Maybe we will have a visit from Merrimack No. 2. What a row it would create among the transports. I am in hopes that I will receive orders of some kind from Washington this evening. I am getting dreadfully tired of doing nothing. I begin to feel the want of a little quiet excitement. I could rest at home away from my men, but the idea of remaining quietly in camp, with an army about me and an active enemy at some mischief or other, is a very different thing. 10.30 p.m. Nothing tonight from Washington, so that I am yet completely in the dark as to the intentions of our benign government. July 29th. What do you think I have been doing for the last half hour? Guess, guess. I have been sewing on buttons and patching my woolen shirts. I have waited in vain for Charles to do anything of the kind, or to have it done, and have been nearly scratched to pieces by the numberless pins that were necessary to keep myself together. So I dove into the pocket of my carpet bag, and to my intense delight, found a needle and a spool of sewing silk. Off came my shirt, and at it I went con amore. I was so delighted with the result of that operation that I pulled out of my trunk a clean one that I had been casting sheep's eyes but found too ragged to wear. That I fixed up, and I am now as grand as any king with two shirts to my name that I can wear. My friend Charles has no idea the advantages of mending clothes, and as he has a very short memory, it is not of much use to tell him. So you see how the mighty are fallen the general of a hundred thousand men, sewing on buttons and mending his own clothes. It carried me back to the unhappy days of my miserable bachelorhood. Thank heaven that that epoch of my existence is past and gone. By the way, did I tell you of that gorgeous smoking cap that was sent to me the other day? I must take the first opportunity to send it home. It is entirely too magnificent for camp, and I fear too much so for me under any circumstances. Should I take a fancy to go to a fancy ball as the Doge of Venice or the King of Persia, it might make a first-rate headdress, but would hardly do for anything short of that. We might make a look at it a standing reward for the baby whenever she is particularly good. I have no doubt it would make her open her eyes. July 30th, 10.15 p.m. Another day elapsed, and nothing from Washington. I have positive information today that the command of this army was pressed upon Burnside and that he preemptorily refused it. I learn that Meggs is very anxious for it. Much good may it do him. I still think from all that comes to me that my chances are at least that I will be superseded. We are relieved today by a little excitement. The gunboats reported that six rebel gunboats, including Mr. Merrimack No. 2, were on the way down. So we were, for some hours, considerably brightened up by the prospect of seeing a shindy. But it turned out to be a false report. I see, among other lies, that the papers say that the enemy drove off 500 of our beef cattle the other day. A lie out of whole cloth. I am sorry to say that I learned that too much faith must not be arrested in Halleck. I hope it is not so, but will be very careful how far I trust him or any other man in these days. He has done me no good yet. July 31st. This morning I visited the General Hospital, not far from here, and went through it all, finding the patients comfortable and all improving in health. They are nearly all in hospital tents and are well provided for. In truth, they are about as well off as they could be away from home, and many of them doubtless better off than they would be there. I find the men more contented than the officers. 
I confess that the men enlist my sympathies much more warmly than the officers. They are so patient and devoted. They have generally entered the service, too, from higher and more unselfish motives. Poor fellows! I can never willingly break the link that unites me to them, and I shall always be very proud of them and of their love for me, even if it is not decreed by Providence that I am to lead them to Richmond. After the long time that has elapsed without my hearing anything from Washington, I can hardly hope to learn anything by today's mail. But I assure you that we are all becoming very impatient at the long delay here, so unnecessary as it seems to us. I commenced turning over a new leaf today, that is, neither writing nor telegraphing the Washington, and have about determined to draw back into my shell until the oracle deigns to speak. I have said all I well can. I have told them about all I think and know, have pointed out to them what I regard as the general effects of the course I fear they are likely to adopt. Words can no further go. By saying more and repeating what has already been said, I should only render myself ridiculous and a bore. So I will be silent, and if they send me the order I dread, that of withdrawing this army, I will make one last desperate appeal, and then let matters take their course. Confident that I have honestly endeavored to do the best I could, although I may not have done as well as others could. There is a great consolation in feeling that one has tried to do right and not been actuated by selfish motives. Of the last, I know that I am free, and would say so were I now on my deathbed. Don't feel at all discouraged. If I have to begin the world anew and work as hard as ever, it is doubtless all for the best. When I return to civil life, I shall have the consolation of knowing that I am working for you and the baby. I don't know what rest is, and probably never shall. But as long as God gives me health and strength, and my mind remains clear, it is better that I should work. I am not so fond of it, but that I should like to rest. But if that cannot be, I will do my best and try to do my duty ever. I have told you the result of the interview with Halleck, thus far practically nothing. Not a word have I heard from Washington since his return there. I shall not write or telegraph another word until I hear from them, unless something of great importance occurs. I shall stand on what is left of my dignity now. 1 a.m. As I was just about comfortably asleep about three-quarters of an hour ago, I was awakened by a tremendous shelling. The rascals opened on us with field guns from the other side of the river and kept up a tremendous fire. It is now pretty much over, but still going on. No shells have burst nearer than 300 or 400 yards from my camp. It took me about five minutes to awaken Marcy. He did not hear a single shot. Still some firing, now heavy again, gunboats at work. They were very slow in getting ready. A queer thing, this, writing a letter to my wife at this time of night to the music of shells. I fear they must have done some harm. Now they are quiet again. There goes a whopper from the gunboats. Queer times, these. 1.30 a.m. Pretty quiet now. Only an occasional shot, apparently from the gunboats. There goes one. Now another. Marcy and I have just been discussing another people in Washington, and conclude that they are a mighty trifling set. Indeed, it is very criminal to leave me thus without one word of information as to their plans and purposes. If any lives have been lost tonight, the guilt, another shot, is on their shoulders, for I told them that I desired to occupy with Burnside's troops the very point whence this firing has come tonight, another shot. But I begin to believe that they wish this army to be destroyed. 245. Tired of waiting for Hammerstein's return with the news of the damage done. Well, he has just returned. It was so dark that no one could tell what the damage was. One man at Fitzporter's headquarters had his leg shot off. No vessel set on fire. The camp's all quiet. August 1st, midnight. Everything quiet since I went to bed last night. Not a shot fired. We had ten men killed, twelve wounded, half a dozen horses killed. Vessels not hurt a bit. One shell did fall on my camp. Fitz Porter caught the most of the storm, but had only one man killed. This afternoon I sent a party across the river to where most of the firing came from to cut down some timber that obstructs the view and burn some houses that the enemy had been using as observatories and to screen their pickets. It was all done successfully, without opposition. It turned out, as I supposed, that the guns used were field guns, with which they ran away as soon as they found the gunboats and our own guns were getting troublesome. 
I had a very friendly letter from Halleck this morning. June 2nd. Circumstances have made it unavoidable for me to send out two important expeditions on a large working party, although it is Sunday. One of the expeditions goes to Malvern, the other on the south side of the James River. I had quite an interesting visit on the other side today. The place we burned up yesterday was a very handsome one. It was a rather hard case to be obliged to do it, but it could not be avoided. I had, as usual, not a single word from Washington today from anyone, nor anything from Burnside. If the latter is really under orders for the Rappahannock, there is something very strange in his failure to communicate with me, not even giving me the slightest hint of it. Therefore, I am disposed to discredit Commodore Wilkes' report, and to think that he must be mistaken in regard to it. If he is ordered to the Rappahannock, I believe that this army will be withdrawn from here. When you contrast the policy I urge in my letter to the President with that of Congress and of Mr. Pope, you can readily agree with me that there can be little natural confidence between the government and myself. We are the antipodes of each other, and it is more than probable that they will take the earliest opportunity to relieve me from command and get me out of sight. I shall endeavor to pursue the plain path of duty. As I have often told you, my mind is prepared to endure anything that a man of honor can. But I shall consult my own sense of right and my own judgment, not deferring to that of others when my own convictions are strong. There are some things to which I cannot submit, and to which nothing can induce me to yield. 7.30 a.m., August 3rd, same letter. One of my expeditions of last night failed, had to come back because the guides lost the way, We'll try it again tonight or tomorrow. The other one not yet heard from, but has, I hope, met with better luck than the first. Everything quiet during the night. No firing and no stampede of any kind. Berkeley, August 4th, 6.30 p.m. I was off on the other side of the river all day yesterday, where I had a hot and fatiguing tramp on foot, besides getting a little damp in the rain. Our enterprises on that side of the river were quite successful. I found a splendid position to cover that bank, so as to enable us to cross the army if necessary, as well as to prevent any more midnight serenades like that of last week. I now hold the other shore with a sufficient number of troops to prevent a surprise. Averill went out with three squadrons, met and thrashed an entire regiment, drove them to and through their camp, which he captured and leisurely destroyed thus rendering the 13th Virginia Cavalry exceedingly uncomfortable last night, for all their tents, provisions, cooking utensils, and baggage were effectively burned up. He got some prisoners and sabred a respectable number, having only two wounded himself. The 5th Regular Cavalry and the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry did the work. 11.30 p.m. I had a note from Burnside this evening. He has been ordered to the Rappahannock and has, I presume, started. Not one word have I heard on that subject from Washington. Halleck has begun to show the cloven foot already. I have a large expedition out tonight, a couple of divisions of infantry and some 2,000 cavalry, to try to catch the Secesh who are at Malvern Hill. Shall not hear from them before tomorrow noon. Colburn has gone with them. 7 a.m. Pretty sharp cannonading has been going on in my front this morning. Hooker's command at Malvern. They are still cracking away pretty sharply. Have not heard details, but will ride out in that direction. August 5th, Malvern Hill, 1 p.m., to General Marcy. Hooker has been entirely successful in driving off the enemy. Took about 100 prisoners, killed and wounded several. The mass escaped under cover of a thick fog. Hooker's dispositions were admirable, and nothing but the fog prevented complete success. We have lost three killed and 11 wounded, among the latter two officers. I shall retain the command here tonight. Keep all things ready to move out should we be attacked. I shall not return before dark and may remain all night. We'll send in for my blankets and ambulance if I stay. I am now starting to look over the ground. I have sent a party to communicate with Avril, directing him to take post tonight near Nelson's farm. We'll send in again as soon as I return from my ride. Excuse the illegibility of this, as it is written on horseback and the flies trouble Dan. The enemy is in strong force at Newmarket. Better send a special dispatch to Halleck and tell him that I hate to give up this position. Secesh is under cover, 
and though he is in strong force, I can beat him if they will give me reinforcements. Send this to Nell if I do not get back in time for mail. August 7th, 11 p.m. I have been so situated for the last two days that I could not write to you. Spent night before last at Malvern and had no means of writing. I came in from there yesterday and was up nearly all night giving orders and securing reports in regard to the abandonment of the position. Was not very well off at Malvern. My ambulance lost the road, came near being bagged by the enemy, and did not make its appearance until late next day, so I had nothing. I got some coffee and some bread from one of the companies, used my saddle blanket and saddle for a bed, and got through the night without mishap. August 8th, Berkeley. I can't convey any idea of the heat today. It has been intense, not a breath of air stirring. Received some reports from Pleasanton that the enemy are pressing him hard near Malvern Hill, and gave the necessary orders. I am in strong hopes that the enemy will be foolish enough to drive Pleasanton in and attack me in this position. I have ordered P to draw them on, if possible, and if they come in sight, will try to keep my men concealed and do my best to induce them to attack me. Should they be so foolish as to do that, I will surely beat them and follow them up to Richmond. But I fear they are too smart for that. I can hardly hope for so much good luck. If it is a possible thing to humbug them into an attack, I will do it. I will issue tomorrow an order giving my comments on Mr. John Pope. I will strike square in the teeth of all his infamous orders and give directly the reverse instructions to my army. Forbid all pillaging and stealing and take the highest Christian ground for the conduct of the war. Let the government gainsay it if they dare. I am willing to fall in such a cause. I will not permit this army to degenerate into a mob of thieves, nor will I return these men of mine to their families as a set of wicked and demoralized robbers. I will never have that sin on my conscience. I have received my orders from Halleck. I cannot tell you what they are, but if you will bear in mind what I have already written to you, you can readily guess them when I say that they are as bad as they can be, and that I regard them as almost fatal to our cause. I have remonstrated as warmly as I know how to do, but to no avail. My only hope is that I can induce the enemy to attack me. I shall, of course, obey the orders, unless the enemy give me a very good opening, which I should at once avail myself of. I have learned through private sources that they have not yet determined how to dispose of me personally. Their game is to force me to resign. Mine will be to force them to place me on leave of absence, so that when they begin to reap the whirlwind that they have sown, I may still be in position to do something to save my country. With all their faults, I do love my countrymen, and if I can save them, I will yet do so. I had another letter from Halleck tonight. I strongly suspect him. August blank. Shortly after that, a windstorm set in with great violence. It knocked over my desk and broke it. The desk fell on the table and broke one leaf off. It broke my monkey. Did you know I had a menagerie? Footnote. In the Gulf States, a monkey is the name given to a porous pottery jug or large bottle of water, which hangs by a cord and cools the water by evaporation. End footnote. Scattered my papers to the four corners of the tent and brought all the orderlies in with a terrific rush. Finally, they righted and gathered everything together so that I am now comfortable again, except damages and the flies. The gust has cooled the air, however, so we are gainers. No rain has fallen here, but the wind is from our dear old north, and is therefore doubly pleasant to me. The fact is, I don't like the south. It is entirely too hot to suit me, and I am sure I don't envy the possessors of it in the least. I wish you could see what a business I am doing, as I write, in the way of spearing flies. Every time, nearly, that I dip the pen in the inkstand, out comes a, de a defunct fly. I am so glad you visited that hospital. I thank you for it from the bottom of my heart. I know it did them infinite good, and I am sure that you will never meet one of the Army of the Potomac without a kind word and your brightest smile. August 10th, 8 a.m. Halleck is turning out just like the rest of the herd. The affair is rapidly developing itself, and I see more clearly every day their settled purpose to force me to resign. I am trying to keep my temper. I have no idea that I will be with this army 
more than two or three weeks longer, and should not be surprised any day or hour to get my walking papers. 4 p.m. The absurdity of Halleck's course in ordering the army away from here is that it cannot possibly reach Washington in time to do any good, but will necessarily be too late. I am sorry to say that I am forced to the conclusion that H is very dull and very incompetent. Alas, poor country. I hope to be ready tomorrow afternoon to move forward in the direction of Richmond. I will try to catch or thrash Longstreet, and then, if the chance offers, follow in to Richmond while they are lambing away at Pope. It is, in some respects, a desperate step, but it is the best I can do for the nation just now, and I would rather even be defeated than retreat without an effort to relieve Washington in the only way at all possible. If I fail, why, well and good, I will fall back. If I win, I shall have saved my country, and will then gracefully retire to private life. I am getting the sick away quite rapidly now, but they are in large numbers, and it is, at best, a slow process. The heavy baggage is all being stored on board ship, so that in whatever direction we move we will be comparatively unencumbered. I shall send off all that I have, except a carpet bag and a pair of blankets, change my large tent for a wall tent, and go about as light as any of them. I half apprehend that they will be too quick for me in Washington, and relieve me before I have the chance of making the dash. If so, well and good. I am satisfied that the dolts in Washington are bent on my destruction, if it is possible for them to accomplish it. Midnight. I received a very harsh and unjust telegram from Halleck this morning, and a very friendly private letter from the same individual. Blows hot and cold. I replied to his telegram, closing by quietly remarking, the present moment is probably not the proper one for me to refer to the unnecessarily harsh and unjust tone of your telegrams of late. It will, however, make no difference in my official action. Under the circumstances, I feel compelled to give up the idea of my intended attack upon Richmond, and must retrace my steps. Halleck writes that all the forces in Virginia, including Pope, Burnside, etc., are to be placed under my command. I doubt it. They are committing a fatal error in withdrawing me from here, and the future will show it. I think the result of their machination will be that Pope will be badly thrashed within ten days, and that they will be very glad to turn over the redemption of their affairs to me. August 11th. I am free to chat with you for a few minutes, at least until the impetuous Hatter runs in and asks the General to be good enough to come to breakfast. Our breakfasts are not very splendid or tempting just now. Probably a little ham or beef steak, coffee, bread, and butter. Never any ice for breakfast, that is very seldom, if ever. And hot as blazes. In this climate, one needs cool and light food, fruit, etc. But we don't get much of that sort of thing. I have been hard at work all day and expect to keep at it until I get this army away from Fortress Monroe. Unless my head is chopped off in the meantime. A circumstance I am in daily expectation of occurring and can't say that I much dread. I presume Pope is having his hands quite full today. He's probably being hard-pressed by Jackson. I cannot help him in time, as I have not the means of transportation, but I foresee that the government will try to throw upon me the blame of their own delays and blunders. So be it. I have learned to endure and shall continue to as long as the good of the country requires that I do so, but not one moment longer than that. P.M. You see that Halleck has done otherwise than to reinforce me. Quite the reverse. Burnside is at Acquia. I strongly suspect that one reason for their not imparting their plans to me is that they have very few to impart. They are drifting, not steering the poor ship of state, and I fear they will be wrecked ere long. If they do read our letters in Washington, they must feel one ear tingle occasionally. You need not dread any engagement at present. The powers won't let me go after the enemy, and I am quite sure that they won't be kind enough to come after me. It is scarcely possible that we can have anything more than a mere affair of rear guards. I don't think now that will occur, so make your mind quite easy. Cherrystone Inlet, August 14th, 2 a.m. Left camp yesterday morning at 7 o'clock in a gunboat to go to the telegraph station at Jamestown Island, so that I could talk with Halleck with less loss of time. On arriving there, I found that the wires were not working through, and went straight on to Fortress Monroe, arriving there about 8.30 p.m. 
There I ascertained that the cable to this place was broken, so I took a steamer and came over here, arriving at 11 p.m. Halleck came to the Washington office about one and a half or two hours ago. I have sent him several telegrams, and his first reply is just arriving in cipher. I presume I am in for sitting up all night. The steamer is about two miles from here, came that distance in a rowboat. This is an abandoned secesh city, consisting of one house in the wilderness, so I am not likely to be disturbed. Porter, Ingalls, Colburn, and Key are with me. They are all sound asleep, so I have no one to distract my attention. I must confess, however, that as I went to bed very late last night and have had no sleep since the morning, I am rather sleepy myself. But I can't just now indulge in the luxury. 3.30 a.m. We have just got back to the steamer, and I am getting underway to return to Fort Monroe, where I go direct to camp in a fast boat. My communication with Halleck was unsatisfactory in the extreme. He did not even behave with common politeness. He is a bien mauvais sujet. He is not a gentleman. I am writing by a dim light and confess that I am very tired and very much disgusted. I fear that I am very mad and think I have a perfect right to be so. Every day convinces me more and more that it is the intention of Halleck and the government to drive me off, and I begin to feel that I cannot preserve my self-respect and remain in the service much longer. I think the crisis will soon arrive. Berkeley, August 14th, returned about noon. On my way down, I stopped at the site of the old settlement of Jamestown. There is nothing left of it but the brick tower of the church and the churchyard. The oldest tombstone I could decipher was of 1698. I saw one of a poor young wife, only 16 years and 11 months. I plucked a couple of poor little flowers from the site of the church and enclosed them in this, only to show you that you are sometimes in my thoughts. Porter's Corps starts this evening, Franklin in the morning, the remaining three tomorrow and the next day. Headquarters will remain here until nearly the last. We are going, not to Richmond, but to Fort Monroe, I am ashamed to say. It is a terrible blow to me, but I have done all that could be done to prevent it, without success. So I must submit as best I can and carry it out. I shall, of course, conduct the march to Fortress Monroe and attend to the embarkation thence. My mind is pretty much made up to try hard to break off at that point. August 17th, 3 p.m. Barrett's Ferry, Chickahominy. I have the greater part of the army now over, and if we are not disturbed for six hours more, all will be well. I have abandoned neither men nor materiel, and the retreat has been conducted in the most orderly manner and is a perfect success, so far as so disgusting an operation can be. I learned that all the troops in Virginia are to be placed under my command. Burnside came down to assure me from Halleck that he, H, is really my friend. Kiswa. I hope to get everything over tonight, and will be at my old headquarters at Williamsburg tomorrow evening, next day at Yorktown. If all is then quiet, I will go thence by water to Fortress Monroe and complete the arrangements for embarking. I took a savage satisfaction in being the last to leave my camp at Berkeley yesterday. August 18th p.m., Williamsburg. I am pretty well tired out, for I have been much in the saddle lately, besides having slept very little. I crossed the Chickahominy yesterday and remained there today until all the troops had crossed and moved several miles in advance. When I left, the bridge was taken up and nothing but a few worthless stragglers left behind. They will all be brought over tonight, I think, so far as they are concerned individually. I would much prefer that success should capture them all. I have made a remarkably successful retreat, left absolutely nothing behind. Secesh can't find one dollar's worth of property if he hunts a year for it. I have not seen the enemy since we started. I rather doubt whether he knows where we are now. It will take a long time to embark this army and have it ready for action on the banks of the Potomac. The men all know that I am not responsible. I have remained constantly with the rear guard, was the very last one to leave our camp at Berkeley, remained on the Chickahominy until the bridge was removed, and still have the proud satisfaction of hearing the cheers of the men as I pass, seeing their faces brighten up. Strange as it may seem, they have not, I think, lost one particle of confidence in me and love me just as much as ever. Pleasanton has done splendidly. I placed him in command of the rear guard of the main column, and nothing could have been better than his performance. He is really a fine officer, cool, collected, and intelligent. 
I have felt every moment that I was conducting a false movement, and which was altogether against my own judgment and that of the army. I have done it without demoralizing the army. Fortress Monroe, August 20th, A.M. Arrived here yesterday afternoon. The retreat is successfully accomplished, and the troops have commenced embarking. A good many have left already. August 21st, 4 p.m., Fort Monroe. I've just returned from an examination of this fort and the rip raps. The whole of Porter's Corps got off last night. Heinzelman from Yorktown today. Franklin commences to embark here and at Newport News tomorrow. Sumner will reach here tomorrow and commence embarking as soon as transports are ready, probably in a couple of days. I do not know what they intend doing with me. I still think they will place me on the shelf or do something disagreeable to get me out of the way. I shall be glad of anything that severs my connection with such a set. I have had nothing from Washington today. As they do not see fit to give me any information either as to their intentions or their situation, I shall ask no more questions, nor will I make any more suggestions. They may go to the deuce in their own way, and I think are moving in that direction with sufficient rapidity to gratify secession exceedingly. Met with a terrible misfortune today. In entering the ambulance, I tore the last uniform coat I had, except that one an inch thick, which I cannot well wear in this hot weather. So I am in citizen's dress. I shall be in a terrible predicament for citizen's clothes when I come home, and will have to remain Purdue in the daytime until I get some clothes to wear, for it will not do for me to appear in uniform. 8 p.m. Just received a telegram from Halleck stating that Pope and Burnside are very hard-pressed, urging me to push forward reinforcements and to come myself as soon as I possibly can. I am going to the fortress now to hurry on my arrangements, shall put headquarters on board a vessel tomorrow morning, and probably go myself in a fast boat tomorrow afternoon. Now they are in trouble, they seem to want the Quaker, the procrastinator, the coward, and the traitor. Bien, my ambulance is ready, and I must go. August 22nd, 10 a.m. I did not get back from the fort until sometime after midnight, and too tired to write. I shall go to the fort pretty soon, and as soon as the tents are dry, move everything on board the vessels, so that I shall be ready to start at a moment's notice. I have two corps off and away. I think they are all pretty well scared in Washington, and probably with good reason. I am confident that the disposition to be made of me will depend entirely on the state of their nerves in Washington. If they feel safe there, I will no doubt be shelved, perhaps placed in command here, vice General Dix. I don't care what they do. Would not object to being kept here for a while, because I could soon get things in such condition that I could have you here with me. Their sending for me to go to Washington only indicates a temporary alarm. If they are at all reassured, you will see that they will soon get rid of me. I shall be only too happy to get back to quiet life again, for I am truly and heartily sick of the troubles I have had, and am not fond of being a target for the abuse and slander of all the rascals in the country. Well, we will continue to trust in God and feel certain that all is for the best. It is often difficult to understand the ways of providence, but I have faith enough to believe that nothing is done without some great purpose. August 23rd, 9.30 p.m., Steamer, City of Hudson. I am off at last and on the way to Aquia. We are pounding along up the Potomac now, and as the boat is a fast one, are passing everything we find. We will reach Aquia sometime after midnight. Early in the morning, I will telegraph to Halleck, informing him of my arrival and asking for orders. I have no idea what they will be, nor do I know what has been happening on the Rappahannock yesterday and today. I take it for granted that my orders will be as disagreeable as it is possible to make them, unless Pope is beaten, in which case they will want me to save Washington again. Nothing but their fears will induce them to give me any command of importance or to treat me otherwise than with discourtesy. End of chapter 27《
McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan Chapter 28 Letters of General Halleck and General Birdside Correspondence with Secretary Stanton His Professions of Devotion The Truth Burnside to McClellan Old Point, July 15, 1862 My dear Mac, I have just arrived from Washington and have not time to get ready to go up this morning, but will tomorrow. I have much to say to you and am very anxious to see you. The President has ordered me to remain here for the present, and when I asked him how long, he said five or six days. I don't know what it means, but I do know, my dear Mac, that you have lots of enemies. But you must keep cool. Don't allow them to provoke you into a quarrel. You must come out all right. I'll tell you all tomorrow. Your old friend, Burn. Burnside to McClellan, Fort Monroe, August 2nd, 1862. My dear Mac, I'm laid up with a lame leg, and besides, I'm much worried at the decision they have chosen to make in regard to your army. From the moment I reached Washington, I feared it would be so, and I am of the opinion that your engineers had much to do with bringing about the determination. When the conclusion was arrived at, I was the only one who advocated your forward movement. I speak now as if a positive decision had been arrived at, which I do not know, and you, of course, do. My present orders indicate it. But you know what they are and all about it, so I will accept it as something that is ordered for the best. Let us continue to give our undivided support to the cause, and all will be well. It looks dark sometimes, but a just God will order everything for the best. We can't expect to have it all as we wish. I am off for my destination and will write you a long letter from there. The troops are nearly all embarked. Goodbye. God bless you. Your old friend, A. E. Burnside. Halleck to McClellan, unofficial. Washington, July 30th, 1862. Major General G. B. McClellan, commanding, etc., Army of the Potomac. My dear General, you are probably aware that I hold my present position contrary to my own wishes, and that I did everything in my power to avoid coming to Washington. But after declining several invitations from the President, I received the order of the 11th instant, which left me no option. I have always had strong personal objections to mingling in the politico-military affairs of Washington. I never liked the place, and I like it still less at the present time. But aside from personal feelings, I really believe that I could be much more useful in the West than here. I had acquired some reputation there, but here I could hope for none and I greatly feared that, whatever I might do, I should receive more abuse than thanks. There seemed to be a disposition in the public press here to cry down any one who has attempted to serve the country instead of party. This was particularly the case with you, as I understand, and I could not doubt that it would be in a few weeks the case with me. Under these circumstances, I could not see how I could be of much use here. Nevertheless, being ordered, I was obliged to come. In whatever has occurred heretofore, you have had my full approbation and cordial support. There was no one in the army under whom I could serve with greater pleasure. And now I ask of you that same support and cooperation, and that same free interchange of opinion as in former days. If we should disagree in opinion, I know that we will do so honestly and without unkind feelings. The country demands of us that we act together and with cordiality. I believe that we can and will do so. Indeed, we must do so if we expect to put down this rebellion. If we permit personal jealousies to interfere for a single moment with our operations, we shall not only injure the cause but ruin ourselves. But I am satisfied that neither of us will do this, that we will work together with all our might to bring the war to an early termination. I have written to you frankly, assuring you of my friendship and confidence, believing that my letter would be received with the same kind feelings in which it is written. Yours truly, H. W. Halleck. Halleck to McClellan, Headquarters of the Army, Washington, August 7th, 1862. Major General McClellan, Berkeley. My dear General, your private letter of the first instant was received a day or two ago, but I have been too busy to answer it sooner. If you still wish it, I will order Barnard here, but I cannot give you another engineer officer, unless you will take Benham, for you already have a larger proportion than anyone else. I had most of the time in the West only two, and you, with no larger force, have a dozen engineer officers. 
I fully agree with you in regard to the manner in which the war should be conducted, and I believe the present policy of the President to be conservative. I think some of General Pope's orders very injudicious, and have so advised him. But as I understand they were shown to the President before they were issued, I felt unwilling to ask him to countermand them. An oath of allegiance taken through force is not binding, and to put over the lines those who did not take it is only adding numbers to the rebel army. What he has made the general rule should only be the exceptions, and I have so advised him. I deeply regret that you cannot agree with me as to the necessity of reuniting the old army of the Potomac. I, however, have taken the responsibility of doing so, and am willing to risk my reputation on it. As I told you when at your camp, it is my intention that you shall command all the troops in Virginia as soon as we can get them together, and with the army thus concentrated, I am certain that you can take Richmond. I must beg of you, General, to hurry along this movement. Your reputation, as well as mine, may be involved in its rapid execution. I cannot regard Pope and Burnside as safe until you reinforce them. Moreover, I wish them to be under your immediate command, for reasons which it is not necessary to specify. As things now are, with separate commands, there will be no concert of action, and we daily risk being attacked and defeated in detail. I would write you more fully, but nearly all my time is occupied with the new drafts and enlistments. They are doing well, but several weeks must elapse before we can get the troops into the field. Bragg seems to be concentrating a large force against Buell, and the latter is asking for reinforcements. When he will reach Chattanooga is a problem I am unable to solve. Footnote. Note by the editor. In his private diary, August 15th, Warden, page 452, Mr. Secretary Chase writes, Went to War Department. Stanton said Halleck had sent Burnside to James River to act as second-in-command, or as advisor of McClellan, in reality, to control him. Writing September 2nd, Mr. Chase, Shuckers, page 448, says that he saw General Halleck on his return from visiting McClellan, and proceeds, I cannot fix the date. It was late in July. He unreservedly condemned McClellan's whole military operations, and especially the conduct of the engagement before Richmond, and the subsequent retreat to the James. About this time I saw a good deal of General Pope. He condemned General McClellan's conduct more and in stronger terms than General Halleck, and said that in conversation he found Halleck quite agreed with him, but adverse to precipitate action. End footnote. Yours truly, H.W. Halleck. Secretary Stanton to General McClellan. Telegram, Cipher, Headquarters, Department of War, Washington, July 5, 1862, to 20 p.m. Major General George B. McClellan, Commanding Army of the Potomac. I have nominated for promotion General E.V. Sumner as Brevet Major General of the Regular Service and Major General of Volunteers. Generals Heintzelman, Keyes, and Porter as Brevet Brigadiers in the Regular Service and Major Generals of Volunteers. The gallantry of every officer and man in your noble army shall be suitably acknowledged. General Marcy is here and will take you cheering news. Be assured that you have the support of this department and the government as cordially and faithfully as was ever rendered by man to man. And if we should ever live to see each other face to face, you will be satisfied that you have never had from me anything but the most confiding integrity. Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Secretary Stanton to General Marcy, War Department, Washington City, D.C., July 5, 1862. Dear General, I have to hasten to the country on account of the illness of one of my children, and must therefore forego the pleasure of your company. I leave a brief note for the General, having intended to write him at large, but you can explain to him much than I would say. Yours truly, Edward M. Stanton. The following is the brief note referred to in the foregoing. Secretary Stanton to General McClellan, War Department, Washington City, D.C., July 5, 1862. Dear General, I've had a talk with General Marcy and meant to have written you by him, but I'm called to the country where Mrs. Stanton is with her children to see one of them die. I can therefore only say, my dear General, in this brief moment, that there is no cause in my heart or conduct for the cloud that wicked men have raised between us for their own base and selfish purposes. No man had ever a truer friend than I have been to you, and shall continue to be. You are seldom absent from my thoughts, and I am ready to make 
any sacrifice to aid you. Time allows me to say no more than that I pray Almighty God to deliver you and your army from all peril and lead you on to victory. Footnote. See note at end of the chapter. End footnote. Yours truly, Edwin M. Stanton. General McClellan to Secretary Stanton, Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Harrison's Landing, Virginia, July 8, 1862. Dear Sir, Your letter of the 5th instant by General Marcy has made a deep impression on my mind. Let me, in the first place, express my sympathy with you in the sickness of your child, which I trust may not prove fatal. I shall be better understood by you, and our friendly relations will become more fixed if I am permitted to recur briefly to the past. When you were appointed Secretary of War, I considered you my intimate friend and confidential advisor. Of all men in the nation, you were my choice for that position. It was the unquestionable prerogative of the President to determine the military policy of the administration and to select the commanders who should carry out the measures of the government. To any action of this nature, I could, of course, take no personal exception. But from the time you took office, your official conduct towards me as Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the United States, and afterwards as Commander of the Army of the Potomac, was marked by repeated acts done in such manner as to be deeply offensive to my feelings and calculated to affect me injuriously in public estimation. After commencing the present campaign, your concurrence in the withholding of a large portion of my force, so essential to the success of my plans, led me to believe that your mind was warped by a bitter personal prejudice against me. Your letter compels me to believe that I have been mistaken in regard to your real feelings and opinions, and that your conduct, so unaccountable to my own infallible judgment, must have proceeded from views and motives which I did not understand. I have made this frank statement because I thought that it would best accord with the spirit of your communication. It is with a feeling of great relief that I now say to you that I shall at once resume on my part the same cordial confidence which once characterized our intercourse. You have more than once told me that together we could save this country. It is yet not too late to do so. To accomplish this, there must be between us the most entire harmony of thought and action, and such I offer you. The crisis through which we are passing is a terrible one. I have briefly given, in a confidential letter to the President, my views. Please ask to see it. As to the policy which ought to govern this contest on our part. You and I, during last summer, so often talked over the whole subject that I have only expressed the opinions then agreed upon between us. The nation will support no other policy. None other will call forth its energies in time to save our cause. For none other will our armies continue to fight. I have been perfectly frank with you. Let no cloud hereafter arise between us. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding, Honorable E.M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Note by the Editor. There is no more sorrowful page in the story of men and of peoples than this, in which it becomes necessary, for the truth of history, to bring together the evidence of a war secretary's private treason to the general in the field, fighting his country's battles. It is unnecessary to draw on the countless sources of private evidence which exist, since the testimony of secretaries Chase and Wells and Postmaster General Blair, his associates in Mr. Lincoln's cabinet, suffice without extending the miserable record of Mr. Stanton's falsehood and shame, to show his continuous personal hostility to General McClellan from the time of his entering the cabinet in January, at the precise date of writing the above telegram and letter of July 5th, and during the rest of McClellan's campaigns. Mr. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy in the cabinet with Mr. Stanton, in his work Lincoln and Seward, New York, 1874, says, page 190, With the change in the War Department in January 1862 came the hostility of Secretary Stanton to McClellan, then General-in-Chief. Page 191. This unwise letter, the Harrison's Bar letter, and the reverses of the Army, with the act of hostility of Stanton, brought Halleck, a vastly inferior man, to Washington. On coming to Washington, Pope, who was ardent, and I think courageous, though not always discreet, very naturally fell into the views of Secretary Stanton, who improved every opportunity to denounce McClellan and his hesitating policy. Pope also reciprocated the commendations bestowed on him by Halleck, 
by uniting with Stanton and General Scott in advising that McClellan should be superseded and Halleck placed in charge of military affairs at Washington. This, combined with the movements and the disasters before Richmond, and his own imprudent letter, enabled Stanton to get rid of McClellan at headquarters. Page 193. But Pope was defeated, and the army, sadly demoralized, came retreating to the Potomac. The War Department, and especially Stanton and Halleck, became greatly alarmed. On the 30th August, in the midst of these disasters, and before the result had reached us, though most damaging information in regard to McClellan, who lingered at Alexandria, was current, the Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Chase, called upon me with a protest, signed by himself and Stanton, denouncing the conduct of McClellan and demanding his immediate dismissal. Two other members were ready to append their names after mine. I declined to sign the paper, which was in the handwriting of Stanton. Not that I did not disapprove of the course of the general, but because the combination was improper and disrespectful to the president. I had doubted the wisdom of recalling the Army of the Potomac from Richmond, therein differing from Chase and Stanton. The object in bringing that army back to Washington in order to start a new march overland and regain the abandoned position I did not understand, unless it was to get rid of McClellan. The president never knew of this paper, but was not unaware of the popular feeling against that officer, in which he sympathized, and of the sentiments of the members of the cabinet, aggravated by the hostility and strong if not exaggerated rumors sent out by the Secretary of War. Both Stanton and Halleck were, however, filled with apprehensions beyond others, as the army of stragglers and broken battalions on the last of August and first of September came rushing toward Washington. Mr. S. B. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury in the same cabinet, writing shortly after September 2, 1862, says, From the day the President told me McClellan was beaten, and I saw his dispatches announcing his retreat towards the James River, I never entertained a doubt of the necessity of withdrawing the army altogether, if it was to remain under his command, and I expressed this opinion at once to the President. The military men said that to attempt to withdraw the army would involve the loss of all its materiel, ammunition, guns, provisions, and stores. Mr. Chase then refers to the visit of General Marcy at Washington, on which occasion Mr. Stanton's letter of July 5th was written, and what General Marcy had said, and continues. The danger of withdrawal, the impossibility of strengthening the army for an advance on Richmond from the position to which it had retreated, the certainty that no vigorous effort would be made by McClellan, by unexpected blows south of the James, to retrieve the disasters north of it, the possibility of the loss of the entire army, convinced me, and convinced the Secretary of War, that the command of the Army of the Potomac should be given to some more active officer. We propose to the President to send Pope to the James, and give Mitchell the command of the Army in front of Washington, which had been placed under Pope. The President was not prepared for anything so decisive, and sent for Halleck and made him Commander-in-Chief. Shuckers, Life, etc. of S.P. Chase, page 447. After Pope's defeat, Mr. Chase says, The President himself gave the command of the fortifications and the troops for the defense of Washington to McClellan. It was against my protest and that of the Secretary of War. Ibid, page 450. August 29th, Mr. Chase writes, The Secretary of War called on me in reference to General McClellan. He has long believed, and so have I, that General McClellan ought not to be trusted with the command of any army of the Union and the events of the last few days have greatly strengthened our judgment. We called on General Halleck and remonstrated against General McClellan commanding. Secretary wrote and presented to General H. a call for a report touching MCC's disobedience of orders and consequent delay of support to Army of Virginia. General H. promised answer tomorrow morning. Warden's account, etc. of S.P. Chase, page 456. On August 30th, Mr. Chase states that he and Mr. Stanton prepared and signed a paper expressing their judgment of McClellan. Ibid, page 456. September 1st, Mr. Chase states, On suggestion of Judge Bates, the remonstrance against McClellan, which had been previously signed by Smith, was modified, and having been further slightly altered on my suggestion, was signed by Stanton, Bates, and myself, and afterward by Smith. 
Wells declined to sign it on the ground that it might seem unfriendly to the president, though this was the exact reverse of its intent. He said he agreed in opinion and was willing to express it personally. This determined us to await the cabinet meeting tomorrow. Ibid, page 458. The testimony of Postmaster General Blair will be found further on in connection with accounts of the cabinet meeting on September 2nd, as given by Secretaries Chase and Wells. When Mr. Stanton had succeeded, as he supposed, in depriving McClellan of command by his ironical order of August 30th, and when the peril of the capital and country led Mr. Lincoln on September 2nd to appeal to McClellan to save them, Mr. Stanton openly declared, says Mr. Blair, that he would rather see the capital lost than McClellan restored to command. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of McClellan's Own Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. Chapter 29 The Army at Harrison's Bar. Indecision at Washington. The Harrison's Bar Letter, Army Ordered Home, Protests of McClellan, On the Bank of the James River the Fate of the Union Should Be Decided, Transportation Not Provided, Withdrawal of the Army, Transfer to Front of Washington. When the troops reached the James, the first want of the men was something to eat and drink, and the next a bath in the river. As I rode among the men, they would cry to me for their supper and upon my assuring them that they should have it, they would give their usual cheers and be perfectly content. For two or three days after we reached Harrison's Bar, the banks of the river were crowded all day long with the men bathing. It should be understood that in time of action, every army reduces itself to two of unequal strength. One, the fighting men, who stick by their colors as long as life and strength last and are ever ready to meet the enemy the other consisting of the weaker men, and those prone to straggle, and those not too fond of unnecessary combat. The better the discipline of the army, the larger the first category, and vice versa. It must be confessed that the contingent of stragglers was pretty large on our arrival at the James, but after a day or two all had rejoined their colors and were ready for work again. A very few days sufficed to give the men the necessary rest, and the army was then in condition to make any movement justified by its numbers, and was in an admirable position for an offensive movement. It was at last upon its true line of operations, which I had been unable to adopt at an earlier day in consequence of the Secretary of War's preemptory order of the 18th of May, requiring the right wing to be extended to the north of Richmond in order to establish communication with General McDowell. General McDowell was then under orders to advance from Fredericksburg, but never came, because, in spite of his earnest protest, these orders were countermanded from Washington, and he was sent upon a fruitless expedition towards the Shenandoah, instead of being permitted to join me, as he could have done, at the time of the affair of Hanover Courthouse. I urged in vain that the Army of the Potomac should remain on the line of the James, and that it should resume the offensive as soon as reinforced to the full extent of the means in possession of the government. Had the Army of the Potomac been permitted to remain on the line of the James, I would have crossed to the south bank of that river, and while engaging Lee's attention in front of Malvern, had made a rapid movement in force on Petersburg, having gained which I would have operated against Richmond and its communications from the west, having already gained those from the south. Subsequent events proved that Lee did not move northward from Richmond with his army until assured that the Army of the Potomac was actually on its way to Fort Monroe, and they also found that, so long as the Army of the Potomac was on the James, Washington and Maryland would have been entirely safe under the protection of the fortifications and a comparatively small part of the troops then in that vicinity, so that Burnside's troops and a large part of the Union Army of Virginia might, with entire propriety, have been sent by water to join the army under my command, which, with detachments from the west, could easily have been brought up to more than 100,000 men disposable on the actual field of battle. 
in spite of my most pressing and oft-repeated entreaties, the order was insisted upon for the abandonment of the Peninsula Line and the return of the Army of the Potomac to Washington in order to support General Pope, who was in no danger so long as the Army of the Potomac remained on the James. With a heavy heart, I relinquished the position gained at the cost of so much time and blood. As an evidence of my good faith in opposing this movement, it should be mentioned that General Halleck had assured me, verbally and in writing, that I was to command all the troops in front of Washington, including those of Generals Burnside and Pope, a promise which was not carried into effect. On the 1st of July, I received the following from the President. It is impossible to reinforce you for your present emergency. If we had a million of men, we could not get them to give you in time. We have not the men to send. If you are not strong enough to face the enemy, you must find a place of security and wait, rest, and repair. Maintain your ground if you can, but save the army at all events, even if you fall back to Fort Monroe. We still have strength enough in the country, and we'll bring it out. In a dispatch from the President to me on the 2nd of July, he says, If you think you are not strong enough to take Richmond just now, I do not ask you to. Try just now to save the Army materiel and personnel, and I will strengthen it for the offensive again as fast as I can. The governors of 18 states offer me a new levy of 300,000, which I accept. On the 2nd of July, the following was received from General Barnard. Private. Headquarters, July 2nd, 1862. Dear General, It seems to me the only salvation is for this army to be ready promptly to reassume the offensive. For this we must immediately push our forces further forward or we are bagged. Besides being able to shell us out, the enemy will entrench us in, and shutting us up here with a small force be off for Washington. The fresh troops, how many? The fresh troops, how many, now here or on the river, ought to enable us to push out at once and to assume an offensive as soon as our old army can be rested. But we need large reinforcements. The state of affairs is concealed in Washington to hide their own blunders, and the country will not respond to the crisis unless it is known. We need 200,000 more men to fill up the ranks and form new regiments. A large part of Halleck's force, all that can be withdrawn, should come from the West. There is no use in writing. Should you not send at once an officer who will not be afraid to speak? And though such a messenger does not open his lips except to Lincoln and Stanton, the public will soon know that there is something concealed. It should be done by all means. Today we must get ourselves enough out to save being shut in. There is no use in entrenching a line of no real utility, and what Duane can do today will only wear out his men for nothing. It is troops alone that can help us today. By tomorrow we will be able to know where to entrench. We must have fresh troops immediately in large numbers, and I would, if necessary, abandon Norfolk and New Bern to get them, and all the useless coast of South Carolina and Georgia, holding only Fort Pulaski. Pensacola is of no use, but I suppose may be held with few troops. Yours, etc., J.G. Barnard. On the 3rd of July, the following was received from the President. Yours of 5.30 yesterday is just received. I am satisfied that yourself, officers, and men have done the best you could. All accounts say better fighting was never done. 10,000 thanks for it. On the 4th, I sent the following to the President. July 4th, 1862. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your dispatch of the second instant. I shall make a stand at this place and endeavor to give my men the repose they so much require. After sending my communication on Tuesday, the enemy attacked the left of our lines, and a fierce battle ensued, lasting until night. They were repulsed with great slaughter. Had their attack succeeded, the consequences would have been disastrous in the extreme. This closed the hard fighting which had continued from the afternoon of the 26th Ultimo, in a daily series of engagements wholly unparalleled on this continent for determination and slaughter on both sides. The mutual loss in killed and wounded is enormous, that of the enemy certainly greatest. On Tuesday morning, the 1st, our army commenced its movement from Hacksaws to this point, our line of defense there being too extended to be maintained by our weakened forces. Our train was immense, 
and about 4 p.m. on the 2nd a heavy storm of rain began, which continued during the entire day until the forenoon of yesterday. The roads became horrible. Troops, artillery, and wagons moved on steadily, and our whole army, men, and material was finally brought safe into this camp. The last of the wagons reached here at noon yesterday. The exhaustion was very great, but the army preserved its morale, and would have repelled any attack which the enemy was in condition to make. We now occupy a line of heights about two miles from the James, a plain extending from there to the river. Our front is about three miles long. These heights command our whole position and must be maintained. The gunboats can render valuable support upon both flanks. If the enemy attack us in front, we must hold our ground as we best may and at whatever cost. Our positions can be carried only by overwhelming numbers. The spirit of the army is excellent. Stragglers are finding their regiments, and the soldiers exhibit the best result of discipline. Our position is by no means impregnable, especially as a morass extends on this side of the high ground from our center to the James on our right. The enemy may attack in vast numbers, and if so, our front will be the scene of a desperate battle, which, if lost, will be decisive. Our army is fearfully weakened by killed, wounded, and prisoners. I cannot now approximate to any statement of our losses, but we were not beaten in any conflict. The enemy were unable by their utmost efforts to drive us from any field. Never did such a change of base, involving a retrograde movement, and under incessant attacks from a most determined and vastly more numerous foe, partake so little of disorder. We have lost no guns except 25 on the field of battle, 21 of which were lost by the giving way of McCall's division under the onset of superior numbers. Our communications by the James River are not secure. There are points where the enemy can establish themselves with cannon or musketry and command the river, and where it is not certain that our gunboats can drive them out. In case of this, or in case our front is broken, I will still make every effort to preserve at least the personnel of the army and the events of the last few days leave no question that the troops will do all that their country can ask. Send such reinforcements as you can. I will do what I can. We are shipping our wounded and sick and landing supplies. The Navy Department should cooperate with us to the extent of its resources. Commodore Rogers is doing all in his power in the kindest and most efficient manner. When all the circumstances of the case are known, it will be acknowledged by all competent judges that the movement just completed by this army, is unparalleled in the annals of war. Under the most difficult circumstances, we have preserved our trains, our guns, our materiel, and above all, our honor. To which I received the following reply from the President. A thousand thanks for the relief your two dispatches of 12 and 1 p.m. yesterday gave me. Be assured that the heroism and skill of yourself, officers, and men is and forever will be appreciated. If you can hold your present position, we shall hive the enemy yet. The following letter was received from His Excellency the President. July 4th. I understand your position, as stated in your letter and by General Marcy. To reinforce you so as to enable you to resume the offensive within a month or even six weeks is impossible. In addition to that arrived and is now arriving from the Potomac, about 10,000 I suppose, and about 10,000 I hope you will have from Burnside very soon, and about 5,000 from Hunter a little later, I do not see how I can send you another man within a month. Under these circumstances, the defensive for the present must be your only care. Save the army first, where you are if you can, and secondly, by removal if you must. You on the ground must be the judge as to which you will attempt, and of the means for effecting it. I but give it as my opinion that, with the aid of the gunboats and the reinforcements mentioned above, you can hold your present position, provided, and so long as, you can keep the James River open below you. If you are not tolerably confident you can keep the James River open, you had better remove as soon as possible. I do not remember that you have expressed any apprehension as to the danger of having your communications cut on the river below you, yet I do not suppose it can have escaped your attention. P.S. If at any time you feel able to take the offensive, you are not restrained from doing so. The following telegram was sent on the 7th to the President. As boat is starting, I have only time to acknowledge receipt of dispatch by General Marcy. Enemy have not attacked. My position is very strong and daily becoming more so. 
If not attacked today, I shall laugh at them. I have been anxious about my communications. Had long consultation about it with Flag Officer Goldsboro last night. He is confident he can keep River open. He should have all gunboats possible. We'll see him again this morning. My men in splendid spirits and anxious to try it again. Alarm yourself as little as possible about me and don't lose confidence in the Army. While General-in-Chief and directing the operations of all our armies in the field, I had become deeply impressed with the importance of adopting and carrying out certain views regarding the conduct of the war which, in my judgment, were essential to its objects and its success. During an active campaign of three months in the enemy's country, these were so fully confirmed that I conceived it a duty, in the critical position we then occupied, not to withhold a candid expression of the more important of these views from the commander-in-chief whom the Constitution places at the head of the armies and navies, as well as of the government of the nation. Mr. Lincoln visited me at Harrison's Bar. I handed him myself, on board of the steamer in which he came, the letter of July 7, 1862. He read it in my presence, but made no comments upon it, merely saying when he had finished it that he was obliged to me for it, or words to that effect. I do not think that he alluded further to it during his visit, or at any time after that. The Harrison's Bar Letter Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Harrison's Landing, Virginia, July 7, 1862 Mr. President, you have been fully informed that the rebel army is in the front with the purpose of overwhelming us by attacking our positions or reducing us by blocking our river communications. I cannot but regard our condition as critical and I earnestly desire, in view of possible contingencies, to lay before Your Excellency, for your private consideration, my general views concerning the existing state of the rebellion, although they do not strictly relate to the situation of this army, or strictly come within the scope of my official duties. These views amount to convictions, and are deeply impressed upon my mind and heart. Our cause must never be abandoned. It is the cause of free institutions and self-government. The Constitution and the Union must be preserved, whatever may be the cost in time, treasure, and blood. If secession is successful, other dissolutions are clearly to be seen in the future. Let neither military disaster, political faction, nor foreign war shake your settled purpose to enforce the equal operation of the laws of the United States upon the people of every state. The time has come when the government must determine upon a civil and military policy covering the whole ground of our national trouble. The responsibility of determining, declaring, and supporting such civil and military policy, and of directing the whole course of national affairs in regard to the rebellion, must now be assumed and exercised by you, or our cause will be lost. The Constitution gives you power sufficient even for the present terrible exigency. This rebellion has assumed the character of war. As such, it should be regarded, and it should be conducted upon the highest principles known to Christian civilization. It should not be a war looking to the subjugation of the people of any state in any event. It should not be at all a war upon population, but against armed forces and political organizations. Neither confiscation of property, political executions of persons, territorial organization of states, or forcible abolition of slavery should be contemplated for a moment. In prosecuting the war, all private property and unarmed persons should be strictly protected, subject only to the necessity of military operations. All private property taken for military use should be paid or receipted for. Pillage and waste should be treated as high crimes. All unnecessary trespass sternly prohibited, and offensive demeanor by the military towards citizens promptly rebuked. Military arrests should not be tolerated except in places where active hostilities exist, and oaths not required by enactments constitutionally made should be neither demanded nor received. Military government should be confined to the preservation of public order and the protection of political rights. Military power should not be allowed to interfere with the relations of servitude, either by supporting or impairing the authority of the master, except for repressing disorder, as in other cases. Slaves contraband under the Act of Congress, seeking military protection, should receive it. 
The right of the government to appropriate permanently to its own service claims to slave labor should be asserted, and the right of the owner to compensation, therefore, should be recognized. This principle might be extended upon grounds of military necessity and security to all the slaves within a particular state, thus working manumission in such state, and in Missouri, perhaps in western Virginia also, and possibly even in Maryland. The expediency of such a measure is only a question of time. A system of policy thus constitutional and conservative, and pervaded by the influences of Christianity and freedom, would receive the support of almost all truly loyal men, would deeply impress the rebel masses and all foreign nations, and it might be humbly hoped that it would commend itself to the favor of the Almighty. Unless the principles governing the future conduct of our struggle shall be made known and approved, the effort to obtain requisite forces will be almost hopeless. A declaration of radical views, especially upon slavery, will rapidly disintegrate our present armies. The policy of the government must be supported by concentrations of military power. The national forces should not be dispersed in expeditions, posts of occupation, and numerous armies, but should be mainly collected into masses and brought to bear upon the armies of the Confederate States. Those armies thoroughly defeated, the political structure which they support would soon cease to exist. In carrying out any system of policy which you may form, you will require a commander-in-chief of the army, one who possesses your confidence, understands your views, and who is competent to execute your orders by directing the military forces of the nation to the accomplishment of the objects by you proposed. I do not ask that place for myself. I am willing to serve you in such position as you may assign me, and I will do so as faithfully as ever subordinate served superior. I may be on the brink of eternity, and as I hope forgiveness from my Maker, I have written this letter with sincerity towards you and from love for my country. Note by the editor, it has been frequently intimated that this letter was written in consultation with friends at the North as a political document. It was the misfortune of McClellan that civilians at Washington, judging him in their own lights, could not conceive it possible that he or any man could render honest, unselfish service to country and cause without some concealed purpose of benefit to himself. Pure devotion to duty without thought of self is incomprehensible to the average politician. I think it proper to say, therefore, that no one of McClellan's most intimate personal friends at the North knew even of the existence of this letter until rumors about it came from members of Mr. Lincoln's cabinet. None of them saw it until the general was finally relieved from command. Meantime, it had been discussed thoroughly by those to whom the president showed it, and it cannot be doubted that a general inability to appreciate the sincere motives in which it was written did much to determine the future conduct of the administration towards McClellan. Mr. Chase, with startling innocence of mind, avows, Warden, page 440, that on July 22nd he urged Mr. Lincoln to remove McClellan on the ground that I did not regard General McClellan as loyal to the administration, although I did not question his general loyalty to the country. This is the confession of a motive in the conduct of a great war which is universally regarded as infamous. It is an avowal that the controlling consideration of such leaders as Mr. Chase, in the use of the blood and treasure of the people, was the supremacy of party and not the success of country. Neither the President nor General McClellan had any such impure ideas, and it is beyond doubt that the radical difference between his own views and those of the self-seeking men who surrounded him led Mr. Lincoln to the despairing state of mind in which, a few weeks later, he desired to resign. End note. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. His Excellency A. Lincoln, President. I telegraphed the President on the 11th. We are very strong here now, so far as defensive is concerned. Hope you will soon make us strong enough to advance and try it again, all in fine spirits. Telegrams were sent to the President on the 12th, 17th, and 18th. 12th. I am more and more convinced that this army ought not to be withdrawn from here, but promptly reinforced and thrown again upon Richmond. If we have a little more than half a chance, we can take it. I dread the effects of any retreat upon the morale of the men. 17th. I have consulted fully with General Burnside, 
and would commend to your favorable consideration the General's plan for bringing seven additional regiments from North Carolina by leaving New Bern to the care of the gunboats. It appears manifestly to be our policy to concentrate here everything we can possibly spare from less important points to make sure of crushing the enemy at Richmond, which seems clearly to be the most important point in rebeldom. Nothing should be left to chance here. I would recommend that General Burnside, with all his troops, be ordered to this army to enable it to assume the offensive as soon as possible. 18th. Am anxious to have determination of government that no time may be lost in preparing for it. Ours are very precious now and perfect unity of action necessary. The following was telegraphed to General Halleck on the 28th. My opinion is more and more firm that here is the defense of Washington, and that I should be at once reinforced by all available troops to enable me to advance. Retreat would be disastrous to the army and the cause. I am confident of that. On the 30th to General Halleck, I hope that it may soon be decided what is to be done by this army, and that the decision may be to reinforce it at once. We are losing much valuable time, and that at a moment when energy and decision are sadly needed. About half an hour after midnight on the morning of August 1st, the enemy brought some light batteries to Coggins Point and the Coles House, on the right bank of James River, directly opposite Harrison's Landing, and opened a heavy fire upon our shipping and encampments. It was continued rapidly for about 30 minutes when they were driven back by the fire of our guns. To prevent another demonstration of this character and to ensure a debauch on the south bank of the James, it became necessary to occupy Coggins Point, which was done on the 3rd, and the enemy driven back towards Petersburg. On the 1st of August, I received the following dispatches from General Halleck. Washington, July 30th, 1862, 8 p.m. A dispatch just received from General Pope says that deserters report that the enemy is moving south of James River and that the force in Richmond is very small. I suggest that he be pressed in that direction so as to ascertain the facts of the case. Washington, July 30th, 1862, 8 p.m. In order to enable you to move in any direction, it is necessary to relieve you of your sick. The Surgeon General has therefore been directed to make arrangements for them at other places and the Quartermaster General to provide transportation. I hope you will send them away as quickly as possible and advise me of their removal. It is clear that the General-in-Chief attached some weight to the report received from General Pope, and I was justified in supposing that the order in regard to removing the sick contemplated an offensive movement rather than a retreat, as I had no other data than the telegrams just given from which to form an opinion as to the intentions of the government. The following telegram from him strengthened me in that belief. Washington, July 31st, 1862, 10 a.m. General Pope again telegraphs that the enemy is reported to be evacuating Richmond and falling back on Danville and Lynchburg. H.W. Halleck, Major General. In occupying Coggins Point, I was influenced by the necessity of possessing a secure debauch on the south of the James, in order to enable me to move on the communications of Richmond in that direction, as well as to prevent a repetition of midnight cannonades. To carry out General Halleck's first order on July 30th, it was necessary first to gain possession of Malvern Hill, which was occupied by the enemy, apparently in some little force, and controlled the direct approach to Richmond. Its temporary occupation at least was equally necessary in the event of a movement upon Petersburg, or even the abandonment of the peninsula. General Hooker, with his own division and Pleasanton's cavalry, was therefore directed to gain possession of Malvern Hill on the night of the 2nd of August. He failed to do so on account of the incompetency of guides. On the 4th, General Hooker was reinforced by General Sedgwick's division, and having obtained a knowledge of the roads, he succeeded in turning Malvern Hill and driving the enemy back towards Richmond. The following is my report of this affair at the time. Malvern Hill, August 5, 1862, 1 p.m. General Hooker at 5.30 this morning attacked a very considerable force of infantry and artillery stationed at this place, and carried it handsomely, driving the enemy towards New Market, which is four miles distant, and where it is said they have a large force. We have captured 100 prisoners, killed and wounded several, with a loss on our part of only 3 killed and 11 wounded, among the latter two officers. I shall probably remain here tonight, ready to act as circumstances may require after the return of my cavalry reconnaissances. The mass of the enemy escaped under the cover of a dense fog, 
but our cavalry are still in pursuit, and I trust may succeed in capturing many more. This is a very advantageous position to cover and advance on Richmond, and only fourteen and three-quarter miles distant, and I feel confident that, with reinforcements, I would march this army there in five days. I this instant learn that several brigades of the enemy are four miles from here on the Quaker Road, and I have taken steps to prepare to meet them. General Hooker's dispositions were admirable, and his officers and men displayed their usual gallantry. On the same day, I telegraphed to General Halleck. Our troops have advanced 12 miles in one direction and 17 in another towards Richmond today. We have secured a strong position at Coggins Point, opposite our quartermaster's depot, which will effectively prevent the rebels from using artillery hereafter against our camps. I learned this evening that there is a force of 20,000 men about six miles back from this point on the south bank of the river. What their object is, I do not know, but will keep a sharp lookout on their movements. I am sending off sick as rapidly as our transports will take them. I am also doing everything in my power to carry out your orders to push reconnaissances towards the rebel capital and hope soon to find out whether the reports regarding the abandonment of that place are true. To the dispatch of 1 p.m. August 5th, the following answer was received August 6th. I have no reinforcements to send you. H.W. Halleck, Major General. And soon after the following, also from General Halleck. You will immediately send a regiment of cavalry and several batteries of artillery to Burnside's command at Aquia Creek. It is reported that Jackson is moving north with a very large force. End of Part 1 of Chapter 29《Chapter 29 of McClellan's Own Story》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan Chapter 29 Part 2 on the 4th, I had received General Halleck's order of the 3rd, which appears below, directing me to withdraw the army to Acquia, and on the same day sent an earnest protest against it. A few hours before this, General Hooker had informed me that his cavalry pickets reported large bodies of the enemy advancing and driving them in, and that he would probably be attacked at daybreak. Under these circumstances, I had determined to support him, but as I could not get the whole army in position until the next afternoon, I concluded, upon the receipt of the above telegram from the General-in-Chief, to withdraw General Hooker, that there might be the least possible delay in conforming to General Halleck's orders. I therefore sent to General Hooker, Under advices I have received from Washington, I think it necessary for you to abandon the position tonight, getting everything away before daylight. Five batteries, with their horses and equipments complete, were embarked on the 7th and 8th. Simultaneously with General Hooker's operations upon Malvern, I dispatched a cavalry force under Colonel Averill towards Savage's Station to ascertain if the enemy were making any movements towards our left flank. He found a rebel cavalry regiment near the White Oak Swamp Bridge and completely routed it, pursuing well towards Savage's Station. These important preliminary operations assisted my preparations for the removal of the army to Aquia Creek, and the sending off our sick and supplies was pushed both day and night as rapidly as the means of transportation permitted. On the subject of the withdrawal of the army from Harrison's Landing, the following correspondence passed between the General-in-Chief and myself while the reconnaissances towards Richmond were in progress. On the 2nd of August, I received the following from General Halleck. You have not answered my telegram of July 30th, 8 p.m. about the removal of your sick. Remove them as rapidly as possible and telegraph me when they will be out of your way. The President wishes an answer as early as possible to which I sent this reply. 3rd, 11 p.m. Your telegram of 2nd is received. The answer to dispatch of July 30th was sent this morning. We have about 12,500 sick, of whom perhaps 4,000 might make easy marches. We have here the means to transport 1,200, and will embark tomorrow that number of the worst cases. With all the means at the disposal of the medical director, the remainder could be shipped in from 7 to 10 days. It is impossible for me to decide what cases to send off unless I know what is to be done with this army. 
or the disastrous measures of retreat adopted all the sick who cannot march and fight should be dispatched by water. Should the army advance, many of the sick could be of service at the depots. If it is to remain here any length of time, the question assumes still a different phase. Until I am informed what is to be done, I cannot act understandingly or for the good of the service. If I am kept longer in ignorance of what is to be effected, I cannot be expected to accomplish the object in view. In the meantime, I will do all in my power to carry out what I conceive to be your wishes. The moment I received the instructions for removing the sick, I at once gave the necessary directions for carrying them out. With a small amount of transportation at hand, the removal of the severe cases alone would necessarily take several days. And in the meantime, I desired information to determine what I should do with the others. The order required me to send them away as quickly as possible and to notify the general-in-chief when they were removed. Previous to the receipt of the dispatch of the 2nd of August, not having been advised of what the army under my command was expected to do, or which way it was to move, if it moved at all, I sent the following dispatch to General Halleck. Berkeley, August 3rd. I hear of sea steamers at Fort Monroe. Are they for removing my sick? If so, to what extent am I required to go in sending them off? There are not many who need go. As I am not in any way informed of the intentions of the government in regard to this army, I am unable to judge what proportion of the sick should leave here and must ask for specific orders. If the army was to retreat to Fort Monroe, it was important that it should be unencumbered with any sick, wounded, or other men who might at all interfere with its mobility. But if the object was to operate directly on Richmond from the position we then occupied, there were many cases of slight sickness which would speedily be cured and the patients returned to duty. As the service of every man would be important in the event of a forward offensive movement, I considered it to be of the utmost consequence that I should know what was to be done. It was to ascertain this that I sent the dispatch of 11 p.m. on the 3rd before receiving the following telegram from General Halleck. Washington, August 3rd, 1862, 7.45 p.m. I have waited most anxiously to learn the result of your forced reconnaissance towards Richmond, and also whether all your sick have been sent away, and I can get no answer to my telegram. It is determined to withdraw your army from the peninsula to Aquia Creek. You will take immediate measures to effect this, covering the movement as best you can. Its real object and withdrawal should be concealed even from your own officers. Your materiel and transportation should be removed first. You will assume control of all the means of transportation within your reach and apply to the naval forces for all the assistance they can render you. You will consult freely with the commander of these forces. The entire execution of the movement is left to your discretion and judgment. You will leave such forces as you deem proper at Fort Monroe, Norfolk, and other places which we must occupy. I proceeded to obey this order with all possible rapidity, firmly impressed, however, with the conviction that the withdrawal of the Army of the Potomac from Harrison's Landing, where its communications had, by the cooperation of the gunboats, been rendered perfectly secure, would at that time have the most disastrous effect upon our cause. I did not, as the commander of that army, allow the occasion to pass without distinctly setting forth my views upon the subject to the authorities in the following telegram. August 4th. Your telegram of last evening is received. I must confess that it has caused me the greatest pain I ever experienced, for I am convinced that the order to withdraw this army to Aquia Creek will prove disastrous to our cause. I fear it will be a fatal blow. Several days are necessary to complete the preparations for so important a movement as this, and while they are in progress, I beg that careful consideration may be given to my statements. This army is now in excellent discipline and condition. We hold a debauch on both banks of the James River so that we are free to act in any direction, and with the assistance of the gunboats, I consider our communications as now secure. We are 25 miles from Richmond and are not likely to meet the enemy in force sufficient to fight a battle until we have marched 15 to 18 miles, which brings us practically within 10 miles of Richmond. Our longest line of land transportation would be from this point 25 miles away, but with the aid of the gunboats we can supply the army by water during its advance, certainly to within 12 miles of Richmond. At Aquia Creek we would be 75 miles from Richmond with land transportation all the way. From here to Fort Monroe is a march of about 70 miles, for are regarded as impracticable to withdraw this army and its materiel except by land. The result of the movement 
would thus be a march of 145 miles to reach a point now only 25 miles distant, and to deprive ourselves entirely of the powerful aid of the gunboats and water transportation. Add to this the certain demoralization of this army which would ensue, the terribly depressing effect upon the people of the North, and the strong probability that it would influence foreign powers to recognize our adversaries, and there appear to me sufficient reasons to make it my imperative duty to urge, in the strongest terms afforded by our language, that this order may be rescinded, and that, far from recalling this army, it be promptly reinforced to enable it to resume the offensive. It may be said that there are no reinforcements available. I point to Burnside's force, to that of Pope, not necessary to maintain a strict defensive in front of Washington and Harper's Ferry, to those portions of the Army of the West not required for a strict defensive there. Here, directly in front of this army, is the heart of the rebellion. It is here that all our resources should be collected to strike the blow which will determine the fate of the nation. All points of secondary importance elsewhere should be abandoned and every available man brought here. A decided victory here, and the military strength of the rebellion is crushed. It matters not what partial reverses we may meet with elsewhere. Here is the true defense of Washington. It is here, on the banks of the James, that the fate of the Union should be decided. Clear in my convictions of right, strong in the consciousness that I have ever been and still am actuated solely by love of my country, knowing that no ambitious or selfish motives have influenced me from the commencement of this war, I do now what I never did in my life before. I entreat that this order may be rescinded. If my counsel does not prevail, I will, with a sad heart, obey your orders to the utmost of my power, directing to the movement, which I clearly foresee will be one of the utmost delicacy and difficulty, whatever skill I may possess. Whatever the result may be, and may God grant that I am mistaken in my forebodings, I shall at least have the internal satisfaction that I have written and spoken frankly and have sought to do the best in my power to avert disaster for my country. G.V. McClellan, Major General Commanding. Major General H.W. Halleck, commanding U.S. Army. Soon after sending this telegram, I received the following from General Halleck in reply to mine of 11 p.m. of the 3rd. My telegram to you of yesterday will satisfy you in regard to future operations. It was expected that you would have sent off your sick as directed without waiting to know what were or would be the intentions of the government respecting future movements. The President expects that the instructions which were sent you yesterday with his approval will be carried out with all possible dispatch and caution. The Quartermaster General is sending to Fort Monroe all the transportation he can collect. To which the following is my reply. Your telegram of yesterday received and is being carried out as promptly as possible. With the means of my command, no human power could have moved the sick in the time you say you expected them to be moved. My efforts for bringing about a change of policy were unsuccessful. On the 7th, I received the following telegram from General Halleck. You will immediately report the number of sick sent off since you received my order, the number still to be shipped, and the amount of transportation at your disposal, that is, the number of persons that can be carried on all the vessels which, by my order, you were authorized to control. To which I made this reply. August 7th. In reply to your dispatch of 10 a.m. today, I report the number of six sent off since I received your order as follows. 3,740, including some that are embarked tonight and will leave tomorrow morning. The number still to be shipped is, as nearly as can be ascertained, 5,700. The embarkation of five batteries of artillery, with our horses, wagons, etc., required most of our available boats, except the ferry boats. All the transports that can send to this place have been ordered up, they will be here tomorrow evening. Colonel Ingalls reports to me that there are no transports now available for cavalry and will not be for two or three days. As soon as they can be obtained, I shall send off the 1st New York Cavalry. After the transports with sick and wounded have returned, including some heavy draft steamers at Fort Monroe that cannot come to this point, we can transport 25,000 men at a time. We have some propellers here, but they are laden with commissary supplies and are not available. The transports now employed in transporting sick and wounded will carry 12,000 well-infantry soldiers. Those at Fort Monroe and of too heavy draft to come here will carry 8,000 or 10,000 infantry. Several of the largest steamers have been used for transporting prisoners of war and have only become available for the sick today. 
The report of my chief quartermaster upon the subject is as follows. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Office of Chief Quartermaster, Harrison's Landing, August 7, 1862. General, I have the honor to return the papers herewith which you sent me with the following remarks. We are embarking five batteries of artillery with their horses, baggage, etc., which requires the detailing of most of our available boats, except the ferry boats. The medical department has ten or twelve of our largest transport vessels, which, if disposable, could carry twelve thousand men. Besides, there are some heavy draft steamers at Fort Monroe that cannot come to this point, but which can carry eight thousand or ten thousand inventory. I have ordered all up here that can ascend to this depot. They will be here tomorrow evening. As it now is, after the details already made, we cannot transport from this place more than 5,000 infantry. There are no transports now available for cavalry. From and after tomorrow, if the vessels arrive, I could transport 10,000 infantry. In two or three days, a regiment of cavalry can be sent if required. If you wait and ship from Yorktown or Fort Monroe after the sick and wounded transports are at my disposal, we can transport 25,000 at a time. The number that can be transported is contingent on circumstances referred to. Most of the propellers here are laden with commissary or other supplies, and most of the tugs are necessary to tow off sailcraft, also laden with supplies. I am, very respectfully, your most obedient servant, Rufus Engels, Chief Quartermaster. General R.B. Marcy, Chief of Staff. On the 9th, I received this dispatch from General Halleck. I am of the opinion that the enemy is massing his forces in front of Generals Pope and Burnside, and that he expects to crush them and move forward to the Potomac. You must send reinforcements instantly to Aquia Creek. Considering the amount of transportation at your disposal, your delay is not satisfactory. You must move with all possible celerity. To which I sent the following reply. Telegram of yesterday received. The battery sent to Burnside took the last available transport yesterday morning. Enough have since arrived to ship one regiment of cavalry today. The sick are being embarked as rapidly as possible. There has been no unnecessary delay, as you assert, not in hours, but everything has been and is being pushed as rapidly as possible to carry out your orders. The following report, made on the same day by the officer then in charge of the transports, exposes the injustice of the remark in the dispatch of the General-in-Chief, that, considering the amount of transportation at your disposal, your delay is not satisfactory. Assistant Quartermaster's Office, Army of the Potomac, Harrison's Landing, Virginia, August 10, 1862. Colonel Ingalls, being himself ill, has requested me to telegraph to you concerning the state and capacity of the transports now here. On the night of the 8th, I dispatched 11 steamers, principally small ones, and six schooners, with five batteries of heavy horse artillery, none of which have yet returned. Requisition is made this morning for transportation of 1,000 cavalry to Aquia Creek. All the schooners that had been chartered for carrying horses have been long since discharged or changed into freight vessels. A large proportion of the steamers now here are still loaded with stores, or are in the floating hospital service engaged in removing the sick. The transport to 1,000 cavalry today will take all the available steamers now here not engaged in the service of the harbor. These steamers could take a large number of infantry, but are not well adapted to the carrying of horses, and much space is thus lost. Several steamers are expected here today, and we are unloading schooners rapidly. Most of these are not chartered, but are being taken for the service required, at the same rates of pay as other chartered schooners. If you could cause a more speedy return of the steamer sent away from here, it would facilitate matters. C.G. Sawtell, Captain and Assistant Quartermaster, Commanding Depot. Our wharf facilities at Harrison's Landing were very limited, admitting but few vessels at one time. These were continually in use as long as there were disposable vessels, and the officers of the medical and quartermaster's departments, with all their available forces, were incessantly occupied day and night in embarking and sending off the sick men, troops, and materiel. Notwithstanding the repeated representations I made to the General-in-Chief that such were the facts, on the 10th I received the following from General Halleck. The enemy is crossing the Rapidan in large force. They are fighting General Pope today. There must be no further delay in your movements. That which has already occurred was entirely unexpected and must be satisfactorily explained. Let not a moment's time be lost, and telegraph me daily what progress you have made in executing the order to transfer your troops. 
to which I sent this reply. Your dispatch of today is received. I assure you again that there has not been any unnecessary delay in carrying out your orders. You are probably laboring under some great mistake as to the amount of transportation available here. I have pushed matters to the utmost in getting off our sick and the troops you ordered to Burnside. Colonel Ingalls has more than once informed the Quartermaster General of the condition of our water transportation. From the fact that you directed me to keep the order secret, I took it for granted that you would take the steps necessary to provide the requisite transportation. A large number of transports for all arms of service and for wagons should at once be sent to Yorktown and Fort Monroe. I shall be ready to move the whole army by land the moment the sick are disposed of. You may be sure that not an hour's delay will occur that can be avoided. I fear you do not realize the difficulty of the operation proposed. The regiment of cavalry for Burnside has been in course of embarkation today and tonight. Ten steamers were required for the purpose. 1,258 sick loaded today and tonight. Our means exhausted, except one vessel returning to Fort Monroe in the morning, which will take some 500 cases of slight sickness. The present moment is probably not the proper one for me to refer to the unnecessarily harsh and unjust tone of your telegrams of late. It will, however, make no difference in my official action. On the 11th, this report was made. The embarkation of 850 cavalry and one brigade of infantry will be completed by 2 o'clock in the morning. 500 sick were embarked today, another vessel arrived tonight, and 600 more sick are now being embarked. I still have some 4,000 sick to dispose of. You have been grossly misled as to the amount of transportation at my disposal. Vessels loaded to their utmost capacity with stores and others indispensable for service here have been reported to you as available for carrying sick and well. I am sending off all that can be unloaded at Fort Monroe to have them return here. I repeat that I have lost no time in carrying out your orders. On the 12th, I received the following from General Halleck. The Quartermaster General informs me that nearly every available steam vessel in the country is now under your control. It was supposed that 8,000 or 10,000 of your men could be transported daily. In addition to steamers, there was a large fleet of sailing vessels which could be used as transports. The bulk of your material on shore, it was thought, could be sent to Fort Monroe, covered by that part of the army which could not get water transportation. Such were the views of the government here. Perhaps we were misinformed as to the facts. If so, the delay could be explained. Nothing in my telegram was intentionally harsh or unjust, but the delay was so unexpected that an explanation was required. There has been and is the most urgent necessity for dispatch, and not a single moment must be lost in getting additional troops in front of Washington. I telegraphed the following reply at 11 p.m. Your dispatch of noon today received. It is positively the fact that no more men could have embarked hence than have gone, and that no unnecessary delay has occurred. I am sure that you have been misinformed as to the availability of vessels on hand. We cannot use heavily loaded supply vessels for troops or animals, and such constitute the mass of those here, which have been represented to you as capable of transporting this army. There shall be no unnecessary delay, but I cannot manufacture vessels. I state these difficulties from experience, and because it appears to me that we have been lately working at cross-purposes, because you have not been properly informed by those around you who ought to know the inherent difficulties of such an undertaking. It is not possible for anyone to place this army where you wish it, ready to move in less than a month. If Washington is in danger now, this army can scarcely arrive in time to save it. It is in much better position to do so from here than from Acquia. Our material can only be saved by using the whole army to cover it if we are pressed. If sensibly weakened by detachments, the result might be the loss of much material and many men. I will be at the telegraph office tomorrow morning. It will be seen by the concluding paragraph of the foregoing dispatch that in order to have a more direct, speedy, and full explanation of the condition of affairs in the Army than I could by sending a single dispatch by steamer to the nearest telegraph office at Jamestown Island, some 70 miles distant, and waiting 10 hours for a reply, I proposed to go in person to the office. This I did. On my arrival at Jamestown Island, there was an interruption in the electric current, 
which rendered it necessary for me to continue on to Fort Monroe, and across the Chesapeake Bay to Cherry Stone Inlet, on the eastern shore, where I arrived late in the evening, and immediately sent the two annex dispatches. 13th, 11.30 p.m. Please come to office. Wish to talk to you. What news from Pope? 14th, 12.30 a.m. Started to Jamestown Island to talk with you. Found cable broken and came here. Please read my long telegram of August 12th, 11 p.m. All quiet at camp. Enemy burned wharves at City Point yesterday. No rebel pickets within eight miles of Coggins Point yesterday. Richmond prisoners state that large force with guns left Richmond northward on Sunday. To which the following reply was received. 1.40 a.m. I have read your dispatch. There is no change of plans. You will send up your troops as rapidly as possible. There is no difficulty in landing them. According to your own accounts, there is now no difficulty in withdrawing your forces. Do so with all possible rapidity. H.W. Halleck, Major General. Before I had time to decipher and reply to this dispatch, the telegraph operator in Washington informed me that General Halleck had gone out of the office immediately after writing this dispatch without leaving any intimation of the fact for me or waiting for any further information as to the object of my journey across the bay. As there was no possibility of other communication with him at that time, I sent the following dispatch and returned to Harrison's Landing. 1.40 a.m. Your orders will be obeyed. I return at once. I had hoped to have had a longer and fuller conversation with you after traveling so far for the purpose. On the 14th and 15th, and before we had able to embark all our sick men, two Army Corps were put in motion towards Fort Monroe. This was reported in the Annex Dispatch. August 16th, 11 p.m. Movement has commenced by land and water. All sick will be away tomorrow night. Everything being done to carry out your orders. I don't like Jackson's movements. He will suddenly appear where least expected. We'll telegraph fully and understandingly in the morning. The phrase, movement has commenced, it need not be remarked, referred obviously to the movement of the main army after completing the necessary preliminary movements of the sick, etc. The perversion of the term to which the general-in-chief saw fit to give currency in a letter to the Secretary of War should have been here rendered impossible by the dispatches which precede this of the 14th, which show that the movement really began immediately after the receipt of the order of August 4th. Footnote. In a letter to the Secretary of War, August 30th, 1862, General Halleck said, It will be seen from my telegraphic correspondence that General McClellan protested against the movement and that it was not actually commenced until the 14th instant. End footnote. After the commencement of the movement, it was continued with the utmost rapidity until all the troops and materiel were en route, both by land and water, on the morning of the 16th. Late in the afternoon of that day, when the last man had disappeared from the deserted camps, I followed with my personal staff in the track of the Grand Army of the Potomac, bidding farewell to the scene still covered with the marks of its presence, and to be forever memorable in history as the vicinity of its most brilliant exploits. Previous to the departure of the troops, I had directed Captain Duane of the Engineer Corps to proceed to Barrett's Ferry, near the mouth of the Chickahominy, and throw across the river at that point a pontoon bridge. This was executed promptly and satisfactorily, under the cover of gunboats, and an excellent bridge of about 2,000 feet in length was ready for the first arrival of troops. The greater part of the army, with its artillery, wagon trains, etc., crossed it rapidly, and in perfect order and safety so that on the night of the 17th everything was across the Chickahominy, except the rear guard, which crossed early in the morning of the 18th, when the pontoon bridge was immediately removed. General Porter's Corps, which was the first to march from Harrison's Landing, had been pushed forward rapidly, and on the 16th reached Williamsburg, where I had directed him to halt until the entire army was across the Chickahominy. On his arrival at Williamsburg, however, he received an intercepted letter which led to the belief that General Pope would have to contend against a very heavy force then in his front. General Porter, therefore, very properly took the responsibility of continuing his march directly on to Newport News, which place he reached on the morning of the 18th of August, having marched his corps 60 miles in the short period of three days and one night, halting one day at the crossing of the Chickahominy. 
The embarkation of this corps commenced as soon as transports were ready, and on the 20th it had all sailed for Aquia Creek from Barrett's Ferry. On the 18th and 19th, our march was continued to Williamsburg and Yorktown, and on the 20th the remainder of the army was ready to embark at Yorktown, Fortress Monroe, and Newport News. From the commencement to the termination of this most arduous campaign, the Army of the Potomac always evinced the most perfect subordination, zeal, and alacrity in the performance of all the duties required of it. The amount of severe labor accomplished by this army in the construction of entrenchments, roads, bridges, etc. was enormous. Yet all the work was performed with the most gratifying cheerfulness and devotion to the interests of the service. During the campaign, ten severely contested and sanguinary battles have been fought, besides numerous smaller engagements, in which the troops exhibited the most determined enthusiasm and bravery. They submitted to exposure, sickness, and even death without a murmur. Indeed, they had become veterans in their country's cause and richly deserved the warm commendation of the government. It was in view of these facts that this seemed to meet an appropriate occasion for the General-in-Chief to give, in general orders, some appreciative expression of the services of the army while upon the peninsula. Accordingly, on the 18th, I sent him the following dispatch. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, August 18th, 1862, 11 p.m. Please say a kind word to my army that I can repeat to them in general orders in regard to their conduct at Yorktown, Williamsburg, West Point, Hanover Courthouse, and on the Chickahominy, as well as in regard to the Seven Days and the recent retreat. No one has ever said anything to cheer them but myself. Say nothing about me. Merely give my men and officers credit for what they have done. It will do you much good and will strengthen you much with them if you issue a handsome order to them in regard to what they have accomplished. They deserve it. G. B. McClellan, Major General, Major General Halleck, Washington, D.C. As no reply was received to this communication and no order was issued by the General-in-Chief, I conclude that the suggestion did not meet with his approbation. All the personnel and materiel of the Army had been transferred from Harrison's Landing to the different points of embarkation in the very brief period of five days without the slightest loss or damage. Porter's troops sailed from Newport News on the 19th and 20th. Heinzelman's Corps sailed from Yorktown on the 21st. On that day, I received the following telegram from the General-in-Chief. Leave such garrisons in Fortress Monroe, Yorktown, etc., as you may deem proper. They will be replaced by new troops as rapidly as possible. The forces of Burnside and Pope are hard-pushed and require aid as rapidly as you can send it. Come yourself as soon as you can. End of chapter 29「Chapter number thirty of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter thirty. The Army Reaches Alexandria. Sent Forward the Pope. Pope's Campaign. McClellan's Work at Alexandria. The Last Man Sent Forward. Stanton's Ironical Order. McClellan Commands a Hundred Men. Halleck in Despair, McClellan's Volunteer Services. On the evening of August 23rd, I sailed with my staff for Aquia Creek, where I arrived in daylight on the following morning, reporting to General Halleck as follows. Aquia Creek, August 24th, 1862. I have reached here and respectfully report for orders. I also telegraphed as follows to General Halleck. Morell's scouts report Rappahannock Station burned and abandoned by Pope without any notice to Morell or Sykes. This was telegraphed to you some hours ago. Reynolds, Reno, and Stevens are supposed to be with Pope, as nothing can be heard of them today. Morell and Sykes are near Morrisville Post Office, watching the lower fords of Rappahannock, with no troops between there and Rappahannock Station, which is reported abandoned by Pope. Please inform me immediately exactly where Pope is and what doing. Until I know that, I cannot regulate Porter's movements. He is much exposed now, and decided measures should be taken at once. Until I know what my command and position are to be, and whether you still intend to place me in command indicated in your first letter to me, 
and orally through General Burnside at the Chickahominy, I cannot decide where I can be of most use. If your determination is unchanged, I ought to go to Alexandria at once. Please define my position and duties. To which I received the following reply from General Halleck. August 24th. You ask me for information which I cannot give. I do not know either where General Pope is or where the enemy in force is. These are matters which I have all day been most anxious to ascertain. On the 26th, I received the following from General Halleck. There is reason to believe that the enemy is moving a large force into the Shenandoah Valley. Reconnaissances will soon determine. General Heitzelman's corps was ordered to report to General Pope, and Kearney's will probably be sent today against the enemy's flank. Don't draw any troops down the Rappahannock at present. We shall probably want them all in the direction of the Shenandoah. Perhaps you had better leave General Burnside in charge at Aquia Creek and come to Alexandria, as very great irregularities are reported there. General Franklin's corps will march as soon as it receives transportation. On receipt of this, I immediately sailed for Alexandria and reported as follows to General Halleck. August 27th, 8 a.m. I arrived here last night and have taken measures to ascertain the state of affairs here and that proper remedies may be applied. Just received a rumor that railway bridge over Bull Run was burned last night. August 27th, 9.40 a.m. The town is quiet, although quite full of soldiers who are said to be chiefly convalescents. The affairs of the quartermaster's department are reported as going on well. It is said that the Bull Run Bridge will be repaired by tomorrow. The disembarkation of Sumner's troops commenced at Aquia yesterday afternoon. I found that he could reach Rappahannock Station earlier that way than from here. On the same day, I received the following from General Halleck. August 27th. Telegrams from General Porter to General Burnside just received say that Banks is at Fayetteville, McDowell, Sigel, and Rickerts near Warrington, Reno on his right. Porter is marching on Warrenton Junction to reinforce Pope. Nothing said of Heinzelman. Porter reports a general battle imminent. Franklin's Corps should move out by forced marches carrying three or four days' provisions, and to be supplied as far as possible by railroad. Perhaps you may prefer some other road than to Centerville. Colonel Haupt has just telegraphed about sending out troops. Please see him and give him your directions. There has been some serious neglect to guard the railroad, which should be immediately remedied. I replied as follows. August 27th, 10 a.m. Telegram this moment received. I have sent orders to Franklin to prepare to march with his corps at once and to repair here in person to inform me as to his means of transportation. Kearney was yesterday at Rappahannock Station, Porter at Bealton, Kellop, Barnells, etc., Sumner will commence reaching Falmouth today. Williams, Massachusetts Cavalry will be mostly at Falmouth today. I learned Burnside, my personal escort, one squadron, fourth regulars, to scout down Rappahannock. I have sent for Couch's division to come at once. As fast as I gain any information, I will forward it, although you may already have it. I also received the following telegrams from General Halleck. August 27th. Direct General Casey to furnish you about 5,000 of the new troops under his command. Take entire direction of the sending out of the troops from Alexandria. Determine questions of priority in transportation and the places they shall occupy. Pope's headquarters are near Warrington Junction, but I cannot ascertain the present position of his troops. August 27th. I can get no satisfactory information from the front either of the enemy or of our troops. There seems to have been great neglect and carelessness about Manassas. Franklin's Corps should march in that direction as soon as possible. A competent officer should be sent out to take direction of affairs in that vicinity. Upon the receipt of these, I immediately sent the following telegram to Generals Heinzelman and Porter. Alexandria, August 27, 1862, 10.30 a.m. Where are you and what is state of affairs? What troops in your front, right, and left? Sumner is now landing at Aquia. Where is Pope's left and what of enemy? Enemy burned Bull Run Bridge last night with cavalry force. Major General Heinzelman, Warrington. Major General Porter, Bealton. P.S. If these general officers are not at the places named, nearest operator will please have message forwarded. I also telegraphed to the General-in-Chief the following dispatches. August 27th, 10.50 a.m. I have sent all the information I possess to Burnside. 
instructing him to look out well for his right flank between the Rappahannock and Potomac, and to send no trains to Porter without an escort. I fear the cavalry who dashed at Bull Run last night may trouble Burnside a little. I have sent to communicate with Porter and Heinzelman via Falmouth, and I hope to give you some definite information in a few hours. I shall land the next cavalry I get hold of here, and send it out to keep open the communication between Pope and Porter, also to watch vicinity of Manassas. Please send me a number of copies of the best maps of present field of operations. I can use 50 to advantage. August 27th, 1120 AM. In view of Burnside's dispatch, just received, would it not be advisable to throw the mass of Sumner's Corps here, to move out with Franklin to Centerville or vicinity? If a decisive battle is fought at Warrenton, a disaster would leave any troops on Lower Rappahannock in a dangerous position. They would do better service in front of Washington. Alexandria, August 27th, 12 noon. I have just learned through General Woodbury that it was stated in your office last night that it was very strange that, with 20,000 men here, I did not prevent the raid upon Manassas. This induces me to ask whether your remark in your telegram today, that there had been great neglect about Manassas, was intended to apply to me. I cannot suppose it was, knowing, as you do, that I arrived here without information and with no instructions beyond pushing the landing of my troops. The bridge was burned before my arrival. I knew nothing of it until this morning. I ask, as a matter of justice, that you will prevent your staff from making statements which do me such gross injustice at a time when the most cordial cooperation is required. August 27th, 12.05 p.m. My aide has just returned from General Franklin's camp. Reports that Generals Franklin, Smith, and Slocum are all in Washington. He gave the order to the next in rank to place the Corps in readiness to move at once. I learned that heavy firing has been heard this morning at Centerville, and have sent to ascertain the truth. I can find no cavalry to send out on the roads. Are the works garrisoned and ready for defense? August 27th, 12.20 p.m. What bridges exist over Bull Run? Have steps been taken to construct bridges for the advance of troops to reinforce Pope or to enable him to retreat if in trouble? There should be two gunboats at Aquia Creek at once. Shall I push the rest of Sumner's Corps here, or is Pope so strong as to be reasonably certain of success? I have sent to inspect the works near here and their garrisons. As soon as I can find General Casey or some other commanding officer, I will see to the railway, etc. It would be well to have them report to me, as I do not know where they are. I am trying to find them and will lose no time in carrying out your orders. Would like to see Burnside. August 27th, 1.15 p.m. Franklin's artillery have no horses except for four guns without caissons. I can pick up no cavalry. In view of these facts, will it not be well to push Sumner's Corps here by water as rapidly as possible to make immediate arrangements for placing the works in front of Washington in an efficient condition of defense? I have no means of knowing the enemy's force between Pope and ourselves. Can Franklin, without his artillery or cavalry, effect any useful purpose in front? Should not Burnside take steps at once to evacuate Falmouth and Aquia, at the same time covering the retreat of any of Pope's troops who may fall back in that direction? I do not see that we have force enough in hand to form a connection with Pope, whose exact position we do not know. Are we safe in the direction of the valley? August 27th, 1.35 p.m. I learned that Taylor's brigade, sent this morning to Bull Run Bridge, is either cut to pieces or captured that the force against them had many guns and about 5,000 infantry, receiving reinforcements every minute. Also that Gainesville is in possession of the enemy. Please send some cavalry out towards Drainsville via Chain Bridge to watch Lewinsville and Drainsville and go as far as they can. If you will give me even one squadron of good cavalry here, I will ascertain the state of the case. I think our policy now is to make these works perfectly safe and mobilize a couple of corps as soon as possible but not to advance them until they can have their artillery and cavalry. I have sent for Colonel Tyler to place his artillerymen in the works. Is Fort Marcy securely held? August 27th, 2.30 p.m. Sumner has been ordered to send here all of his corps that are within reach. Orders have been sent to Couch to come here from Yorktown with the least possible delay. But one squadron of my cavalry has arrived that will be disembarked at once and sent to the front. If there is any cavalry in Washington, it should be ordered to report to me at once. 
I still think that we should first provide for the immediate defense of Washington on both sides of the Potomac. I am not responsible for the past and cannot be for the future unless I receive authority to dispose of the available troops according to my judgment. Please inform me at once what my position is. I do not wish to act in the dark. August 27th, 6 p.m. I have just received the copy of a dispatch from General Pope to you, dated 10 a.m. this morning, in which he says, All forces now sent forward should be sent to my right at Gainesville. I now have at my disposal here about 10,000 men of Franklin's Corps, about 2,800 of General Tyler's Brigade, and Colonel Tyler's 1st Connecticut Artillery, which I recommend should be held in hand for the defense of Washington. If you wish me to order any part of this force to the front, it is in readiness to march at a moment's notice to any point you may indicate. In view of the existing state of things in our front, I have deemed it best to order General Casey to hold his men for Yorktown in readiness to move, but not to send them off till further orders. On the 28th, I telegraphed as follows to General Halleck. August 28th, 4.10 p.m. General Franklin is with me here. I will know in a few minutes the condition of artillery and cavalry. We are not yet in condition to move, maybe by tomorrow morning. Pope must cut through today or adopt the plan I suggested. I have ordered troops to garrison the works at Upton's Hill. They must be held at any cost. As soon as I can see the way to spare them, I will send a corps of good troops there. It is the key to Washington, which cannot be seriously menaced as long as it is held. I received the following from the General-in-Chief. August 28, 1862. I think you had better place Sumner's Corps as it arrives near the guns, and particularly at the Chain Bridge. The principal thing to be feared now is a cavalry raid into this city, especially in the night time. Use Cox's and Tyler's brigades and the new troops for the same object if you need them. Porter writes to Burnside from Bristow, 9.30 a.m. yesterday, that Pope's forces were then moving on Manassas, and that Burnside would soon hear of them by way of Alexandria. General Cullum has gone to Harper's Ferry, and I have only a single regular officer for duty in the office. Please send some of your officers today to see that every precaution is taken at the forts against a raid, also at the bridge. Please answer. On the 29th, the following dispatch was telegraphed to General Halleck. August 29th, 10.30 a.m. Franklin's Corps is in motion, started about 6 a.m. I can give him but two squadrons of cavalry. I propose moving General Cox to Upton's Hill to hold that important point with its works, and to push cavalry scouts to Vienna via Freedom Hill and Hunter's Lane. Cox has two squadrons of cavalry. Please answer at once whether this meets your approval. I have directed Woodbury, with the Engineer Brigade, to hold Fort Lyon. Sumner detached last night two regiments to vicinity of Forts Ethan Allen and Marcy. Mars Brigade is still at Aquia. If he moves in support of Franklin, it leaves us without any reliable troops in and near Washington. Yet Franklin is too weak alone. What shall be done? No more cavalry arrives. Have but three squadrons. Franklin has but 40 rounds of ammunition and no wagons to move more. I do not think Franklin is in condition to accomplish much if he meets with serious resistance. I should not have moved him but for your pressing order of last night. What have you from Vienna and Drainsville? To which the following is a reply from General Halleck. August 29th, 12 noon. Upton Hill arrangement, all right. We must send wagons and ammunition to Franklin as fast as they arrive. Mars Brigade ordered up yesterday. Fitzhugh Lee was, it is said on good authority, in Alexandria on Sunday last for three hours. I have nothing from Drainsville. On the same day, the following was received from His Excellency the President. Washington, August 29, 1862, 2.30 p.m. What news from the direction of Manassas Junction? What generally? A. Lincoln, Major General McClellan. To which I replied as follows. August 29, 1862, to 45 p.m. The last news I received from the direction of Manassas was from stragglers, to the effect that the enemy were evacuating Centerville and retiring toward Thoroughfare Gap. This by no means reliable. I am clear that one of two courses should be adopted. First, to concentrate all our available forces to open communications with Pope. Second, to leave Pope to get out of his scrape and at once use all our means to make the capital perfectly safe. No middle ground will now answer. Tell me what you wish me to do, and I will do all of my power to accomplish it. I wish to know what my orders and authority are. I ask for nothing, but will obey whatever orders you give. 
I only ask a prompt decision that I may at once give the necessary orders. It will not do to delay longer. George B. McClellan, Major General. A. Lincoln, President. And copy to General Halleck. To which the following is a reply. Washington, August 29th, 1862, 4, 10 p.m. Yours of today just received. I think your first alternative, to wit, to concentrate all our available forces to open communication with Pope, is the right one, but I wish not to control. That I now leave to General Halleck, aided by your counsels. A. Lincoln, Major General McClellan. It had been officially reported to me from Washington that the enemy, in strong force, was moving through Vienna in the direction of the Chain Bridge, and had a large force in Vienna. This report, in connection with the dispatch of the General-in-Chief on the 28th, before noted, induced me to direct Franklin to halt his command near Annandale until it could be determined, by reconnaissances to Vienna and towards Manassas, whether these reports were true. General Cox was ordered to send his small cavalry force from Upton's Hill towards Vienna and Drainsville in one direction, and towards Fairfax Courthouse in the other, and Franklin to push his two squadrons as far towards Manassas as possible, in order to ascertain the true position of the enemy. With the enemy in force at Vienna and towards Lewinsville, it would have been very injudicious to have pushed Franklin's small force beyond Annandale. It must be remembered that at that time we were cut off from direct communication with General Pope, that the enemy was, by the last accounts, at Manassas in strong force, and that Franklin had only from 10,000 to 11,000 men, with an entirely insufficient force of cavalry and artillery. In order to represent this condition of affairs in its proper light to the General-in-Chief, and to obtain definite instructions from him, I telegraphed to him as follows. August 29th, 12 noon. I have ordered most of the 12th Pennsylvania Cavalry to report to General Barnard for scouting duty towards Rockville, Poolsville, etc. If you apprehend a raid of cavalry on your side of river, I had better send a brigade or two of Sumner's to near Tenali Town where, with two or three old regiments in Forts Allen and Marcy, they can watch both Chain Bridge and Tenali Town. Would it meet your views to post the rest of Sumner's Corps between Arlington and Fort Corcoran, where they can either support Cox, Franklin, or Chain Bridge, and even Tenali Town? Franklin has only between 10,000 and 11,000 for duty. How far do you wish this force to advance? Also the following. August 29th, 1 p.m. I anxiously await reply to my last dispatch in regard to Sumner. Wish to give the order at once. Please authorize me to attach new regiments permanently to my old brigades. I can do much good to old and new troops in that way. I shall endeavor to hold a line in advance of Forts Allen and Marcy, at least with strong advanced guards. I wish to hold the line through Prospect Hill, McCall's, Miners, and Hall's Hills. This will give us timely warning. Shall I do as seems best to me with all the troops in this vicinity, including Franklin, who I really think ought not, under present circumstances, to advance beyond Annandale? On the same day I received a dispatch from the General-in-Chief, in which he asks me why I halted Franklin in Annandale, to which I replied as follows. August 29th, 10.30 a.m. By referring to my telegrams of 10.30 a.m., 12 noon, and 1 p.m., together with your reply of 2.48 p.m., you will see why Franklin's corps halted at Annandale. His small cavalry force, all I had to give him, was ordered to push on as far as possible towards Manassas. It was not safe for Franklin to move beyond Annandale, under the circumstances, until we knew what was at Vienna. General Franklin remained here until about 1 p.m., endeavoring to arrange for supplies for his command. I am responsible for both these circumstances, and do not see that either was in disobedience to your orders. Please give distinct orders in reference to Franklin's movements of tomorrow. I have sent to Colonel Haupt to push out construction and supply trains as soon as possible. General Tyler to furnish the necessary guards. I have directed General Banks' supply trains to start out tonight at least as far as Annandale, with an escort from General Tyler. In regard to tomorrow's movements, I desire definite instructions, as it is not agreeable to me to be accused of disobeying orders, when I have simply exercised the discretion you committed to me. On the same evening, I sent the following dispatches to General Halleck. August 29th, 10 p.m. Not hearing from you, I have sent orders to General Franklin to place himself in communication with General Pope as soon as possible, and at the same time cover the transit of Pope's supplies. Orders have been given for railway and wagon trains to move to Pope with least possible delay. 
I am having inspections made of all the forts around the city by members of my staff, with instructions to give all requisite orders. I inspected Worth and Ward myself this evening, found them in good order. Reports, so far as heard from, are favorable as to the condition of works. August 29th, 10 p.m., your dispatch received. Franklin's Corps has been ordered to march at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Sumner has about 14,000 infantry without cavalry or artillery here. Cox's brigade of four regiments is here with two batteries of artillery. Men of two regiments, much fatigued, came in today. Tyler's brigade of three new regiments, but little drilled, is also here. All these troops will be ordered to hold themselves ready to march tomorrow morning and all except Franklin's to await further orders. If you wish any of them to move towards Manassas, please inform me. Colonel Wagner, 2nd New York Artillery, has just come in from the front. He reports strong infantry and cavalry force of rebels near Fairfax Courthouse, reports rumors from various sources that Lee and Stewart, with large forces, are at Manassas, that the enemy, with 120,000 men, intend advancing on the forts near Arlington and Chain Bridge, with a view of attacking Washington and Baltimore. General Barnard telegraphs me tonight that the length of the line of fortifications on this side of the Potomac requires 2,000 additional artillerymen and additional troops to defend intervals according to circumstances. At all events, he says, an old regiment should be added to the force at Chain Bridge and a few regiments distributed along the lines to give confidence to our new troops. I agree with him fully and think our fortifications along the upper part of our line on this side of the river are very unsafe for their present garrisons and the movements of the enemy seem to indicate an attack upon those works. August 30th, 11.30 a.m. Your telegram of 9 a.m. received. Ever since General Franklin received notice that he was to march from Alexandria, he has been endeavoring to get transportation from the quartermaster at Alexandria, but he has uniformly been told that there was none disposable, and his command marched without wagons. After the departure of his corps, he procured 20 wagons to carry some extra ammunition, by unloading Banks's supply train. General Sumner endeavored, by application upon the quartermaster's department, to get wagons to carry his reserve ammunition, but without success, and was obliged to march with what he could carry in his cartridge boxes. I have this morning directed that all my headquarters wagons that are landed be at once loaded with ammunition for Sumner and Franklin, but they will not go far towards supplying the deficiency. Eighty-five wagons were got together by the quartermasters last night, loaded with subsistence, and sent forward at 1 a.m. with an escort via Annandale. Every effort has been made to carry out your orders promptly. The great difficulty seems to consist in the fact that the greater part of the transportation on hand at Alexandria and Washington has been needed for current supplies of the garrisons. Such is the state of the case as represented to me by the quartermasters, and it appears to be true. I take it for granted that this has not been properly explained to you. On the morning of the 30th, heavy artillery firing was heard in the direction of Fairfax Courthouse, which are reported to the General-in-Chief. August 30th, 9.15 a.m. Heavy artillery firing is now in progress in the direction of Fairfax Courthouse. There has been a good deal of it for two or three hours. I hear it so distinctly that I should judge it to be this side of Fairfax. Have not yet been able to ascertain the cause. It seems that the garrisons in the works on north side of Potomac are altogether too small. At 8 a.m. the following was sent to General J.G. Barnard in Washington. August 30th, 8 a.m. I yesterday sent nearly a regiment of cavalry to report to you for scouting on north bank of Potomac. Three brigades of Sumners are on both sides of Chain Bridge and thence to Tenali Town. The rest of this corps near Arlington and Corcoran. I have nothing in hand here at all, not a man. You had better ask for some more raw troops on north side. At 8.20 a.m., the following was sent to General Burnside at Falmouth. August 30th, 8.20 a.m., telegram of midnight received. Use your discretion about the cavalry. I have only three squadrons, two of which with Franklin. I expect some today. Do not strip yourself of anything. Your information about Pope substantially confirmed from this side. His troops are at Centerville. Supplies have gone to him by rail and by wagon. Secesh has missed his first coup. We shall soon see what his second is to be. At 11 a.m., the following telegram was sent to General Halleck. August 30th, 11 a.m., have ordered Sumner to leave one brigade in vicinity of Chain Bridge and to move the rest via Columbia Pike on Annandale and Fairfax Courthouse. 
Is this the route you wish them to take? He and Franklin are both instructed to join Pope as promptly as possible. Shall Couch move out also when he arrives? On the same day, I received the following from General Halleck. August 30th, 145 p.m. Ammunition, and particularly for artillery, must be immediately sent forward to Centerville for General Pope. It must be done with all possible dispatch. To which this reply was made. August 30th, 2.10 p.m. I know nothing of the calibers of Pope's artillery. All I can do is to direct my ordnance officer to load up all the wagons sent to him. I have already sent all my headquarters wagons. You will have to see that wagons are sent from Washington. I can do nothing more than give the order that every available wagon in Alexandria shall be loaded at once. The order to the brigade of Sumner that I directed to remain near Chain Bridge and Tonali Town should go from your headquarters to save time. I understand you to intend it also to move. I have no sharpshooters except a guard around my camp. I have sent off every man but those and will now send them with the train as you direct. I will also send my only remaining squadron of cavalry with General Sumner. I can do no more. You now have every man of the Army of the Potomac who is within my reach. The War Department now issued the following order. War Department, August 30th, 1862. The following are the commanders of the armies operating in Virginia. General Burnside commands his own corps, except those that have been temporarily detached and assigned to General Pope. General McClellan commands that portion of the Army of the Potomac that has not been sent forward to General Pope's command. General Pope commands the Army of Virginia and all the forces temporarily attached to it. All the forces are under the command of Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief. E.D. Townsend, Assistant, Adjutant General. I was informed by Colonel Townsend that the above order was published by order of the Secretary of War. The following dispatch was sent to General Barnard at Washington the same day. August 30th, 3.20 p.m. Your telegram to General Williams received. Of course, everything is under your charge, as usual. Upon arriving here and finding the state of things uncertain in my front, I took all the means in my power to place affairs in a safe condition. At the request of General Halleck, I sent some of my staff officers to inspect the works. I have placed Tyler's regiment in garrison near here and ordered the 14th Massachusetts to duty again as heavy artillery. I have merely used my authority as the senior general officer for duty to assist you, having failed to find you. The whole of Sumner's Corps has been ordered to the front by General Halleck. Couch's division will take the same direction as soon as it arrives. I am now sending off my camp guard and escort, the last I can do. Tyler will, of course, be under your orders so long as he remains in the works. I have no more troops to give you, and as I have no command nor any position, I shall not regard it as my duty to take any further steps in regard to the works, except that I shall always be glad to confer with you in regard to any point about which you may be in doubt. I shall try to see General Cox at Upton's Hill today or tomorrow. I think he ranks you, but his command was the only one available for the purpose. The following were sent to General Halleck the same afternoon. August 30th, 5.15 p.m. Dispatch just received from General Cox at Upton's Hill reports that his cavalry has been to Fairfax Courthouse, Vienna, Freedom Hill, and Lewinsville and found all quiet and no enemy heard of in immediate neighborhood. Has a party out to go to Drainsville if practicable. States that at 4 p.m. Lieutenant Colonel Fowler of 14th Brooklyn passed him in an ambulance wounded who states that the fighting was north of Little River Pike between it and Thoroughfare Gap. Longstreet had passed through the gap, which was substantially partially obstructed by our troops, so that it would hardly be practicable as a retreat for artillery. Reports general result of fighting in our favor, but cannot give particulars. General Cox states that firing at 4 p.m. was more rapid and continuous than before. I still hear it. August 30th, 7.45 p.m. I am glad to report the arrival of Colonel Gregg with about 450 of his regiment, the 8th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Colonel Gregg will disembark during the night and lose no time in getting his men ready to march. More of General Couch's division have arrived. I have ordered them to disembark during the night. Have you any special orders for Gregg? Couch's infantry are almost too good to use as railway guards. It is an excellent division of veterans. Will you permit new troops to be used for the purpose? At 10.30 p.m., the following telegram was sent to General Halleck. August 30th, 10.30 p.m. I have sent to the front all my troops, with the exception of Couch's division, 
and have given the orders necessary to ensure its being disposed of as you directed. I hourly expect the return of one of my aides who will give authentic news from the field of battle. I cannot express to you the pain and mortification I have experienced today in listening to the distant sound of the firing of my men. As I can be of no further use here, I respectfully ask that, if there is a probability of the conflict being renewed tomorrow, I may be permitted to go to the scene of battle with my staff, merely to be with my own men, if nothing more. They will fight none the worse for my being with them. If it is not deemed best to entrust me with the command even of my own army, I simply ask to be permitted to share their fate on the field of battle. Please reply to this tonight. I have been engaged for the last few hours in doing what I can to make arrangements for the wounded. I have started out all the ambulances now landed. As I have sent my escort to the front, I would be glad to take some of Greg's cavalry with me if allowed to go. To which on the following day I received this answer. August 31st, 918 a.m. I have just seen your telegram of 11.30 last night. The substance was stated to me when received, but I did not know you asked for a reply immediately. I cannot answer without seeing the President, as General Pope is in command, by his orders, of the Department. I think Couch's division should go forward as rapidly as possible and find the battlefield. On the same day, the following was received from General Halleck. August 31st, 12.45 p.m. The Subsistence Department are making Fairfax Station their principal depot. It should be well guarded. The officer in charge should be directed to secure the depot by abatis against cavalry. As many as possible of the new regiment should be prepared to take the field. Perhaps some more should be sent to the vicinity of Chain Bridge. At 2.30 p.m., the following dispatch was telegraphed to General Halleck. August 31st, 2.30 p.m. Major Haller is at Fairfax Station with my provost and headquarters guard and other troops. I requested four more companies to be sent at once, and the precautions you direct to be taken. Under the War Department order of yesterday, I have no control over anything except my staff, some 100 men in my camp here, and the few remaining near Fort Monroe. I have no control over the new regiments, do not know where they are or anything about them, except those near here. Their commanding officers and those in the works are not under me. Where I have seen evils existing under my eye, I have corrected them. I think it is the business of General Casey to prepare the new regiments for the field, and a matter between him and General Barnard to order others to the vicinity of Chain Bridge. Neither of them is under my command, and by the War Department order, I have no right to give them orders. To which the following was the answer from General Halleck. August 31st, 10.07 p.m. Since receiving a dispatch relating to command, I have not been able to answer any not of absolute necessity. I have not seen the order as published, but will write you in the morning. You will retain the command of everything in this vicinity not temporarily belonging to Pope's army in the field. I beg of you to assist me in this crisis with your ability and experience. I am entirely tired out. The following reply was sent to General Halleck that night. August 31st, 1025 p.m. I am ready to afford you any assistance in my power, but you will readily perceive how difficult an undefined position such as I now hold must be. At what hour in the morning can I see you alone, either at your own house or the office? At 7.30 p.m., the following was sent to General Halleck. August 31st, 7.30 p.m. Having been informed that there were some 20,000 stragglers from Pope's army between this and Centerville, all of Gregg's cavalry have been sent to endeavor to drive them back to their regiments. 200 of 8th Illinois cavalry will be ready in the morning, and 250 more as soon as disembarked. The armament of Forts Buffalo and Ramsey is very incomplete. At 11.30 p.m., I telegraphed the following to General Halleck. August 31st, 11.30 p.m. The squadron of 2nd Regular Cavalry that I sent with General Sumner was captured today about 2 p.m., some three miles from Fairfax Courthouse, beyond it on the Little River Pike, by Fitzhugh Lee with 3,000 cavalry and three light batteries. I have conversed with the first sergeant, who says that when he last saw them, they were within a mile of Fairfax. Pope had no troops on that road, the squadron getting there by mistake. There is nothing of ours on the right of Centerville but Sumner's Corps. There was much artillery firing during the day. A rebel major told the sergeant that the rebels had driven in our entire left today. He said the road is filled with wagons and stragglers coming towards Alexandria. It is clear from the sergeant's account that we were badly beaten yesterday and that Pope's right is entirely exposed. 
I recommend that no more of Couch's division be sent to the front, that Burnside be brought here as soon as practicable, and that everything available this side of Fairfax be drawn in at once, including the mass of the troops on the railroad. I apprehend that the enemy will, or have by this time, occupied Fairfax Courthouse and cut off Pope entirely, unless he falls back tonight via Sangsters and Fairfax Station. I think these orders ought to be sent at once. I have no confidence in the dispositions made as I gather them. To speak frankly, and the occasion requires it, there appears to be a total absence of brains, and I fear the total destruction of the army. I have some cavalry here that can carry out any orders you may have to send. The occasion is grave and demands grave measures. The question is the salvation of the country. I learned that our loss yesterday amounted to 15,000. We cannot afford such losses without an object. It is my deliberate opinion that the interests of the nation demand that Pope should fall back tonight, if possible, and not one moment is to be lost. I will use all the cavalry I have to watch our right. Please answer at once. I feel confident that you can rely upon the information I give you. I shall be up all night and ready to obey any orders you give me. To which this reply was received from General Halleck. September 1, 1.30 a.m. Burnside was ordered up very early yesterday morning. Retain remainder of Couch's forces and make arrangements to stop all retreating troops in line of works, or where you can best establish an entire line of defense. My news from Pope was up to 4 p.m. He was then all right. I must wait for more definite information before I can order a retreat, as the falling back on the line of works must necessarily be directed in case of a serious disaster. Give me all additional news that is reliable. I shall be up all night and ready to act as circumstances may require. I am fully aware of the gravity of the crisis and have been for weeks. It will be seen from what has proceeded that I lost no time in moving the Army of the Potomac from the peninsula to the support of the Army of Virginia, that I spared no effort to hasten the embarkation of the troops at Fort Monroe, Newport News, and Yorktown, remaining at Fort Monroe myself until the mass of the Army had sailed and that after my arrival at Alexandria, I left nothing in my power undone to forward supplies and reinforcements to General Pope. I sent with the troops that moved all the cavalry I can get a hold of. Even my personal escort was sent out upon the line of the railway as a guard, with a provost and camp guard at headquarters, retaining less than 100 men, many of whom were orderlies, invalids, members of bands, etc. All the headquarters teams that arrived were sent out with supplies and ammunition, none being retained even to move the headquarters camp. The squadron that habitually served as my personal escort was left at Falmouth with General Burnside as he was deficient in cavalry. End of chapter 30. Chapter 31 of McClellan's Own Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. Chapter 31. Private Letters, August 24th to September 2nd, 1862. August 24th, Sunday, 9.30 a.m., Aquia Creek. We reached here during the night sent a dispatch about six to Halleck, informing him that I had arrived here and awaited orders, also sent one to Burnside. I have no reply as yet to my dispatches, and am not at all impatient. I learn that all my troops are ordered to Alexandria for embarkation, so I presume they will be merged into Pope's army. If this is the case, I will, if I find it proper, try for a leave of absence. I learn nothing whatever of the state of affairs, not even whether Pope is falling back or whether there has been any fighting. So I suppose it is all right. I fancy that Pope is in retreat, though this is only a guess of mine, without anything to base it on. I don't see how I can remain in the service if placed under Pope. It would be too great a disgrace, and I can hardly think that Halleck would permit it to be offered me. I expect Porter and Burnside here in a few minutes, and then we'll know something of the state of affairs, I hope. This is a wretched place, utterly unfit for the landing and supplying of a large body of troops. They have at last found it out, though H. insisted upon it that there were ample facilities here for all purposes. 12.15 p.m. I have seen Burnside and Porter and gained some information from them. 
I have not one word yet from Washington, and am quietly waiting here for something to turn up. I presume they are discussing me now to see whether they can get along without me. They will suffer a terrible defeat if the present state of affairs continues. I know that with God's help I can save them. August 25th, 1 p.m. Was at Falmouth pretty much all night. August 27th, a.m., Alexandria. We arrived here last night. Rose early, reported to Washington that I had arrived, and am waiting for something to turn up. It seems that some 500 of the enemy's cavalry made a dash last night and burned the Bull Run Railroad Bridge. I fear this will cause much inconvenience, as the troops in front are mainly dependent on the railroad for supplies. My troops are getting pretty well into position. Porter between Fredericksburg and the Rappahannock Station, Heinzelman at Rappahannock Station, Franklin near this place, Sumner landing at Acquia Creek. I have heard nothing new today and don't know what is going on in front. Am terribly ignorant of the state of affairs and therefore somewhat anxious to know. I find all going on well enough here. Davis has just returned from selecting a camp for headquarters. He has picked out a place between the seminary, our old camp, and the river, about one half or three quarters of a mile from the seminary. I shall go into my tent this time and not trouble the house. With the exception of the two or three days I passed at Williamsburg on our upward march and one night at Fort Monroe, I have not slept in a house since I left you. I know nothing definite yet in regard to my fate. 10.30. Have been again interrupted by telegrams requiring replies. Halleck is in a disagreeable situation. Can get no information from the front, either as to our own troops or the enemy. I shall do all I can to help him loyally and will trouble him as little as possible, but render all the assistance in my power without regard to myself or my own position. Our affairs here are much tangled up, and I opine that in a day or two your old husband will be called upon to unravel them. In the meantime, I shall be very patient, do to the best of my ability whatever I am called upon to do, and wait my time. I hope to have my part of the work pretty well straightened out today. In that case, I shall move up to Washington this evening. I have just heard that it is probable that a general engagement will be fought today or tomorrow near Warrington. August 28th, 9.30 a.m., Steamer Ariel. I am just about starting back for Alexandria. I came up here, Washington, last night, reached Halleck's house about midnight, and remained talking with him until 3. I have a great deal of hard work before me now, but will do my best to perform it. I find Halleck well disposed. He has had much to contend against. I shall keep as clear as possible of the President and Cabinet, endeavor to do what must be done with Halleck alone, so I shall get on better. Pope is in a bad way. His communication with Washington cut off, and I have not yet the force at hand to relieve him. He has nearly all the troops of my army that have arrived. I hope to hear better news when I reach Alexandria. August 29th, 3 p.m. I was awake all last night and have not had one moment until now to write to you. I have a terrible task on my hands now, perfect imbecility to correct. No means to act with, no authority, yet determined, if possible, to save the country and the capital. I find the soldiers all clinging to me, yet I am not permitted to go to the post of danger. Two of my corps will either save Pope or be sacrificed for the country. I do not know whether I shall be permitted to save the capital or not. I have just telegraphed very plainly to the President and Halleck what I think ought to be done. I expect merely a contemptuous silence. I am heartsick with the folly and ignorance I see around me. God grant that I may never pass through such a scene again. 9.30 p.m. Late yesterday afternoon a violent gale arose and blew over my tent, soaking everything I had, including this note, and myself. I have been terribly busy since reaching here. Not a moment have I had to myself. I found everything in the most terrible confusion, apparently inextricably so. But affairs are now better. The works on this side of the river are in condition for defense. I see the evening paper states that I have been placed in command of all the troops in Virginia. This is not so. I have no command at present. That is to say, I have none of the Army of the Potomac with me and have merely turned in on my own account to straighten out whatever I catch hold of. By tomorrow evening I hope to have the works, etc., in fair condition of defense. Pope has been in a tight place, but from the news received this evening I think the danger is pretty much over. 
Tomorrow we'll tell the story. I am terribly crippled by the want of cavalry. None of mine have arrived except three small squadrons. I hope for more tonight. There was a terrible scare in Washington last night. A rumor got out that Lee was advancing rapidly on the chain bridge with 150,000 men. In such a stampede, I did not get five minutes consecutive sleep all night, so thick were the telegrams. I have seen neither the President nor the Secretary since I arrived here, have been only once to Washington, and hope to see very little of the place. I abominate it terribly. I have no faith in anyone here and expect to be turned loose the moment their alarm is over. I expect I got into a row with Halleck tonight. He sent me a telegram I did not like, and I told him so very plainly. He is not a refined person at all, and probably says rough things when he don't mean them. August 30th, 8 a.m. Was awakened last night by a few scattering shots that no doubt came from some of those very raw troops that are about here. Shall start soon after breakfast and ride to Upton's Hill, thence to the Chain Bridge and along the line of forts. I want to see all on this side of the river today, if I can. No one in Washington appears to know the condition of matters, and I have a fancy for finding them out for myself. If I once get matters reasonably straight, I shall not trouble myself much more. What I am doing now is rather a volunteer affair, not exactly my business, but you know that I have a way of attending to most other things than my own affairs. 1.30 p.m. Camp near Alexandria. I expected to start out on a long ride, but have thus far been detained by various matters which have kept me very busy. There has been heavy firing going on all day long somewhere beyond Bull Run. I have sent up every man I have, pushed everything, and am left here on the flat of my back without any command whatever. It is dreadful to listen to this cannonading and not be able to take any part in it, but such is my fate. 9.15 p.m. I feel too blue and disgusted to write any more now, so I will smoke a cigar and try to get into a better humor. They have taken all my troops from me. I have even sent off my personal escort and camp guard, and am here with a few orderlies and the aides. I have been listening to the sound of a great battle in the distance. My men engaged in it, and I away. I never felt worse in my life. Sunday, 31st, 9.30 a.m. There was a severe battle yesterday, and almost exactly on the old Bull Run battleground. Pope sent in accounts during the day that he was getting on splendidly, driving the enemy all day, gaining a glorious victory, etc., etc. About three this morning, Hammerstein returned from the field, where I had sent him to procure information, and told me that we were badly whipped. McDowell's and Sigel's corps broken. The corps of my own army that were present, Porter and Heinzelman, badly cut up, but in perfect order. Banks was not engaged. Franklin had arrived and was in position at Centerville. Sumner must have got up by this time. Couch's division is about starting. It is probable that the enemy are too much fatigued to renew the attack this morning, perhaps not at all today, so that time may be given to our people to make such arrangements as will enable them to hold their own. I telegraphed last evening asking permission to be with my troops. Received a reply about half an hour ago from Halleck that he would have to consult the president first. If they refuse to let me go out, I think I shall feel obliged to insist upon a leave or something of the kind, the moment the question of the existing battle is settled. I feel like a fool here, sucking my thumbs and doing nothing but what ought to be done by junior officers. I leave it all in the hands of the Almighty. I will try to do my best in the position that may be assigned to me, and be as patient as I can. 10.45 I feel in that state of excitement and anxiety that I can hardly keep still for a moment. I learn from Hammerstein that the men in front are all anxious for me to be with them. It is too cruel. 12.30 p.m. A short time since I saw the order defining commands. Mine is that part of the Army of the Potomac not sent the Pope. As all is sent there, I am left in command of nothing, a command I feel fully competent to exercise and to which I can do full justice. I am going to write a quiet, moderate letter to Mr. Blank presently, explaining to him the exact state of the case, without comment, so that my friends in New York may know all. Everything is too uncertain and unsafe around Washington at present for you to dream of going there. As a matter of self-respect, I cannot go there. I do not regard Washington as safe against the rebels. If I can quietly slip over there, I will send your silver off. There is an order forbidding anyone going there without permission from the War Department, 
and I do not care to ask them for so slight a favor as that. September 1st, Washington, 2 p.m. I have only time to tell you that I have been placed in command of Washington and all the garrisons, etc., in the vicinity, to do the best I can with it. The decisive battle will be fought today near Fairfax Courthouse. My headquarters are to be in town. If the squall passes over and Washington is a safe place, you shall come on to see me if I can't get off to see you. End of chapter 31「Chapter thirty two of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter thirty two Recalled to save the Capitol. Pope defeated. The President appeals to McClellan. He accepts command. Alarm in Washington. Enthusiasm of the Army. The Capitol safe. The Order of September second. Halleck's testimony. Stormy cabinet meeting. Late at night of August 31st, I think, Major Hammerstein, one of my aides, whom I had sent to the front to bring me news as to the real state of affairs, returned, bringing a dispatch from Pope, which was to be sent to Halleck by telegraph. The information Hammerstein brought proved that Pope's dispatch was false throughout. On the 1st of September, I met General Halleck at his office in Washington, who by verbal order directed me to take charge of Washington and its defenses, but expressly prohibited me from exercising any control over the active troops under General Pope. At this interview, I told him what I had every reason to know to be the true state of affairs. He doubted the accuracy of my information and believed the statements of Pope. I then told him that he ought to go to the front in person and see what the true condition of affairs was. He said that he was so much occupied with office duty that it was impossible for him to leave. I told him that there could be no duty so important for the general-in-chief of the armies as to know the condition of the chief army of the country than actually fighting for the defense of the capital, and that his first duty was to go out and see for himself how matters stood, and, if need be, assume command in person. He merely repeated his reply, and I urged him as strongly as possible to follow my advice. He still refused and I then urged him to send out his chief of staff, General Cullum, who just then entered the room, but Cullum said that he could not go. Then I asked that Kelton, his adjutant general, might be sent. Kelton cheerfully offered to go, and it was determined that he should start immediately. I took Kelton to one side and advised him not to content himself with merely seeing Pope, but also to make it a point to converse freely with the general officers and learn their individual opinions. Next morning, while I was at breakfast at 7 or 7.30 o'clock, the President and General Halleck came to my house. The President informed me that Colonel Kelton had returned and represented the condition of affairs as much worse than I had stated to Halleck on the previous day, that there were 30,000 stragglers on the roads, that the army was entirely defeated and falling back to Washington in confusion. He then said that he regarded Washington as lost, and asked me if I would, under the circumstances, as a favor to him, resume command and do the best that could be done. Without one moment's hesitation, and without making any conditions whatever, I at once said that I would accept the command and would stake my life that I would save the city. Both the President and Halleck again asserted that it was impossible to save the city, and I repeated my firm conviction that I could and would save it. They then left, the president verbally placing me in entire command of the city and of the troops falling back upon it from the front. He instructed me to take steps at once to stop and collect the stragglers, to place the works in a proper state of defense, and to go out to meet and take command of the army when it approached the vicinity of the works, then to put the troops in the best position for defense, committing everything to my hands. The president left me with many thanks and showing much feeling. I immediately went to work, collected my staff, and started them in all directions with the necessary orders to the different fortifications, some to the front with orders for the disposition of such corps as they met, others to see to the prompt forwarding of ammunition and supplies to meet the retreating troops. In the course of the morning I signed a requisition for small arms and ammunition upon the commandant of the arsenal. After a time it was brought back to me with the statement that it could not be filled for the reason that the contents of the arsenal were all being put or about being put on board ship for transportation to New York, or some safe place, 
in accordance with the orders of the Secretary of War and General-in-Chief, in order to save the stores from the enemy. I at once started out and succeeded in having the order countermanded. At the same time, there was a war steamer anchored off the White House with steam up, ready to take off the President, Cabinet, etc. at a moment's notice. The only published order ever issued in regard to the extent of my command after my interview with the President on the morning of the 2nd was the following. Footnote. See Note A at end of this chapter. End footnote. War Department, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, September 2nd, 1862. Major General McClellan will have command of the fortifications of Washington and of all the troops for the defense of the Capitol. By order of Major General Halleck, E.D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General. I sent an aide to General Pope with the following letter. Headquarters, Washington, September 2, 1862. Major General John Pope, commanding Army of Virginia. General, General Halleck instructed me to repeat to you the order he sent this morning to withdraw your army to Washington without unnecessary delay. He feared that his messenger might miss you and desired to take this double precaution. In order to bring troops upon ground with which they are already familiar, it would be best to move Porter's Corps upon Upton's Hill, that it may occupy Hall's Hill, etc., McDowell's to Upton's Hill, Franklin's to the works in front of Alexandria, Heinzelman to the same vicinity, Couch to Fort Corcoran, or, if practicable, to the Chain Bridge, Sumner either to Fort Albany or to Alexandria, as may be most convenient. In haste, General, very truly yours, George B. McClellan, Major General, USA. In a very short time, I had made all the requisite preparations and was about to start to the front in person to assume command as far out as possible. When a message came to me from General Halleck informing me that it was the President's order that I should not assume command until the troops had reached the immediate vicinity of the fortifications. I therefore waited until the afternoon when I rode out to the most advanced of the detached works covering the capital. I had with me Colburn, Key, and some other aides, with a small cavalry escort, and rode at once to Munson's Hill. About the time I reached there, the infantry of King's Division of McDowell's Corps commenced arriving, and I halted them and ordered them into position. Very soon, within twenty minutes, a regiment of cavalry appeared, marching by twos, and sandwiched in the midst were Pope and McDowell with their staff officers. I never saw a more helpless-looking headquarters. About this time, rather heavy artillery firing was heard in the distance. When these generals rode up to me and the ordinary salutations had passed, I inquired what that artillery firing was. Pope replied that it was no doubt that of the enemy against Sumner, who formed the rear guard and was to march by the Vienna and Langley Road. He also intimated that Sumner was probably in a dilemma. He could give me no information of any importance in relation to the whereabouts of the different corps, except in a most indefinite way, had evidently not troubled his head in the slightest about the movements of his army in retreat, and had coolly preceded the troops, leaving them to get out of the scrape as best they could. He and McDowell both asked my permission to go on to Washington, to which I assented, remarking at the same time that I was going to that artillery firing. They then took leave and started for Washington. I have never since seen Pope. Immediately, I dispatched all my aides and orderlies with instructions to the troops coming in by the Alexandria and Central Roads, retaining only Colburn with me. I borrowed three orderlies from some cavalry at hand, and, accompanied by them and Colburn, started to cross country as rapidly as possible to reach the Langley Road. By the time I reached that road, the firing had ceased, with the exception of perhaps a dropping shot occasionally. It was after dark. I think there was moonlight by the time I met the first troops, which were, I think, of Morrell's division, 5th Corps. Porter had gone on a little while before to make arrangements for the bivouac of his troops. I was at once recognized by the men, upon which there was great cheering and excitement. But when I came to the regular division, Sykes, the scene was the most touching I had up to that time experienced. The cheers in front had attracted their attention, and I have been told since by many that the men at once pricked up their ears and said that it could only be for little Mac. As soon as I came to them, the poor fellows broke through all restraints, rushed from the ranks, and crowded around me, shouting, yelling, shedding tears, thanking God that they were with me again, and begging me to lead them back to battle. It was a wonderful scene and proved that I had the hearts of these men. Footnote. See Note B. End footnote. 
I next met Sigel's corps, and soon satisfied myself that Sumner was pursuing his march unmolested, so I sent on to inform him that I was in command and gave him instructions as to his march. I then returned by the Chain Bridge Road, having first given Sigel his orders, and at a little house beyond Langley I found Porter, with whom I spent some time, and at length reached Washington at an early hour in the morning. Before the day broke, the troops were all in position to repulse attack, and Washington was safe. Note A. Note by the Editor. This order of September 2, 1862, was the last order ever issued to General McClellan giving him any command. He seems never to have known that it actually appeared in two forms within 24 hours. First, as an order from the President by direction of the Secretary of War. Second, as a simple order of General Halleck. The history of its origin and modification is obscure. The purposes of Secretary Stanton and General Halleck in its issue and the change of its form must be left to conjecture with what light can be thrown on it from the events of the time. When these events are seen in close relation, every honest mind must be filled with amazement at the duplicity with which McClellan was surrounded. The War Department had occupied itself in giving out what Secretary Wells called exaggerated rumors, but which were pure fabrications designed to convince the public that McClellan had been the cause of Pope's defeat by delay in forwarding reinforcements. Mr. Stanton and General Halleck had assumed the responsibility of recalling the Army of the Potomac from before Richmond, thus releasing the enemy to fall on Pope. Every military and common sense consideration had been violated. The paramount purpose was to take the army away from McClellan, since they had been unable to persuade Mr. Lincoln to take McClellan from the army. McClellan had been ordered to return for the purpose, as he was told, of taking the command of all the forces of Pope and his own troops combined. Having ordered the withdrawal of the Army of the Potomac, Halleck and Stanton had made the fearful error of not providing transportation for it, and, when aware of their blunder, threw the blame on McClellan. He arrived at Alexandria on the 26th August, under Halleck's direct command, who assumed the responsibility of everything, and declined to give McClellan any specific position. From day to day the country was informed, by telegrams inspired at the War Department, that McClellan was delaying the advance of troops to Pope. Meantime, McClellan, doing his own work, was also doing Halleck's work for him as a pure volunteer, while the latter was in a hopeless condition of mind, semi-paralyzed. The work done by McClellan was Herculean in sending forward his own troops, in volunteer inspection and adjustment of the defenses of Washington, in aiding and advising Halleck, who was powerless. The dispatches in Chapter 30, which indicate all this, are but a small portion of McClellan's orders and dispatches, during the five days after his arrival at Alexandria, which he left as part of his memoirs. I have exercised the discretion given me and reserved the remainder of these for future publication leaving here only such and so many as will outline what the general did from August 26th to August 31st. If no one else saw, it is clear, from Mr. Lincoln's dispatches to McClellan and his acts on September 2nd, that he saw and knew what Halleck did not do, and what McClellan was doing in those eventful days. General Halleck had written to McClellan on the peninsula, asking frank cooperation. McClellan had promised it heartily, and now gave it gallantly. Ignoring this, and seeking with others to throw in McClellan all the responsibilities of the five days, General Halleck, testifying before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, stated that McClellan was placed in command of the fortifications of Washington and all the troops for its defense on the day he arrived at Alexandria, and that the order of September 2nd was only the reduction in writing of that command. The following is Halleck's testimony. On his, General McClellan's, arrival at Alexandria, he was told to take immediate command of all the troops in and about Washington, in addition to those which properly belonged to the Army of the Potomac. Some days after he had been verbally directed to take such command, he asked for a formal order, which was issued from the Adjutant General's office. The order issued from the Adjutant General's office was after General Pope's army commenced falling back, and was dated September 2nd. But General McClellan had been in command ever since his arrival in Alexandria. He arrived at Alexandria on the 26th of August. The formal order was issued that he might have no difficulty with General Pope's forces, that they might not question his authority. That this testimony of General Halleck was distinctly false is now demonstrated beyond any dispute by the publication of his own correspondence with McClellan during the period August 26th to August 31st and by other proofs. 
It is charity to General Halleck to suppose that his mind and memory were muddled by the fearful catastrophe he and Secretary Stanton had brought on the army and country, so that when before the committee he had forgotten the countless facts which prove his statement untrue. From the 26th to the 30th August, his dispatches to McClellan recognized that officer as in command of his own army of the Potomac. On the 24th, McClellan, arrived at Acquia, had telegraphed him, Until I know what my command and position are to be, and whether you still intend to place me in the command indicated in your first letter to me, and orally through General Burnside at the Chickahominy, I cannot decide where I can be of most use. If your determination is unchanged, I ought to go to Alexandria at once. Please define my position and duties. Halleck made no reply to this, and from what followed it is evident that he had no intention of giving McClellan any command. It being his and Mr. Stanton's plan to order all the Army of the Potomac, piece by piece, away from McClellan's command, and discharge him. On the 27th, Halleck telegraphed McClellan, Take entire direction of the sending out troops from Alexandria. On the same day, McClellan telegraphed Halleck, Please inform me at once what my position is. I do not wish to act in the dark. To this, Halleck made no reply. On the 29th, McClellan telegraphed both the President and General Halleck, Tell me what you wish me to do, and I will do all in my power to accomplish it. I wish to know what my orders and authority are. I ask for nothing, but will obey whatever orders you give. I only ask a prompt decision. To this he received no reply, except that the President, replying to another part of the same dispatch, said, I wish not to control. That I leave to General Halleck, aided by your counsels. The unexplained and embarrassing position in which Halleck kept McClellan at this time is illustrated by many dispatches which are omitted from the present volume. Thus, on the 29th of August, General S. Williams, AAG at McClellan's camp near Alexandria, telegraphed Brigadier General James S. Wadsworth, military governor of Washington, It is important that these headquarters should receive the countersign issued to the guards at the Long Bridge. I was stopped late night before last, returning to camp, and compelled to go to your office for the countersign. Lieutenant Colonel Colburn, going to the city last night on important business requiring dispatch, was stopped at this end of the bridge and had to go back to Fort Albany. On both occasions, the officers of the guards, though aware of our positions, said they had no discretion. On the 30th, Assistant Adjutant General Williams telegraphs General Wadsworth, in the absence of orders defining the limits of his command, General McClellan issues a countersign today to the troops of the Army of the Potomac in this vicinity. It is Malvern. If yours is different, he will be obliged to you to communicate it, and also to instruct the guards at the Long Bridge to recognize ours. Do you know what command furnishes the guard for the Virginia end of the Long Bridge? A duplicate of the first part of the same dispatch was sent the same day to General John B. Slough, military governor of Alexandria, where General McClellan's own headquarters then were. Obviously, McClellan was not at this time in command of all the troops in and about Washington, General Halleck's testimony that he was notwithstanding. On the 30th, General McClellan telegraphed General Barnard, who was in command of the military defenses of Washington, I have no more troops to give you, and as I have no command nor any position, I shall not regard it as my duty to take any further steps in regard to the works. On the same day, McClellan telegraphed Halleck, You now have every man of the Army of the Potomac who is within my reach. This dispatch announced to General Halleck and Mr. Stanton the completion of their purpose in recalling the Army of the Potomac, namely to remove it from McClellan's command. Their response was now prompt, and McClellan received the first reply to his repeated requests to know what his position was in these words. General McClellan commands that portion of the Army of the Potomac that has not been sent forward to General Pope's command. McClellan's command was thus reduced to less than a hundred men, many of whom were maimed or sick soldiers around his tent at Alexandria. Secretary Stanton himself issued this order, which was, of course, intended to be insulting to McClellan, and which was received with much exultation in Washington by those who had desired McClellan's dismissal. At this moment, it was believed in Washington that Pope was victorious, and McClellan finally crushed. Of course, when McClellan's command was thus defined by this order, in terms whose exactness was intended to be contemptuous, he was not in command of any fortifications or any troops for the defense of anything. On the night of the 30th, McClellan made a vain appeal to Halleck 
to be allowed to go to the front and be with his troops in battle. On the afternoon of the 31st, in reply to an order from Halleck, McClellan telegraphed him, Under the War Department order of yesterday, I have no control over anything except my staff, some 100 men in my camp here, and the few remaining near Fort Monroe. I have no control over the new regiments. Their commanding officers and those of the works are not under me. At 10 p.m. of the 31st, Halleck replied to this, I have not seen the order as published, implying that he had seen it in Stanton's draft form, and adds, You will retain command of everything in this vicinity not temporarily to be Pope's army in the field. I beg of you to assist me in this crisis with your ability and experience. I am entirely tired out. This indefinite dispatch was the first hint of any order placing McClellan in command of the fortifications. On the same day, McClellan had telegraphed to Generals Wadsworth, Barnard, and Slough, General McClellan commands so few troops that he declines issuing a countersign, but he will be obliged if you will furnish him daily with yours, as he may have occasion to send to Washington during the night. At 10.25 p.m. on receipt of Halleck's despairing telegram, McClellan replied, I am ready to afford you any assistance in my power, but you will readily perceive how difficult an undefined position such as I now hold must be. At what hour in the morning can I see you alone? On the morning of September 1st, McClellan went up from Alexandria to Washington, and now Halleck verbally placed him in charge of the defenses of Washington, but expressly forbade him to exercise any control over the troops of the Army of the Potomac or the Army of Virginia. The untruthfulness of General Halleck's testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War is thus demonstrated. He and he alone was in command and responsible from August 26th to September 1st. General Halleck's verbal orders to General McClellan on September 1st gave the latter no control over the active army. Halleck was now encouraged about Pope and discredited McClellan's bad news from the front. Pope had telegraphed that he had fought a terrific battle, which lasted from daylight to dark, by which time the enemy was driven from the field which we now occupy. The enemy is still in our front, but badly used up. We have made great captures, but I am not able yet to form an idea of their extent. The urgency of McClellan, who discredited Pope's statements, alone induced Halleck to send Colonel Kelton to the front for information. The return of that officer in the night of September 1st to 2nd revealed the truth, which brought terror to Washington. Without dwelling on the condition of alarm into which the War Department was now plunged, it is important to note that it continued certainly till September 8th, when Mr. Hiram Barney, collector of the Port of New York, told Mr. Chase that Stanton and Wadsworth had advised him to leave for New York this evening, as communication with Baltimore might be cut off before tomorrow. Warden, page 415. Secretary Wells says Stanton and Halleck were filled with apprehension beyond others. They gave up the capital as lost, and issued orders to empty the arsenal preparatory to the occupation of Washington by the enemy. Early in the morning of September 2nd, the President, accompanied by General Halleck, went to General McClellan's house and found him alone. They told him the capital was lost. The President asked him if, under the circumstances, to wit the recent treatment of Stanton and Halleck and the insulting general order of August 30th, he would resume command and do the best that could be done. The instant acceptance of this vast responsibility by McClellan puts at rest a falsehood published on the authority of General Burnside, that McClellan proposed to make conditions, took time to consider, and finally only yielded to the persuasions of others in accepting the command. This story was a pure fabrication, one of thousands which were directed against McClellan, and which a deluded public widely accepted as true. General McClellan has contented himself with a brief account of this remarkable interview in which Mr. Lincoln, with deep emotion, threw himself and the salvation of the Capitol and the Union on the general whom his subordinates had cajoled, slandered, deceived, and represented to the people as disgraced. The terms of the trust reposed in him were unlimited. The simple words, resume command, were ample. Two honest minds were in contact, and each trusted the other. Mr. Lincoln then intended to give to McClellan discretionary powers over military matters, and neither of them stopped to choose words. General McClellan went swiftly to work. General Halleck went to inform Secretary Stanton of the overthrow of their plans by the recall of McClellan to command. 
It may here be noted that Mr. Chase was in error when, on September 19th, he said, Warden, page 480, that Halleck's telegram of August 31st, asking McClellan to help him, announced Halleck's surrender to McClellan. While Mr. Chase was right enough in thus confessing the existence of a war against McClellan, he might well have spared his criticisms, since it will appear in the progress of McClellan's narrative that Halleck maintained the war with much vigorous disregard of truth to the end which was sought. The events of September 2nd, which must be pursued, amply attest his position in the conflict, which now became more serious when the President appeared to stand firmly for McClellan. Hitherto no one has appreciated the state of mind of Mr. Lincoln at this appalling moment, when he realized the condition into which he and the country had been brought by the conspiracy of Mr. Stanton and his associate politicians against the army and its commander. Mr. Lincoln was a sagacious man. He knew thoroughly the character of the men who were around him had always known it. He had felt the importance of avoiding an open rupture with Congress, which was under the control of the extreme radical wing of the party. He had yielded much to this consideration. Now, when he heard from Mr. Stanton and General Halleck that the capital was lost and that they had issued orders for the abandonment of the arsenal and flight of the administration, he scouted their attempts to transfer their responsibility for the catastrophe to McClellan and went at once to the general with unbounded confidence in him. The quiet assurances he received from the man who never deceived him relieved his apprehensions of the loss of the capital, and he went away better prepared to meet his cabinet who were expecting the enemy around and in the city. He still shrank from an open rupture with Mr. Chase, Mr. Stanton, the majority of the Committee on the Conduct of the War, and Congress, which had become subservient to their leadership. He had hitherto prevented a division of the party, which was always imminent. Doubtless his avowed principle of not swapping horses while crossing a stream influenced him to his present determination to go on with the same cabinet officers in council and the same general in command. But when he left McClellan, the simple loyal soldier and servant of the people, he had to face men of a very different character. The cabinet meeting which now followed was in many respects the most remarkable ever held in Washington. Mr. Lincoln entered it knowing his men. He knew that Mr. Chase and Mr. Stanton were presidential candidates, guiding each in his own peculiar way, their official conduct and acts as his rivals for the next nomination. He was perfectly aware that in this critical time they were ready to throw on him all the responsibility of the impending ruin, the loss of the capital, if that were to be, the end of the Union itself, which might possibly follow. That they would seek to save their own reputations at any cost to his was a matter, of course, with such men. He had this advantage in meeting them, that McClellan's confidence had reassured him, while they were still in a state of wild alarm. Believing the loss of Washington and Maryland inevitable, and anticipating the judgment of the people of the North, they forgot all respect for their chief and became insolent in their treatment of him. Stanton reproached him with giving personal orders to McClellan, creating confusion, making neither Halleck nor McClellan responsible, and then disavowed any responsibility of the War Department for the position. Chase told him that any engineer officer would have done as well as the general he had selected, and boldly added that by placing McClellan in command, he had given the capital to the enemy. It was plain that the two presidential candidates in the cabinet had determined on their course to assure the country that Mr. Lincoln was alone responsible for the ruin they believed inevitable. The president retained his dignity and maintained at first a calm attitude. He had been accustomed for months to the nagging policy of the secretaries, but it now became so personal and bitter that he was at last driven to the exclamation, never before or since uttered by a President of the United States, that he would gladly resign his high office. The history of this tempestuous cabinet meeting forms an important part of the history of the war, and throws strong light on the story of McClellan and the Army of the Potomac. In his private diary, Warden, page 459, Mr. Chase thus describes it. The Secretary of War came in. In answer to some inquiry, the fact was stated by the President or the Secretary that McClellan had been placed in command of the forces to defend the Capitol, or rather, to use the President's own words, he had set him to putting these troops into the fortifications about Washington, believing that he could do that thing better than any other man. 
I remarked that this could be done equally well by the engineer who constructed the forts. The Secretary of War said that no one was now responsible for the defense of the Capitol, that the order to McClellan was given by the President direct to McClellan, and that General Halleck considered himself relieved from responsibility, although he acquiesced and approved the order, that McClellan could now shield himself should anything go wrong under Halleck, while Halleck could and would disclaim all responsibility for the order given. The President thought General Halleck as much responsible as before, and repeated that the whole scope of the order was simply to direct McClellan to put the troops into the fortifications and command them for the defense of Washington. I remarked that I could not but feel that giving command to him was equivalent to giving Washington to the rebels. This and more I said. The President said it distressed him exceedingly to find himself differing on such a point from the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Treasury, that he would gladly resign his place. But he could not see who could do the work wanted as well as McClellan. I named Hooker or Sumner or Burnside, either of whom would do the work better. Mr. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, in his book Lincoln and Seward, New York, 1874, page 194, says, At the stated cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the 2nd of September, while the whole community was stirred up and in confusion, and affairs were growing beyond anything that had previously occurred, Stanton entered the council room a few moments in advance of Mr. Lincoln, and said, with great excitement, he had just learned from General Halleck that the President had placed McClellan in command of the forces in Washington. The information was surprising, and, in view of the prevailing excitement against that officer, alarming. The President soon came in, and, in answer to an inquiry from Mr. Chase, confirmed what Stanton had stated. General regret was expressed, and Stanton, with some feeling, remarked that no order to that effect had issued from the War Department. The President, calmly but with some emphasis, said the order was his, and he would be responsible for it to the country. Before separating, the Secretary of the Treasury expressed his apprehension that the reinstatement of McClellan would prove a national calamity. Mr. Montgomery Blair, Postmaster General, in private letters, from which, now in the hands of the editor, the following extracts are taken, says, Under date April 22, 1870, The bitterness of Stanton on the reinstatement of McClellan you can scarcely conceive. He preferred to see the Capitol fall. McClellan was bound to go when the emergency was passed, and Halleck and Stanton furnished a pretense. Under date April 3, 1879, The folly and disregard of public interests thus exhibited would be incredible, but that the authors of this intrigue, Messrs. Stanton and Chase, when the result of it came, and I proposed the restoration of McClellan to command, and to prevent the completion of ruin by the fall of this capital, actually declared that they would prefer the loss of the capital to the restoration of McClellan to command. Yet these are the men who have been accounted by a large portion of our countrymen as the civil heroes of the war, while McClellan, who saved the capital, was dismissed. Whatever changes of mind Mr. Lincoln subsequently underwent may with probability be attributed to the causes already indicated. His personal confidence in McClellan on one hand and his desire to avoid a rupture with the radical wing of his party on the other hand. His adherence at this moment to his adopted plan, in face of the violence of the secretaries, was a notable exhibition of firmness. Meantime, McClellan, heedless of the renewed war in his rear, devoted his attention to the enemy in front. But when, acting on the trust imposed by the president, he was about to go out and meet the retreating army, Halleck stopped him with the information that the president had limited his command to the fortifications. Under all the circumstances, we may take leave to doubt whether any such order came from the president. It was contradictory to the spirit of the morning interview and merciless to an army pursued by a victorious enemy. At some time during the early part of the day, the order of September 2nd was prepared by General Halleck and telegraphed throughout the country in the following form. Headquarters of the Army, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, September 2, 1862. By direction of the President, Major General McClellan will have command of the fortifications of Washington and of all the troops for the defense of the Capitol. By order of the Secretary of War, E.D. Townsend, A.A. General. It will be remembered that Mr. Stanton had declared with some feeling, as Mr. Wells puts it, that no such order had issued from the War Department. 
but this order had issued as from the Secretary of War. Later in the day, and of course after General Halleck's interview with Secretary Stanton, it reappeared in the form following. War Department, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, September 2, 1862. Major General McClellan will have command of the fortifications of Washington and of all the troops for the defense of the Capitol by order of Major General Halleck, E.D. Townsend, A.A. General. The history of its origin and modification is certainly obscure. Little light is thrown on it by the following, which is an extract from an official letter from the Adjutant General's Office dated March 1, 1886, and signed J.C. Kelton, Assistant Adjutant General. Colonel Kelton was the officer on General Halleck's staff who had brought the intelligence of the condition of General Pope's command on the morning of September 2nd. It is therefore clear that the first draft of the order was made that morning, but whether before or after General Halleck had consulted with Mr. Stanton does not appear. Colonel Kelton says, It appears from the records that a draft of General Order No. 122 was written by Colonel J.C. Kelton, then Assistant Adjutant General, Headquarters of the Army, September 2, 1862, with request that Colonel E.D. Townsend number and issue the same and have it published in the Star. The general order was prepared accordingly by Colonel E.D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General, and having been submitted to General Halleck, was the same day returned by Colonel Kelton to Colonel Townsend, amended as it now stands. Whether McClellan, when he received Halleck's message forbidding him to go beyond the fortifications, recognized an intent to interfere between him and the President's unlimited trust, we cannot know. He obeyed the instruction. But when, in the afternoon at Upton's Hill, the farthest out fortification, he met Pope and McDowell leading the retreat into Washington, and heard the sound of artillery firing on the Army of the Potomac, abandoned to their fate without a commander, he left the fortifications and the orders of General Halleck behind him, and crossed country to the sound of the enemy's cannon. From that time he acted on his own judgment, as seemed to him best for the country, and, with a halter around his neck, led the army on the swiftest and most brilliant campaign in its history, to the victories of South Mountain and Antietam. The order of September 2nd remained in force thereafter. It perhaps explains some differences between the reports of officers in the field and those in Washington in regard to supplies, as all horses, ammunition, and supplies furnished to the troops in and around Washington could properly be charged and reported as furnished to McClellan's command. It is not probable that Mr. Lincoln's attention was ever called to the existence of this order, for it is a remarkable fact that, when he finally consented to displace McClellan, he gave the order that he be relieved from the command of the Army of the Potomac a command which General McClellan had not held by any authority since August 30th. And note. Note B. Captain William H. Powell of the 4th Regular Infantry, in a letter to the Century, dated Fort Omaha, Nebraska, March 12, 1885, thus describes this scene. Century, January 1886, page 473. About 4 o'clock on the next afternoon, from a prominent point, we descried in the distance the dome of the Capitol. We would be there at least in time to defend it. Darkness came upon us, and still we marched. As the night wore on, we found at each halt that it was more and more difficult to arouse the men from the sleep they would fall into apparently as soon as they touched the ground. During one of these halts, while Colonel Buchanan, the brigade commander, was resting a little off the road, some distance in advance of the head of the column, it being starlight, Two horsemen came down the road towards us. I thought I observed the familiar form, and turning to Colonel Buchanan said, Colonel, if I did not know that General McClellan had been relieved of all command, I should say that he was one of that party, adding immediately, I do really believe it is he. Nonsense, said the Colonel. What would General McClellan be doing out in this lonely place at this time of night without an escort? The two horsemen passed on to where the column of troops was lying, standing or sitting, as pleased each individual, and were lost in the shadowy gloom. But a few moments had elapsed, however, when Captain John D. Wilkins of the 3rd Infantry, now Colonel of the 5th, came running towards Colonel Buchanan, crying out, Colonel! Colonel! General McClellan is here! The enlisted men caught the sound. Whoever was awake aroused his neighbor. Eyes were rubbed, and those tired fellows as the news passed down the column, 
jumped to their feet and sent up such a hurrah as the army of the Potomac had never heard before. Shout upon shout went out into the stillness of the night, and as it was taken up along the road and repeated by regiment, brigade, division, and corps, we could hear the roar dying away in the distance. The effect of this man's presence upon the army of the Potomac, in sunshine or rain, in darkness or in daylight, in victory or defeat, was ever electrical, and too wonderful to make it worth while attempting to give a reason for it. Just two weeks from this time, this defeated army, under the leadership of McClellan, won the battles of South Mountain and Antietam, and had to march ten days out of the two weeks in order to do it. End of note. End of chapter 32. Chapter 33 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 33 Maryland Invaded. McClellan not to command in the field. Halleck declines advice about Harper's Ferry. The North in danger. McClellan assumes command. The halter around his neck. McClellan unrestrained, marching and reorganizing the army on the march. Harper's Ferry lost. McClellan relieves it, but Miles surrenders. Franklin's victory at Crampton's Gap. Next day I rode to the front of Alexandria and was engaged in rectifying the positions of the troops and giving orders necessary to secure the issuing of the necessary supplies, etc. On the 3rd, the enemy had disappeared from the front of Washington and the information which I received induced me to believe that he intended to cross the Upper Potomac into Maryland. This materially changed the aspect of affairs and enlarged the sphere of operations, for, in case of a crossing in force, an active campaign would be necessary to cover Baltimore, prevent the invasion of Pennsylvania, and clear Maryland. I therefore, on the 3rd, ordered the 2nd and 12th Corps to Tenallytown and the Ninth Corps to a point on the Seventh Street Road near Washington, and sent such cavalry as was available to the fords near Poolsville, to watch and impede the enemy in any attempt to cross in that vicinity. As soon as this was done, I reported the fact to General Halleck, who asked what general I had placed in command of those three corps. I replied that I had made no such detail, as I should take command in person if the enemy appeared in that direction. He then said that my command included only the defenses of Washington, and did not extend to any active column that might be moved out beyond the line of works, that no decision had yet been made as to the commander of the active army. He repeated the same thing on more than one occasion before the final advance to South Mountain and Antietam took place. Before I went to the front, Secretary Seward came to my quarters one evening and asked my opinion of the condition of affairs at Harper's Ferry, remarking that he was not at ease on the subject. Harper's Ferry was not at that time in any sense under my control, but I told Mr. Seward that I regarded the arrangements there as exceedingly dangerous, that in my opinion the proper course was to abandon the position and unite the garrison, 10,000 men about, to the main army of operations, for the reason that its presence at Harper's Ferry would not hinder the enemy from crossing the Potomac, that if we were unsuccessful in the approaching battle, Harper's Ferry would be of no use to us, and its garrison necessarily lost, that if we were successful we would immediately recover the post without any difficulty, while the addition of 10,000 men to the active army would be an important factor in ensuring success. I added that if it were determined to hold the position, the existing arrangements were all wrong, as it would be easy for the enemy to surround and capture the garrison, and that the garrison ought at least be withdrawn to the Maryland Heights, where they could resist attack until relieved. The secretary was much impressed by what I said, and asked me to accompany him to General Halleck and repeat my statement to him. I acquiesced, and we went together to General Halleck's quarters, where we found that he had retired for the night. But he received us in his bedroom, when, after a preliminary explanation by the secretary as to the interview being at his request, I said to Halleck precisely what I had stated to Mr. Seward. Halleck received my statement with ill-concealed contempt, said that everything was all right as it was, that my views were entirely erroneous, etc., and soon bowed us out, leaving matters at Harper's Ferry precisely as they were. On September 5th, the 2nd and 12th Corps were moved to Rockville, 
and Couch's division, the only one of the 4th Corps that had been brought from the peninsula, to Offutt's crossroads. On the 6th, the 1st and 9th Corps were ordered to Leesburg, the 6th Corps and Sykes Division of the 5th Corps to Tonali Town. On the 7th, the 6th Corps was advanced to Rockville, to which place my headquarters were moved on the same day. All the necessary arrangements for the defense of the city under the new condition of things had been made, and General Banks was left in command, having received his instructions from me. As the time had now arrived for the army to advance, and I had received no orders to take command of it, but had been expressly told that the assignment of a commander had not been decided, I determined to solve the question for myself. And when I moved out from Washington with my staff and personal escort, I left my card, with PPC written upon it, at the White House, War Office, and Secretary Seward's house, and went on my way. I was afterwards accused of assuming command without authority for nefarious purposes, and in fact fought the battles of South Mountain and Antietam with a halter around my neck, for if the Army of the Potomac had been defeated and I had survived, I would no doubt have been tried for assuming authority without orders, and in the state of feeling which so unjustly condemned the innocent and most meritorious General F.J. Porter, I would probably have been condemned to death. I was fully aware of the risk I ran but the path of duty was clear, and I tried to follow it. It was absolutely necessary that Lee's army should be met, and in the state of affairs I have briefly described, there could be no hesitation on my part as to doing it promptly. Very few in the Army of the Potomac doubted the favorable result of the next collision with the Confederate Army, but in other quarters not a little doubt prevailed, and the desire for very rapid movements so loudly expressed after the result was gained did not make itself heard during the movements preceding the battles. Quite the contrary was the case, as I was more than once cautioned that I was moving too rashly and exposing the capital to an attack from the Virginia side. As is well known, the result of General Pope's operations had not been favorable, and when I finally resumed command of the troops in and around Washington, they were weary, disheartened, their organization impaired, their clothing, ammunition, and supplies in a pitiable condition. The Army of the Potomac was thoroughly exhausted and depleted by its desperate fighting and severe marches in the unhealthy regions of the Chickahominy and afterwards during the Second Bull Run campaign. Its trains, administration services, and supplies were disorganized or lacking in consequence of the rapidity and manner of its removal from the peninsula, as well as from the nature of its operations during the Second Bull Run campaign. In the departure from the peninsula, Trains, supplies, cavalry, and artillery were often necessarily left at Fort Monroe and Yorktown for lack of vessels, as the important point was to move the infantry divisions as rapidly as possible to the support of General Pope. The divisions of the Army of Virginia were also exhausted and weakened, and their trains and supplies disorganized and deficient by the movements in which they had been engaged. Footnote. The Army of Virginia, which had been under the command of General Pope, ceased to exist on the 2nd of September, 1862, by force of circumstances, and so far as appears, without any order issued. The following correspondence is the only known record. Arlington, September 5th, 1205 p.m. Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief. I have just received an order from General McClellan to have my command in readiness to march within three days' rations, and further details of the march. What is my command, and where is it? McClellan has scattered it about in all directions, and has not informed me of the position of a single regiment. Am I to take the field, and under McClellan's orders? John Pope, Major General. Washington, D.C., September 5th, 1862. Major General Pope, Arlington. The armies of the Potomac and Virginia being consolidated, you will report for orders to the Secretary of War, H.W. Halleck, General-in-Chief. End footnote. Had General Lee remained in front of Washington, it would have been the part of wisdom to hold our own army quiet until its pressing wants were fully supplied, its organization restored, and its ranks filled with recruits, in brief, prepared for a campaign. But as the enemy maintained the offensive and crossed the Upper Potomac to threaten or invade Pennsylvania, it became necessary to meet him at any cost, notwithstanding the condition of the troops, to put a stop to the invasion, save Baltimore and Washington, and throw him back across the Potomac. Nothing but sheer necessity justified the advance of the Army of the Potomac to South Mountain and Antietam in its then condition, and it is to the eternal honor of the brave men who composed it that under such adverse circumstances they gained those victories, 
for the work of supply and reorganization was continued as best we might while on the march and after the close of the battles so much remained to be done to place the army in condition for a campaign that the delay which ensued was absolutely unavoidable and the army could not have entered upon a new campaign one day earlier than it did the purpose of advancing from washington was simply to meet the necessities of the moment by frustrating lee's invasion of the northern states and when that was accomplished to push with the utmost rapidity the work of reorganization and supply so that a new campaign might be promptly inaugurated with the army in condition to prosecute it to a successful termination without intermission the advance from washington was covered by the cavalry under general pleasanton pushed as far to the front as possible and soon in constant contact with the enemy's cavalry with whom several well-conducted and successful affairs occurred partly in order to move men freely and rapidly partly in consequence of the lack of accurate information as to the exact position and intention of lee's army the troops advanced by three main roads that near the potomac by off its crossroads and the mouth of the seneca that by rockville to frederick and that by brookville and urbana to new market we were then in condition to act according to the development of the enemy's plans and to concentrate rapidly in any position if lee threatened our left flank by moving down the river road or by crossing the potomac at any of the forks from coon's ferry upward there were enough troops on the river road to hold him in check until the rest of the army could move over to support them if lee took up a position behind the seneca near frederick the whole army could be rapidly concentrated in that direction to attack him in force if he moved upon baltimore the entire army could rapidly be thrown in his rear and his retreat cut off if he moved by gettysburg or chambersburg upon york or carlisle we were equally in position to throw ourselves in his rear the first thing was to gain accurate information as to lee's movements and meanwhile to push the work of supply and reorganization as rapidly as possible general lee and i knew each other well in the days before the war we had served together in mexico and commanded against each other in the peninsula i had the highest respect for his ability as a commander and knew that he was not a general to be trifled with or carelessly afforded an opportunity of striking a fatal blow each of us naturally regarded his own army as the better but each entertained the highest respect for the endurance courage and fighting qualities of the opposing army and this feeling extended to the officers and men it was perfectly natural under these circumstances that both of us should exercise a certain amount of caution i in my endeavors to ascertain lee's strength position and intentions before i struck the final blow he to abstain from any extended movements of invasion and to hold his army well in hand until he could be satisfied as to the condition of the army of the potomac after its second bull run campaign and as to the intentions of its commander the right wing consisting of the first and ninth corps under the command of major general burnside moved on frederick the first corps via brookville cooksville and ridgeville and the ninth corps via damascus and new market the second and twelfth corps forming the center under the command of general sumner moved on frederick the former via clarksburg and urbana the twelfth corps on a lateral road between urbana and new market thus maintaining the communication with the right wing and covering the direct road from frederick to washington the sixth corps under the command of general franklin moved to buckystown via darnstown dawsonville and barnesville covering the road from the mouth of the monocacy to rockville and being in a position to connect with and support the center should it have been necessary as was supposed to force the line of the monocacy couch's division moved by the river road covering that approach watching the fords of the potomac and ultimately following and supporting the sixth corps the following extracts from telegrams received by me after my departure from washington will show how little was known there about the enemy's movements and the fears which were entertained for the safety of the capital on the ninth of september general halleck telegraphed to me as follows until we can get better advices about the numbers of the enemy at drainsville i think we must be very cautious about stripping too much the forts on the virginia side it may be the enemy's object to draw off the mass of our forces and then attempt to attack from the virginia side of the potomac think of this again on the eleventh of september general halleck telegraphed to me as follows why not order forward keys or sigil i think the main force of the enemy is in your front more troops can be spared from here this dispatch as published by the committee on the conduct of the war and furnished by the general-in-chief reads as follows why not order forward porter's corps or sigils 
If the main force of the enemy is in your front, more troops can be spared from here. I remark that the original dispatch, as received by me from the telegraph operator, is in the words quoted above. I think the main force of the enemy, etc. In accordance with the suggestion, I asked on the same day that all the troops that could be spared should at once be sent to reinforce me, but none came. On the 12th, I received the following telegram from His Excellency the President. Governor Curtin telegraphs me, I have advices that Jackson is crossing the Potomac at Williamsport, and probably the whole rebel army will be drawn from Maryland. The President adds, Receiving nothing from Harper's Ferry or Martinsburg today, and positive information from Wheeling that the line is cut, corroborates the idea that the enemy is recrossing the Potomac. Please do not let him get off without being hurt. On the 13th, General Halleck telegraphed as follows. Until you know more certainly the enemy's force south of the Potomac, you are wrong in thus uncovering the capital. I am of the opinion that the enemy will send a small column towards Pennsylvania to draw your forces in that direction, then suddenly move on Washington with the forces south of the Potomac and those he may cross over. Again on the 14th, General Halleck telegraphed me that scouts report a large force still on the Virginia side of the Potomac. If so, I fear you are exposing your left and rear. Again, as late as the 16th, after we had the most positive evidence that Lee's entire army was in front of us, I received the following from him. Yours of 7 a.m. is this moment received. As you give me no information in regard to the position of your forces, except that at Sharpsburg, of course I cannot advise. I think, however, you will find that the whole force of the enemy in your front has crossed the river. I fear now more than ever that they will recross at Harper's Ferry or below and turn your left, thus cutting you off from Washington. This has appeared to me to be a part of their plan, and hence my anxiety on the subject. A heavy rain might prevent it. The importance of moving with all due caution so as not to uncover the national capital until the enemy's position and plans were developed, was, I believe, fully appreciated by me. And as my troops extended from the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad to the Potomac, with the extreme left flank moving along that stream, and with strong pickets left in rear to watch and guard all the available fords, I did not regard my left or rear as in any degree exposed. But it appears from the foregoing telegrams that the general-in-chief was of a different opinion, and that my movements were, in his judgment, too precipitate, not only for the safety of Washington, but also for the security of my left and rear. The precise nature of these daily injunctions against a precipitate advance may now be perceived. The General-in-Chief, in his testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, says, In respect to General McClellan going too fast or too far from Washington, there can be found no such telegram from me to him. He has mistaken the meaning of the telegrams I sent him. I telegraphed him that he was going too far, not from Washington, but from the Potomac, leaving General Lee the opportunity to come down the Potomac and get between him and Washington. I thought General McClellan should keep more on the Potomac, and press forward his left rather than his right, so as the more readily to relieve Harper's Ferry. As I can find no telegram from the General-in-Chief recommending me to keep my left flank near the Potomac, I am compelled to believe that when he gave this testimony, he had forgotten the purport of the telegrams above quoted and had also ceased to remember the fact, well known to him at the time, that my left, from the time I left Washington, always rested on the Potomac, and that my center was continually in position to reinforce the left or right, as occasion might require. Had I advanced my left flank along the Potomac more rapidly than the other columns marched upon the roads to the right, I should have thrown that flank out of supporting distance of the other troops and greatly exposed it. And if I had marched the entire army in one column along the banks of the river, instead of upon five different parallel roads, the column, with its trains, would have extended about fifty miles, and the enemy might have defeated the advance before the rear could have reached the scene of action. Moreover, such a movement would have uncovered the communications with Baltimore and Washington on our right, and exposed our left and rear. I presume it will be admitted by every military man that it was necessary to move the army in such order that it could at any time be concentrated for battle, and I am of opinion that this object could not have been accomplished in any other way than the one employed. Any other disposition of our forces would have subjected them to defeat in detached fragments. On the 10th of September, I received from my scouts information which rendered it quite probable that General Lee's army was in the vicinity of Frederick but whether his intention was to move towards Baltimore or Pennsylvania was not then known. 
On the 11th, I ordered General Burnside to push a strong reconnaissance across the National Road and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad towards New Market, and, if he learned that the enemy had moved towards Hagerstown, to press on rapidly to Frederick, keeping his troops constantly ready to meet the enemy in force. A corresponding movement of all the troops in the center and on the left was ordered in the direction of Urbana and Poolsville. On the 12th, a portion of the right wing entered Frederick, after a brief skirmish at the outskirts of the city and in the streets. On the 13th, the main bodies of the right wing and center passed through Frederick. In the report of a military commission, of which Major General D. Hunter was president, which convened at Washington for the purpose of investigating the conduct of certain officers in connection with the surrender of Harper's Ferry, I find the following. Now, the commission has remarked freely on Colonel Miles, an old officer who has been killed in the service of his country, and it cannot, from any motives of delicacy, refrain from censuring those in high command when it thinks such censure deserved. The General-in-Chief has testified that General McClellan, after having received orders to repel the enemy invading the state of Maryland, marched only six miles per day, on an average, when pursuing this invading enemy. The General-in-Chief also testifies that, in his opinion, he could and should have relieved and protected Harper's Ferry, and in this opinion the Commission fully concur. But this Commission, in its investigation, never called upon me, nor upon any officer of my staff, nor, so far as I know, upon any officer of the Army of the Potomac able to give an intelligent statement of the movements of that army. But another paragraph in the same report makes testimony from such sources quite superfluous. It is as follows. By a reference to the evidence, it will be seen that at the very moment Colonel Ford abandoned Maryland Heights, his little army was in reality relieved by Generals Franklin and Sumner's Corps at Crampton's Gap, within several miles of his position. The Corps of Generals Franklin and Sumner were a part of the army which I, at that time, had the honor to command, and they were acting under my orders at Crampton's Gap and elsewhere. And if, as the commission states, Colonel Ford's little army was in reality relieved by those officers, it was relieved by me. I had, on the morning of the 10th, sent the following dispatch in relation to the command at Harper's Ferry to General Halleck. September 10th, 9.45 a.m., Colonel Miles is at or near Harper's Ferry, as I understand, with 9,000 troops. He can do nothing where he is, but could be of great service if ordered to join me. I suggest that he be ordered to join me by the most practicable route. To this I received the following reply from General Halleck. There is no way for Colonel Miles to join you at present. His only chance is to defend his works till you can open communication with him. It seems necessary, for a distinct understanding of this matter, to state that I was directed on the 12th to assume command of the garrison of Harper's Ferry as soon as I should open communications with that place, and that when I received this order, all communication from the direction in which I was approaching was cut off. Up to that time, however, Colonel Miles could, in my opinion, have marched his command into Pennsylvania by crossing the Potomac at Williamsport or above, and this opinion was confirmed by the fact that Colonel Davis marched the cavalry part of Colonel Miles' command from Harper's Ferry on the 14th, taking the main road to Hagerstown, and he encountered no enemy except a small picket near the mouth of the Antietam. Before I left Washington, and when there certainly could have been no enemy to prevent the withdrawal of the forces of Colonel Miles, I recommended to the proper authorities that the garrison of Harper's Ferry should be withdrawn via Hagerstown, to aid in covering the Cumberland Valley, or that, taking up the pontoon bridge and obstructing the railroad bridge, it should fall back to the Maryland Heights and there hold out to the last. In this position it ought to have maintained itself for many days. It was not deemed proper to adopt either of these suggestions, and when the matter was left to my discretion, it was too late for me to do anything but endeavor to relieve the garrison. I accordingly directed artillery to be fired by our advance at frequent intervals as a signal that relief was at hand. This was done, and, as I afterwards learned, the reports of the cannon were distinctly heard at Harper's Ferry. It was confidently expected that Colonel Miles would hold out until we had carried the mountain passes and were in condition to send a detachment to his relief. The left was therefore ordered to move through Crampton's Pass in front of Burkittsville, while the center and right marched upon Turner's Pass in front of Middletown. It may be asked by those who are not acquainted with the topography of the country in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, why Franklin, instead of marching his column over the circuitous road from Jefferson via Burkittsville and Brownsville, was not ordered to move along the direct turnpike to Knoxville, and thence up the river to Harper's Ferry. It was for the reason that I had received information that the enemy were anticipating our approach in that direction, 
and had established batteries on the south side of the Potomac, which commanded all the approaches to Knoxville. Moreover, the road from that point winds directly along the river bank at the foot of a precipitous mountain, where there was no opportunity of forming a line of battle, and where the enemy could have placed batteries on both sides of the river to enfilade our narrow approaching columns. The approach through Crampton's Pass, which debouches into Pleasant Valley at the rear of Maryland Heights, was the only one which afforded any reasonable prospect of carrying that formidable position. At the same time, the troops upon that road were in better relation to the main body of our forces. On the morning of the 14th, a verbal message reached me from Colonel Miles, which was the first authentic intelligence I had received as to the condition of things at Harper's Ferry. The messenger informed me that on the preceding afternoon, Maryland Heights had been abandoned by our troops after repelling an attack of the rebels, and that Colonel Miles' entire force was concentrated at Harper's Ferry, the Maryland, Loudoun, and Boulevard Heights having been abandoned by him and occupied by the enemy. The messenger also stated that there was no apparent reason for the abandonment of the Maryland Heights, and that Colonel Miles instructed him to say that he could hold out with certainty two days longer. I directed him to make his way back, if possible, with the information that I was approaching rapidly and felt confident I could relieve the place. On the same afternoon, I wrote the following letter to Colonel Miles and dispatched three copies by three different couriers on different routes. I did not, however, learn that any of these men succeeded in reaching Harper's Ferry. Middletown, September 14, 1862. Colonel, the army is rapidly concentrated here. We are now attacking the pass on the Hagerstown Road over the Blue Ridge. A column is about attacking the Burkittsville and Boonesboro Pass. You may count on our making every effort to relieve you. You may rely upon my speedily accomplishing that object. Hold out to the last extremity. If it is possible, reoccupy the Maryland Heights with your whole force. If you can do that, I will certainly be able to relieve you. As the Catoctin Valley is in our possession, you can safely cross the river at Berlin or its vicinity, so far as opposition on this side of the river is concerned. Hold out to the last. George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding, Colonel D. S. Miles. On the previous day, I had sent General Franklin the following instructions. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Frederick, September 13, 1862, 6.20 p.m. General, I have now full information as to the movements and intentions of the enemy. Jackson has crossed the Upper Potomac to capture the garrison at Martinsburg and cut off Miles' retreat towards the west. A division on the south side of the Potomac was to carry Loudon Heights and cut off his retreat in that direction. McClaws, with his own command and the division of R. H. Anderson, was to move by Boonesboro and Rohrersville to carry the Maryland Heights. The signal officers inform me that he is now in Pleasant Valley. The firing shows that Miles still holds out. Longstreet was to move to Boonesboro and there halt with the Reserve Corps. D. H. Hill to form the rear guard, Stewart's cavalry to bring up stragglers, etc. We have cleared out all the cavalry this side of the mountains and north of us. The last I heard from Pleasanton, he occupied Middletown after several sharp skirmishes. A division of Burnside's command started several hours ago to support him. The whole of Burnside's command, including Hooker's Corps, marched this evening and early tomorrow morning, followed by the Corps of Sumner and Banks, and Sykes' division upon Boonesboro to carry that position. Couch has been ordered to concentrate his division and join you as rapidly as possible. Without waiting for the whole of that division to join, you will move at daybreak in the morning by Jefferson and Burkittsville upon the road to Roarersville. I have reliable information that the mountain pass by this road is practicable for artillery and wagons. If this pass is not occupied by the enemy in force, seize it as soon as practicable and debouch upon Roarersville in order to cut off the retreat of or destroy McClaw's command. If you find this pass held by the enemy in large force, make all your dispositions for the attack and commence it about half an hour after you hear severe firing at the pass on the Hagerstown Pike, where the main body will attack. Having gained the pass, your duty will be first to cut off, destroy, or capture McClaw's command and relieve Colonel Miles. If you effect this, you will order him to join you at once with all his disposable troops, first destroying the bridges over the Potomac, if not already done, and leaving a sufficient garrison to prevent the enemy from passing the ford. You will then return by Roarsville on the direct road to Boonesboro, if the main column has not succeeded in its attack. If it has succeeded, take the road to Roarsville, to Sharpsburg, and Williamsport in order either to cut off the retreat of Hill and Longstreet towards the Potomac or prevent the repassage of Jackson. My general idea is to cut the enemy in two and beat him in detail. 
I believe I have sufficiently explained my intentions. I ask of you, at this important moment, all your intellect and the utmost activity that a general can exercise. George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding, Major General W. B. Franklin, Commanding Sixth Corps. Again, on the 14th, I sent him the following. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Frederick, September 14, 1862, 2 p.m. Your dispatch of 12.30 just received. Send back to hurry up couch. Mass your troops and carry Burkittsville at any cost. We shall have strong opposition at both passes. As fast as the troops come up, I will hold a reserve in readiness to support you. If you find the enemy in very great force at any of these passes, let me know at once, and amuse them as best you can so as to retain them there. In that event, I will probably throw the mass of the army on the pass in front of here. If I carry that, it will clear the way for you, and you must follow the enemy as rapidly as possible. George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. Major General Franklin. General Franklin pushed his corps rapidly forward towards Crampton's Pass, and at about 12 o'clock on the 14th arrived at Burkittsville, immediately in rear of which he found the enemy's infantry posted in force on both sides of the road, with artillery in strong positions to defend the approaches to the pass. Slocum's division was formed upon the right of the road leading through the gap, and Smith's upon the left. A line formed of Bartlett's and Torpert's brigades, supported by Newton, whose activity was conspicuous, advanced steadily upon the enemy at a charge on the right. The enemy were driven from their position at the base of the mountain, where they were protected by a stone wall, steadily forced back up the slope until they reached the position of their battery on the road, well up the mountain. There they made a stand. They were, however, driven back, retiring their artillery in echelon, until, after an action of three hours, the crest was gained, and the enemy hastily fled down the mountain on the other side. On the left of the road, Brooks and Irvin's brigades of Smith's division, formed for the protection of Slocum's flank, charged up the mountain in the same steady manner, driving the enemy before them until the crest was carried. Four hundred prisoners from seventeen different organizations, seven hundred stand of arms, one piece of artillery, and three colors were captured by our troops in this brilliant action. It was conducted by General Franklin in all its details. These details are given in a report of General Franklin, and due credit awarded to the gallant officers and men engaged. The loss in General Franklin's corps was 115 killed, 416 wounded, and two missing. The enemy's loss was about the same. The enemy's position was such that our artillery could not be used with any effect. The close of the action found General Franklin's advance in Pleasant Valley on the night of the 14th, within three and a half miles of the point on Maryland Heights, where he might, on the same night or on the morning of the 15th, have formed a junction with the garrison of Harper's Ferry, had it not been previously withdrawn from Maryland Heights, and within six miles of Harper's Ferry. On the night of the 14th, the following dispatch was sent to General Franklin. Bolivar, September 15th, 1 a.m. General. The commanding general directs that you occupy with your command the road from Roresville to Harper's Ferry, placing a sufficient force at Roresville to hold that position in case it should be attacked by the enemy from Boonesboro. Endeavor to open communication with Colonel Miles at Harper's Ferry, attacking and destroying such of the enemy as you may find in Pleasant Valley. Should you succeed in opening communication with Colonel Miles, direct him to join you with his whole command, with all the guns and public property he can carry with him. The remainder of the guns will be spiked or destroyed. The rest of the public property will also be destroyed. You will then proceed to Boonesboro, which place the commanding general intends to attack tomorrow, and join the main body of the army in that place. Should you find, however, that the enemy has retreated from Boonesboro towards Sharpsburg, you will endeavor to fall upon him and cut off his retreat. By command of Major General McClellan, George D. Ruggles, Colonel N.A.D.C. General Franklin. On the 15th, the following were received from General Franklin. At the foot of the mountain in Pleasant Valley, three miles from Rowersville, September 15th, 8.50 a.m. General, my command started at daylight this morning, and I am waiting to have it closed up here. General Couch arrived about 10 o'clock last night. I have ordered one of his brigades and one battery to Rowersville or to the strongest point in its vicinity. The enemy is drawn up in line of battle about two miles to our front, one brigade in sight. As soon as I am sure that Roarsville is occupied, I shall move forward to attack the enemy. This may be two hours from now. If Harper's Ferry is fallen, and the cessation of firing makes me fear that it has, it is my opinion that I should be strongly reinforced. W.B. Franklin, Major General Commanding 6th Corps, General G.B. McClellan. 
September 15th, 11 a.m. General, I have received your dispatch by Captain O'Keefe. The enemy is in large force in my front, in two lines of battle stretching across the valley and a large column of artillery and infantry on the right of the valley looking towards Harper's Ferry. They outnumber me two to one. It, of course, will not answer to pursue the enemy under these circumstances. I shall communicate with Burnside as soon as possible. In the meantime, I shall wait here until I learn what is the prospect of reinforcement. I have not the force to justify an attack on the force I see in front. I have had a very close view of it, and its position is very strong. Respectfully, W.B. Franklin, Major General. Major General G.B. McClellan, Commanding. Colonel Miles surrendered Harper's Ferry at 8 a.m. on the 15th, as the cessation of the firing indicated, and General Franklin was ordered to remain where he was to watch the large force in front of him and protect our left and rear until the night of the 16th, when he was ordered to join the main body of the army at Keatesville, after sending Couch's division to Maryland Heights. While the events which have just been described were taking place at Crampton's Gap, the troops in the center and right wing, which had united at Frederick on the 13th, were engaged in the contest for the possession of Turner's Gap. End of chapter 33. Chapter 34 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 34 Private Letters September 2nd to September 14th, 1862. September 2nd, 1230 p.m. I was surprised this morning when at breakfast by a visit from the President and Halleck in which the former expressed the opinion that the troubles now impending could be overcome better by me than anyone else. Pope is ordered to fall back upon Washington, and as he re-enters, everything is to come under my command again. A terrible and thankless task. Yet I will do my best, with God's blessing, to perform it. God knows that I need his help. I am too busy to write any more now. Pray that God will help me in the great task now imposed upon me. I assume it reluctantly, with a full knowledge of all its difficulties and of the immensity of the responsibility. I only consent to take it for my country's sake, and with a humble hope that God has called me to it. How I pray that he may support me. Don't be worried, my conscience is clear, and I trust in God. September 3rd, 11.30 a.m. I am now about to jump into the saddle, and will be off all day. I did not return from my ride last night until after midnight. I went out to meet the troops and place them in position. Colburn and I rode out several miles to the front. All is quiet today, and I think the capital is safe. Just as I was starting off yesterday to gather up the army, supposing that I would find it savagely followed up by the rebels, and that I might have dangerous work before me, I commenced the enclosed scrawl on a scrap of paper as a goodbye. Could not even finish it. It may amuse you now that the danger is over. Enclosure, September 2nd, 4 p.m. I am just about starting out to pick up the Army of the Potomac. Don't know whether I will get back, but can't resist saying one last word to you before I start. September 5th, 11 a.m. Again, I have been called upon to save the country. The case is desperate, but with God's help, I will try unselfishly to do my best, and if he wills it, accomplish the salvation of the nation. My men are true and will stand by me till the last. I still hope for success and will leave nothing undone to gain it. How weary I am of this struggle against adversity. But one thing sustains me, that is, my trust in God. I know that the interests at stake are so great as to justify his interference, not for me, but for the innocent thousands, millions rather, who have been plunged in misery by no fault of theirs. It is probable that our communications will be cut off in a day or two, but don't be worried. You may rest assured that I am doing all I can for my country, and that no shame shall rest upon you, willfully brought upon you by me. My hands are full, so is my heart. September 5th, 4 p.m. It makes my heart bleed to see the poor, shattered remnants of my noble Army of the Potomac, poor fellows, and to see how they love me even now. I hear them calling out to me as I ride among them, George, don't leave us again. They shan't take you away from us again, etc., etc. I can hardly restrain myself when I see how fearfully they are reduced in numbers, and realize 
how many of them lie unburied on the field of battle where their lives were uselessly sacrificed. It is the most terrible trial I ever experienced. Truly, God is trying me in the fire. Telegram, Washington, September 7th, 2.50 p.m. We are all well, and the entire army is now united, cheerful, and confident. You need not fear the result, for I believe that God will give us the victory. I leave here this afternoon to take command of the troops in the field. The feeling of the government towards me, I am sure, is kind and trusting. I hope, with God's blessing, to justify the great confidence they now repose in me, and will bury the past in oblivion. A victory now, and we will soon be together. I send short letter today. God bless and reward your trust in him, and all will be well. September 7th, 2.30 p.m., Sunday. I leave in a couple of hours to take command of the army in the field. I go to Rockville tonight and start out after the rebels tomorrow. I shall have nearly 100,000 men, old and new, and hope, with God's blessing, to gain a decisive victory. September 8th, camp near Rockville. You don't know what a task has been imposed upon me. I have been obliged to do the best I could with the broken and discouraged fragments of two armies defeated by no fault of mine. Nothing but a desire to do my duty could have induced me to accept the command under such circumstances. Not feeling at all sure that I could do anything, I felt that under the circumstances no one else could save the country, and I have not shrunk from the terrible task. McDowell's own men would have killed him had he made his appearance among them. Even his staff did not dare to go among his men. I can afford to forgive and forget him. I saw Pope and McDowell for a few moments at Upton's Hill, when I rode out to meet the troops and assume command. I have not seen them since. I hope never to lay eyes on them again. Between them, they are responsible for the lives of many of my best and bravest men. They have done all they could, unintentionally, I hope, to ruin and destroy the country. I can never forgive them that. Pope has been foolish enough to try to throw the blame of his defeat on the Army of the Potomac. He would have been wiser to have accepted his defeat without complaint. I will probably move some four or five miles further to the front tomorrow, as I have ordered the whole army forward. I expect to fight a great battle, and to do my best at it. I do not think secession will catch me very badly. Tuesday morning, 8.30. I hope to learn this morning something definite as to the movements of secession, to be enabled to regulate my own. I hardly expect to equal the genius of Mr. Pope, but I hope to waste fewer lives and to accomplish something more than lame defeat. I have ordered a general advance of a few miles today, which will bring us on the line of the Seneca, and near enough to secesh to find out what he is doing and take measures accordingly. I shall follow him wherever he goes and do my best to beat him. If I accomplish that, the campaign will be ended. 9.30. The fact is that commanding such an army as this, picked up after a defeat, is no very easy thing. It does take a great deal of time and infinite labor. In coming to Rockville, we arrived about midnight. Yesterday, we came out to this camp, which is about a half mile from the town. I am still uncertain whether I shall move headquarters today or on which road, as that depends on the information I receive as to the enemy. I probably won't go more than four or five miles in a central direction. If I can add the defeat of Secesh, I think I ought to be entitled to fall back into private life. September 9th, camp near Rockville, 5 p.m. I'm going out in a few minutes to ride over to the camp of the regulars, whom I have not been to see for a long time, and who welcomed me so cordially the other night, brave fellows that they are. It is hard to get accurate news from the front. The last reports from Pleasanton are that the enemy have 110,000 on this side of the river. I have not so many, so I must watch them closely and try to catch them in some mistake, which I hope to do. My people are mostly in front of here, some six to ten miles. Move forward today. They are, I think, well placed to be concentrated wherever it may be necessary, and I want now a little breathing time to get them rested and in good order for fighting. Most of them will do well now. A few days will confirm this still further, increase my cavalry force, and put me in a better condition generally. I think my present positions will check the advance into Pennsylvania and give me time to get some reinforcements that I need very much. I have this moment learned that, in addition to the force on this side of the river, the enemy has also a large force near Leesburg, so MCC has a difficult game to play, but will do his best and try to do his duty. 
September 11th, camp near Rockville. I have just time before starting to say goodbye. I am quite tired this morning, as I did not get back from a ride to Burnside's until 3 a.m. The night before, I was at the telegraph office, sending and receiving dispatches until the same hour. And how it will be tonight is more than I can tell. September 12th, 3 p.m., camp near Urbana. As our wagons are not yet up and won't be for a couple of hours, I avail myself of the advantages of the situation to scrawl a few lines to you. We are traveling now through one of the most lovely regions I have ever seen, quite broken with lovely valleys in all directions, and some fine mountains in the distance. From all I can gather, Secesh is skedaddling, and I don't think I can catch him unless he is really moving into Pennsylvania. In that case, I shall catch him before he has made much headway towards the interior. I am beginning to think he is making off to get out of the scrape by recrossing the river at Williamsport, in which case my only chance of bagging him will be to cross lower down and cut into his communications near Winchester. He evidently don't want to fight me for some reason or other. I have never injured blank, therefore I am not called upon to make any advances to him, as the professor seems to think I ought. As for ever having any friendly relation with him, it is simply absurd. 7.30 p.m., my tent has been pitched some time. I have given all the orders necessary for tomorrow, and they have all gone to the various camps. I believe that I have done all in my power, and that the arrangement of the troops is good. I learned an hour or two ago, through the signal, that our troops were entering Frederick. We certainly ought to be there in respectable force by this time. My only apprehension now is that Secesh will arrange to get back across the Potomac at Williamsport before I can catch him. If he goes to Pennsylvania, I think I must overhaul him before long and give him a good lesson. If he does go to Pennsylvania, I feel quite confident that I can so arrange things that the chances will all be that he will never return. But I presume he is smart enough to know that and to act accordingly. Interrupted here by the news that we really have Frederick, Burnside, and Pleasanton both there. The next trouble is to save the garrison of Harper's Ferry, which is, I fear, in danger of being captured by the rebels. They were not placed under my orders until this afternoon, although before I left Washington I strongly urged that they should be withdrawn at once, as I feared they would be captured. But other counsels prevailed, and I am rather anxious as to the result. If they are not taken by this time, I think I can save them. At all events, nothing in my power shall be left undone to accomplish this result. I feel sure of one thing now, and that is that my men will fight well. The moment I hear that Harper's Ferry is safe, I shall feel quite sure of the result. The people cheered the troops tremendously when they entered Frederick. I have thus far found the Union sentiment much stronger in this region than I had expected. People are disposed to be very kind and polite to me, invite me into their houses, offer me dinner and various other acts of kindness that are quite unknown in the peninsula. September 14th, Frederick, A.M. I have only time to say good morning this bright sunny Sunday and then start to the front to try to relieve Harper's Ferry which is sorely pressed by Secesh. It is probable that we shall have a serious engagement today, and perhaps a general battle. If we have one at all during this operation, it ought to be today or tomorrow. I feel as reasonably confident of success as anyone well can who trusts in a higher power and does not know what its decision will be. I can't describe to you for want of time the enthusiastic reception we met with yesterday at Frederick. I was nearly overwhelmed and pulled to pieces. I enclose with this a little flag that some enthusiastic lady thrust into or upon Dan's bridle. As to flowers, they came in crowds. In truth, I was seldom more affected than by the scenes I saw yesterday and the reception I met with. It would have gratified you very much. End of chapter 34、Chapter、35 of McClellan's Own Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. Chapter 35. Entering Frederick. The Lost Dispatch. Advance. The Battle of South Mountain. General Scott hails McClellan. In riding into Frederick, I passed through Sumner's Corps, which I had not seen for some time. The men and officers were so enthusiastic as to show that they had lost none of their old feeling. During the march, from Washington up, 
I was much with the regulars, generally encamping with them. I never can forget their constant enthusiasm. Even when I passed through them several times a day on the march, they would jump up, if at a rest, and begin cheering in a way that regulars are not wont to do. Poor fellows. Our reception at Frederick was wonderful. Men, women, and children crowded around us, weeping, shouting, and praying. They clung around old Dan's neck and almost suffocated the old fellow, decking him out with flags. The houses were all decorated with flags, and it was a general scene of joy. The secession expedition had been an entire failure in that quarter. They received no recruits of the slightest consequence, and no free will offerings of any kind. It was soon ascertained that the main body of the enemy's forces had marched out of the city on the two previous days, taking the roads to Boonesboro and Harper's Ferry, thereby rendering it necessary to force the passes through the Catoctin and South Mountain ridges, and gain possession of Boonesboro and Rowersville before any relief could be extended to Colonel Miles at Harper's Ferry. On the 13th, an order fell into my hands, issued by General Lee, which fully disclosed his plans, and I immediately gave order for a rapid and vigorous forward movement. The following is a copy of the order referred to. Headquarters, Army of Northern Virginia, September 9, 1862. Special Orders, Number 191. The Army will resume its march tomorrow, taking the Hagerstown Road. General Jackson's command will form the advance, and after passing Middletown, with such portion as he may select, will take the route towards Sharpsburg, cross the Potomac at the most convenient point, and by Friday night take possession of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, capture such of the enemy as may be at Martinsburg, and intercept such as may attempt to escape from Harper's Ferry. General Longstreet's command will pursue the same road as far as Boonesboro, where it will halt with the reserve, supply, and baggage trains of the Army. General McClaws, with his own division and that of General R. H. Anderson, will follow General Longstreet. On reaching Middletown, he will take the route to Harper's Ferry, and by Friday morning possess himself of the Maryland Heights and endeavor to capture the enemy at Harper's Ferry and vicinity. General Walker, with his division, after accomplishing the object in which he is now engaged, will cross the Potomac at Cheeks Ford, ascend its right bank to Lovettsville, take possession of Loudon Heights, if practicable, by Friday morning, Keys Ford on his left, and the road between the end of the mountain and the Potomac on his right. He will, as far as practicable, cooperate with General McClaws and General Jackson in intercepting the retreat of the enemy. General D.H. Hill's division will form the rear guard of the army, pursuing the road taken by the main body. The reserve artillery, ordnance, and supply trains, etc., will precede General Hill. General Stewart will detach a squadron of cavalry to accompany the commands of Generals Longstreet, Jackson, and McClaws, and with the main body of the cavalry will cover the route of the army and bring up all stragglers that may have been left behind. The commands of Generals Jackson, McClaws, and Walker, after accomplishing the objects for which they have been detached, will join the main body of the army at Boonesboro or Hagerstown. Each regiment on the march will habitually carry its axes in the regimental ordnance wagons, for use of the men at their encampments, to procure wood, etc. By command of General R. E. Lee, R. H. Chilton, Assistant Adjutant General, Major General D. H. Hill, Commanding Division. On the morning of the 13th, General Pleasanton was ordered to send Reynolds' brigade and a section of artillery in the direction of Gettysburg, and Rush's regiment towards Jefferson to communicate with Franklin, to whom the 6th U.S. Cavalry and a section of artillery had previously been sent and to proceed with the remainder of his force in the direction of Middletown in pursuit of the enemy. After skirmishing with the enemy all the morning and driving them from several strong positions, he reached Turner's Gap of the South Mountain in the afternoon, and found the enemy in force and apparently determined to defend the pass. He sent back for infantry to General Burnside, who had been directed to support him, and proceeded to make a reconnaissance of the position. The South Mountain is, at this point, about 1,000 feet in height and its general direction is from northeast to southwest. The National Road from Frederick to Hagerstown crosses it nearly at right angles through Turner's Gap, a depression which is some 400 feet in depth. The mountain on the north side of the turnpike is divided into two crests or ridges by a narrow valley, which, though deep at the pass, becomes a slight depression at about a mile to the north. There are two country roads, one to the right of the turnpike and the other to the left, which give access to the crests overlooking the main road. 
The one on the left, called the Old Sharpsburg Road, is nearly parallel to, and about half a mile distant from, the turnpike, until it reaches the crest of the mountain when it bends off to the left. The other road, called the Old Hagerstown Road, passes up a ravine in the mountains about a mile from the turnpike, and bending to the left over and along the first crest, enters the turnpike at the mountain house near the summit of the pass. On the night of the 13th, the positions of the different corps were as follows. Reno's corps at Middletown, except Rodman's division at Frederick. Hooker's corps on the Monocacy, two miles from Frederick. Sumner's corps near Frederick. Banks corps near Frederick. Sykes' division near Frederick. Franklin's corps at Bucky's Town. Couch's division at Licksville. The orders from headquarters for the march on the 14th were as follows. 13th, 11.30 p.m., Hooker to march at daylight to Middletown. 13th, 11.30 p.m., Sykes to move at 6 a.m. after Hooker on the Middletown and Hagerstown Road. 14th, 1 a.m., artillery reserve to follow Sykes closely. 13th, 8.45 p.m., Turner to move at 7 a.m. 14th, 9 a.m., Sumner ordered to take the Shookstown Road to Middletown. Footnote. By letter dated Boston, May 19, 1884, General F.A. Walker called the attention of General McClellan to a statement made by the Comte de Paris in his History of the Civil War in America, attributing delay in the advance from Frederick to General Sumner in the Second Corps. The following reply, which I find among the papers relating to South Mountain, indicates General McClellan's intention to embody its substance in his narrative when he should reach this point in his review. 32 Washington Square, New York, May 21, 1884. My dear sir, yours of the 19th has just reached me. My attention was never called to this point in question. Like yourself, I am fully satisfied as to the candor and honesty of the Comte de Paris, but his work is not free from unintentional errors, of which this is an example. My report shows that at 8.45 p.m. of the 13th, the 2nd Corps was ordered to move at 7 a.m. on the 14th by the direct road to Middletown, following Sykes at an hour's interval. Hooker did not move as promptly as ordered, and this delayed Sykes and Sumner. Therefore, at 9 a.m., I ordered Sumner to take the more circuitous road by Shookstown, that his march might be free from encumbrance. The Second Corps made its march and arrived on the field as rapidly as circumstances permitted. I was never dissatisfied with this march of the Second Corps, and never criticized it to anyone. I can imagine the Second Corps and its brave old commander slow in getting out of a fight, but they never showed any hesitation or tardiness in getting into battle. The promptness and energy with which Sumner moved from Grapevine Bridge to the Field of Fair Oaks is simply one example of the manner in which that Corps always acted while under my command. You may rest assured that no member of the Second Corps has its honor more at heart or is more proud of its uniformly admirable conduct, whether on the march or in battle, than is the commander under whom it first served. In my account of Antietam, I will take care to correct the error of the Comte. And am always your friend, George B. McClellan, General F.A. Walker. End footnote. 13th, 645 p.m., Couch ordered to move to Jefferson with his whole division. On the 14th, General Pleasanton continued his reconnaissance. Gibson's battery, and afterwards Benjamin's battery, of Reno's corps, were placed on high ground to the left of the turnpike, and obtained a direct fire on the enemy's position in the gap. General Cox's division, which had been ordered up to support General Pleasanton, left its bivouac near Middletown at 6 a.m. The 1st Brigade reached the scene of action about 9 a.m. and was sent up the old Sharpsburg Road by General Pleasanton to feel the enemy and ascertain if he held the crest on that side in strong force. This was soon found to be the case, and General Cox, having arrived with the other brigade, and information having been received from General Reno that the column would be supported by the whole corps, the division was ordered to assault the position. Two 20-pounder Parrots of Simmons' battery and two sections of McMullen's battery were left in the rear in position near the turnpike, where they did good service during the day against the enemy's batteries in the gap. Scammon's brigade was deployed and, well covered by skirmishers, moved up the slope to the left of the road with the object of turning the enemy's right if possible. It succeeded in gaining the crest and establishing itself there in spite of the vigorous efforts of the enemy, who was posted behind stone walls and in the edges of timber, and the fire of a battery which poured in canister and case shot on the regiment on the right of the brigade. Colonel Crook's brigade marched in columns at supporting distance. 
A section of McMullen's battery, under Lieutenant Croom, killed while serving one of his guns, was moved up with great difficulty, and opened with canister at very short range on the enemy's infantry, by whom, after having done considerable execution, it was soon silenced and forced to withdraw. One regiment of Crook's brigade was now deployed on Scammon's left, and the other two in his rear, and they several times entered the first line and relieved the regiments in front of them when hard-pressed. A section of Sumner's battery was brought up and placed in the open space in the woods, where it did good service during the rest of the day. The enemy several times attempted to retake the crest, advancing with boldness, but were each time repulsed. They then withdrew their battery to a point more to the right and formed columns on both our flanks. It was now about noon, and a lull occurred in the contest which lasted about two hours, during which the rest of the corps was coming up. General Wilcox's division was the first to arrive. When he reached the base of the mountain, General Cox advised him to consult General Pleasanton as to a position. The latter indicated that on the right, afterwards taken up by General Hooker. General Wilcox was in the act of moving to occupy this ground when he received an order from General Reno to move up the old Sharpsburg Road and take a position to its right overlooking the turnpike. Two regiments were detached to support General Cox at his request. One section of Cook's battery was placed in position near the turn of the road, on the crest, and opened fire on the enemy's batteries across the gap. The division was proceeding to deploy to the right of the road when the enemy suddenly opened at 150 yards with a battery which enfiladed the road at this point, drove off Cook's cannoneers with their limbers, and caused a temporary panic in which the guns were nearly lost. But the 79th New York and 17th Michigan promptly rallied, changed front under a heavy fire, and moved out to protect the guns with which Captain Cook had remained. Order was soon restored, and the division formed in line on the right of Cox and was kept concealed as much as possible under the hillside until the whole line advanced. It was exposed not only to the fire of the battery in front, but also to that of the batteries on the other side of the turnpike, and lost heavily. Shortly before this time, Generals Burnside and Reno arrived at the base of the mountain, and the former directed the latter to move up the divisions of Generals Sturgis and Rodman to the crest held by Cox and Wilcox, and to move upon the enemy's position with his whole force as soon as he was informed that General Hooker, who had just been directed to attack on the right, was well advanced up the mountain. General Reno then went to the front and assumed the direction of affairs, the positions having been explained to him by General Pleasanton. Shortly before this time, I arrived at the point occupied by General Burnside, and my headquarters were located there until the conclusion of the action. General Sturgis had left his camp at 1 p.m. and reached the scene of action about 3.30 p.m. Clark's battery of his division was sent to assist Cox's left by order of General Reno, and two regiments, 2nd Maryland and 6th New Hampshire, were detached by General Reno and sent forward a short distance on the left of the turnpike. His division was formed in rear of Wilcox's, and Rodman's division was divided, Colonel Fairchild's brigade being placed on the extreme left, and Colonel Harlan's, under General Rodman's personal supervision, on the right. My order to move the whole line forward and take or silence the enemy's batteries in front was executed with enthusiasm. The enemy made a desperate resistance, charging our advancing lines with fierceness, but they were everywhere routed and fled. Our chief loss was in Wilcox's division. The enemy's battery was found to be across a gorge and beyond the reach of our infantry, but its position was made untenable, and it was hastily removed and not again put in position near us. But the batteries across the gap still kept up a fire of shot and shell. General Wilcox praises very highly the conduct of the 17th Michigan in this advance, a regiment which had been organized scarcely a month, but which charged the advancing enemy in flank in a manner worthy of veteran troops and also that of the 45th Pennsylvania, which bravely met them in front. Cook's battery now reopened fire. Sturgis's division was moved to the front of Wilcox's, occupying the new ground gained on the further side of the slope, and his artillery opened on the batteries across the gap. The enemy made an effort to turn our left about dark, but were repulsed by Fairchild's brigade and Clark's battery. At about 7 o'clock, the enemy made another effort to regain the lost ground, attacking along Sturgis's front and part of Cox's, a lively fire was kept up until nearly nine o'clock, several charges being made by the enemy and repulsed with slaughter, and we finally occupied the highest part of the mountain. General Reno was killed just before sunset while making a reconnaissance to the front, and the command of the corps devolved upon General Cox. In General Reno, the nation lost one of its best general officers. He was a skillful soldier, 
a brave and honest man. There was no firing after ten o'clock, and the troops slept on their arms, ready to renew the fight at daybreak. But the enemy quietly retired from our front during the night, abandoning their wounded and leaving their dead in large numbers scattered over the field. While these operations were progressing on the left of the main column, the right, under General Hooker, was actively engaged. His corps left the Monocacy early in the morning, and its advance reached the Catoctin Creek about 1 p.m. General Hooker then went forward to examine the ground. At about 1 o'clock, General Meade's division was ordered to make a diversion in favor of Reno. The following is the order sent. September 14th, 1 p.m. General. General Reno requests that a division of yours may move up on the right north of the main road. General McClellan desires you to comply with this request, holding your whole corps in readiness to support the movement and taking charge of it yourself. Sumner's and Banks' corps have commenced arriving. Let General McClellan be informed as soon as you commence your movement. George D. Ruggles, Colonel, Assistant Adjutant General, and Aide-de-Camp, Major General Hooker. Meade's division left Catoctin Creek about 2 o'clock, and turned off to the right from the main road on the old Hagerstown Road to Mount Tabor Church, where General Hooker was, and deployed a short distance in advance, its right resting about one and a half miles from the turnpike. The enemy fired a few shots from a battery on the mountainside, but did no considerable damage. Cooper's Battery B, 1st Pennsylvania Artillery, was placed in position on high ground at about three and a half o'clock, and fired at the enemy on the slope, but soon ceased by order of General Hooker, and the position of our lines prevented any further use of artillery by us on this part of the field. The 1st Massachusetts Cavalry was sent up the valley to the right to observe the movements, if any, of the enemy in that direction, and one regiment of Meade's division was posted to watch a road coming in the same direction. The other divisions were deployed as they came up, General Hatches on the left, and General Ricketts, which arrived at 5 p.m. in the rear. General Gibbon's brigade was detached from Hatch's division by General Burnside for the purpose of making a demonstration on the enemy's center, up the main road, as soon as the movements on the right and left had sufficiently progressed. The 1st Pennsylvania Rifles of General Seymour's brigade were sent forward as skirmishers to feel the enemy, and it was found that he was in force. Meade was then directed to advance his division to the right of the road so as to outflank them, if possible, and then to move forward and attack, while Hatch was directed to take with his division the crest on the left of the old Hagerstown Road, Ricketts' division being held in reserve. Seymour's brigade was sent up to the top of the slope on the right of the ravine through which the road runs, and then moved along the summit parallel to the road, while Colonel Gallagher's and Colonel Magleton's brigades moved in the same direction along the slope and in the ravine. The ground was of the most difficult character for the movement of troops, the hillside being very steep and rocky, and obstructed by stone walls and timber. The enemy was very soon encountered, and in a short time the action became general along the whole front of the division. The line advanced steadily up the mountainside, where the enemy was posted behind trees and rocks, from which he was gradually dislodged. During this advance, Colonel Gallagher, commanding 3rd Brigade, was severely wounded, and the command devolved upon Lieutenant Colonel Robert Anderson. General Meade, having reason to believe that the enemy was attempting to outflank him on his right, applied to General Hooker for reinforcements. General Duryea's brigade of Ricketts Division was ordered up, but it did not arrive until the close of the action. It was advanced upon Seymour's left, but only one regiment could open fire before the enemy retired and darkness intervened. General Meade speaks highly of General Seymour's skill in handling his brigade on the extreme right, securing by his maneuvers the great object of the movement, the outflanking of the enemy. While General Meade was gallantly driving the enemy on the right, General Hatch's division was engaged in a severe contest for the possession of the crest on the left of the ravine. It moved up the mountain in the following order. Two regiments of General Patrick's brigade deployed as skirmishers, with the other two regiments of the same brigade supporting them. Colonel Phelps' brigade in line of battalions in mass at deploying distance. General Doubleday's brigade in the same order bringing up the rear. The 21st New York, having gone straight up the slope instead of around to the right as directed, the 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters was sent out in its place. Phelps and Doubleday's brigades were deployed in turn as they reached the woods, which began about half up the mountain. General Patrick, with his skirmishers, soon drew the fire of the enemy and found him strongly posted behind a fence which bounded the cleared space on the top of the ridge having on his front the woods through which our line was advancing, and in his rear a cornfield full of rocky ledges, which afforded good cover to fall back to if dislodged. Phelps' brigade gallantly advanced under a hot fire to close quarters. 
and after 10 or 15 minutes of heavy firing on both sides, in which General Hatch was wounded while urging on his men, the fence was carried by a charge, and our line advanced a few yards beyond it, somewhat sheltered by the slope of the hill. Doubleday's brigade, now under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Hoffman, Colonel Wainwright having been wounded, relieved Phelps, and continued firing for an hour and a half. The enemy, behind ledges of rocks some thirty or forty paces in our front, made a stubborn resistance in attempting to charge on the least cessation of our fire. About dusk, Colonel Christian's brigade of Ricketts' division came up and relieved Doubleday's brigade, which fell back into line behind Phelps. Christian's brigade continued the action for thirty or forty minutes. When the enemy retired, after having made an attempt to flank us on the left, which was repulsed by the 75th New York and 7th Indiana. The remaining brigade of Ricketts' division, General Hartstuff's, was moved up in the center and connected Meade's left with Doubleday's right. We now had possession of the summit of the first ridge, which commanded the turnpike on both sides of the mountain, and the troops were ordered to hold their positions until further orders and slept on their arms. Late in the afternoon, General Gibbon, with his brigade and one section of Gibbon's battery, B, 4th Artillery, was ordered to move up the main road on the enemy center. He advanced a regiment on each side of the road, preceded by skirmishers, and followed by the other two regiments in double column. The artillery moving on the road until within range of the enemy's guns, which were firing on the column from the gorge. The brigade advanced steadily, driving the enemy from his positions in the woods and behind stone walls, until they reached a point well up towards the top of the pass, when the enemy, having been reinforced by three regiments, opened a heavy fire on the front and on both flanks. The fight continued until nine o'clock, the enemy being entirely repulsed, and the brigade, after having suffered severely and having expended all its ammunition, including even the cartridges of the dead and wounded, continued to hold the ground it had so gallantly won until twelve o'clock, when it was relieved by General Gorman's brigade of Sedgwick's division, Sumner's corps, except the 6th Wisconsin, which remained on the field all night. General Gibbon, in this delicate movement, handled his brigade with as much precision and coolness as if upon parade, and the bravery of his troops could not be excelled. The 2nd Corps, Sumner's, and the 12th Corps, Williams, reached their final position shortly after dark. General Richardson's division was placed near Mount Tabor Church, in a position to support our right, if necessary. The 12th Corps and Sedgwick's division bivouacked around Bolivar, in a position to support our center and left. General Sykes' division of regulars and the artillery reserve halted for the night at Middletown. Thus, on the night of the 14th, the whole army was massed in the vicinity of the field of battle, in readiness to renew the action the next day or to move in pursuit of the enemy. At daylight, our skirmishers were advanced, and it was found that he had retreated during the night, leaving his dead on the field and his wounded uncared for. I had reached the front at Middletown about noon, or a little before noon, and while there received the messenger from Harper's Ferry by whom I sent the dispatch to General Miles before mentioned. Immediately afterwards, I rode forward to a point from which I could see the gap and the adjacent ground. About the time I started, Reno sent back a message desiring that a division might be sent to the rear of the pass. I sent the order to Hooker to move at once. Burnside had nothing to do with this. Marcy went with him and remained there most of the day. I rather think he really deserved most of the credit for directing the movement, but with his usual modesty, he would say little or nothing about it. I pushed up Sturgis to support Cox and hurried up Sumner to be ready as a reserve. Burnside never came as near the battle as my position. Yet it was his command that was in action. He spent the night in the same house that I did. In the course of the evening, when I had prepared the telegram to the president, announcing the result of the day, I showed it to Burnside before sending it off, and asked if it was satisfactory to him. He replied that it was altogether so. Long afterwards, it seems that he came to the conclusion that I did not give him sufficient credit, but he never said a word to me on the subject. On the next day, I had the honor to receive the following very kind dispatch from the President. War Department, Washington, September 15, 1862, 2.45 p.m. Your dispatch of today received. God bless you and all with you. Destroy the rebel army, if possible. A. Lincoln, to Major General McClellan. The following dispatch was also received on the 16th. West Point, 16th, 1862. Received Frederick, 16th, 1862, 10.40 a.m to Major General McClellan. Bravo, my dear General. Twice more, and it's done. Winfield Scott. End of chapter 35.
Chapter 36 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Menelakis. Chapter 36 Antietam. Pursuit from South Mountain. Position of the Enemy. The Battle. Burnside's Failure. His Contradictory Statements. Letters of Colonel Sackett. On the night of the Battle of South Mountain, orders were given to the Corps commanders to press forward their pickets at early dawn. This advance revealed the fact that the enemy had left his positions and an immediate pursuit was ordered. The cavalry under General Pleasanton and the three corps under Generals Sumner, Hooker, and Mansfield, the latter of whom had arrived that morning and assumed command of the 12th Williams Corps. By the National Turnpike and Boonesboro, the Corps of General Burnside and Porter, the latter command at that time consisting of but one weak division, Sykes, by the old Sharpsburg Road, and General Franklin to move into Pleasant Valley, occupy Roarsville by detachment, and endeavor to relieve Harper's Ferry. General Burnside and Porter, upon reaching the road from Boonesboro to Roarsville, were to reinforce Franklin or to move on Sharpsburg, according to circumstances. Franklin moved towards Brownsville and found there a force of the enemy, much superior in numbers to his own, drawn up in a strong position to receive him. At this time the cessation of firing at Harper's Ferry indicated the surrender of that place. The cavalry overtook the enemy's cavalry in Boonesboro, made a dashing charge, killing and wounding a number, and capturing 250 prisoners and two guns. General Richardson's division of the 2nd Corps, pressing the rear guard of the enemy with vigor, passed Boonesboro and Keatesville, and came upon the main body of the enemy, occupying in large force a strong position a few miles beyond the latter place. It had been hoped to engage the enemy on the 15th. Accordingly, instructions were given that if the enemy were overtaken on the march, they should be attacked at once. If found in heavy force and in position, the corps in advance should be placed in position for attack and await my arrival. Early in the morning I had directed Burnside to put his corps in motion upon the old Sharpsburg Road, but to wait with me for a time until more detailed news came from Franklin. About eight o'clock he begged me to let him go, saying that his corps had been some time in motion, and that if he delayed longer he would have difficulty in overtaking it. So I let him go. At about midday I rode to the point where Reno was killed the day before, and found that Burnside's troops, the Ninth Corps, had not stirred from its bivouac, and still blocked the road for the regular division. I sent for Burnside for an explanation, but he could not be found. He subsequently gave as an excuse the fatigued and hungry condition of his men. Headquarters, Army of Potomac, September 15, 1230 p.m. General Burnside. General McClellan desires you to let General Porter's go on past you if necessary. You will then push your own command on as rapidly as possible. The general also desires to know the reason for your delay in starting this morning. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, George D. Ruggles, Colonel and A.D.C. After seeing the ground where Reno fell and passing over Hooker's battleground of the previous day, I went rapidly to the front by the main road, being received by the troops as I passed them with the wildest enthusiasm. Near Keatesville, I met Sumner, who told me that the enemy were in position in strong force and took me to a height in front of Keatesville whence a view of the position could be obtained. We were accompanied by a numerous staff and escort, but no sooner had we shown ourselves on the hill than the enemy opened upon us with rifled guns, and as his firing was very good, the hill was soon cleared of all save Fitz John Porter and myself. I at once gave orders for the positions of the bivouacs, massing the army so that it could be handled as required. I ordered Burnside to the left. He grumbled that his troops were fatigued, but I started him off anyhow. The first rapid survey of the enemy's position inclined me to attack his left, but the day was far gone. He occupied a strong position on the heights, on the west side of Antietam Creek, displaying a large force of infantry and cavalry with numerous batteries of artillery, which opened on our columns as they appeared in sight on the Keatesville Road and Sharpsburg Turnpike, which fire was returned by Captain Tidball's Light Battery, 2nd U.S. Artillery, and Pettit's Battery, 1st New York Artillery. The division of General Richardson, following close on the heels of the retreating foe, halted and deployed near Antietam River, on the right of the Sharpsburg Road. General Sykes, leading on the division of regulars on the old Sharpsburg Road, 
came up and deployed to the left of General Richardson on the left of the road. Antietam Creek in this vicinity is crossed by four stone bridges, the upper one on the Keysville and Williamsport Road, the second on the Keysville and Sharpsburg Turnpike, some two and a half miles below, the third about a mile below the second on the Roarersville and Sharpsburg Road, and the fourth near the mouth of Antietam Creek on the road leading from Harper's Ferry to Sharpsburg, some three miles below the third. The stream is sluggish, with few and difficult fords. After a rapid examination of the position, I found that it was too late to attack that day, and at once directed the placing of the batteries in position in the center, and indicated the bivouacs for the different corps, massing them near and on both sides of the Sharpsburg Turnpike. The corps were not at all in their positions until the next morning after sunrise. On the morning of the 16th, it was discovered that the enemy had changed the position of his batteries, the masses of his troops, however, were still concealed behind the opposite heights. Their left and center were upon and in front of the Sharpsburg and Hagerstown turnpike, hidden by woods and irregularities of the ground, their extreme left resting upon a wooded eminence near the crossroads to the north of J. Miller's farm, their left resting upon the Potomac. Their line extended south, the right resting upon the hills to the south of Sharpsburg, near Snavely's farm. The bridge over the Antietam near this point was strongly covered by riflemen, protected by rifle pits, stone fences, etc., and enfiladed by artillery. The ground in front of this line consisted of undulating hills, their crests in turn commanded by others in their rear. Of all favorable points, the enemy's artillery was posted, and their reserves, hidden from view by the hills on which their line of battle was formed, could maneuver unobserved by our army and from the shortness of their line could rapidly reinforce any point threatened by our attack. Their position, stretching across the angle formed by the Potomac and Antietam, their flanks and rear protected by these streams, was one of the strongest to be found in this region of country, which is well adapted to defensive warfare. On the right, near Keatesville, on both sides of the Sharpsburg Turnpike, were Sumner's and Hooker's Corps. In advance, on the right of the Turnpike and near the Antietam River, General Richardson's division of General Sumner's Corps was posted. General Sykes' division of General Porter's Corps was on the left of the turnpike and in line with General Richardson, protecting the bridge number two over the Antietam. The left of the line, opposite to and some distance from bridge number three, was occupied by General Burnside's Corps. Before giving General Hooker his orders to make the movement which will presently be described, I rode to the left of the line to satisfy myself that the troops were properly posted there, to secure our left flank from any attack made along the left bank of the Antietam, as well as to enable us to carry bridge number three. I rode along the whole front, generally in front of our pickets, accompanied by Hunt, Duane, Colburn, and a couple of orderlies, and went considerably beyond our actual and eventual left. Our small party drew the enemy's fire frequently and developed the position of most of his batteries. I threw some of the regulars a little more to the left, and observed that our extreme left was not well placed to cover the position against any force approaching from Harper's Ferry by the left bank of the Antietam. Also that the ground near Burnside's Bridge was favorable for defense on our side, and that an attack across it would lead to favorable results. I therefore at once ordered Burnside to move his corps nearer the bridge, occupy the heights in rear, as well as to watch the approach from Harper's Ferry just spoken of. I gave this order at midday. It was near night before it was executed. I also instructed him to examine all the vicinity of the bridge as he would probably be ordered to attack there next morning. In front of General Sumner's and Hooker's Corps near Keatesville and on the ridge of the first line of hills overlooking the Antietam and between the Turnpike and Fry's House on the right of the road were placed Captains Taft's, Langner's, Von Kleiser's, and Lieutenant Weaver's batteries of 20-pounder Parrot guns. On the crest of the hill in the rear and right of bridge number three, Captain Weed's three-inch and Lieutenant Benjamin's 20-pounder batteries. General Franklin's Corps and General Couch's division held a position in Pleasant Valley in front of Brownsville, with a strong force of the enemy in their front. General Morell's division of Porter's Corps was en route from Boonesboro, and General Humphrey's division of new troops en route from Frederick, Maryland. About daylight on the 16th, the enemy opened a heavy fire of artillery on our guns in position, which was promptly returned. Their fire was silenced for the time, but it was frequently renewed during the day. It was afternoon before I could move the troops to their positions for attack. Being compelled to spend the morning 
in reconnoitering the new position taken up by the enemy, examining the ground, finding fords, clearing the approaches, and hurrying up the ammunition and supply trains, which had been delayed by the rapid march of the troops over the few practicable approaches from Frederick. These had been crowded by the masses of infantry, cavalry, and artillery pressing on with the hope of overtaking the enemy before he could form to resist an attack. Many of the troops were out of rations on the previous day, and a good deal of their ammunition had been expended in the severe action of the 14th. My plan for the impending general engagement was to attack the enemy's left with the corps of Hooker and Mansfield, supported by Sumner's, and if necessary by Franklin's and as soon as matters looked favorably there to move the corps of Burnside against the enemy's extreme right, upon the ridge running to the south and rear of Sharpsburg, and having carried their position, to press along the crest towards our right, and whenever either of these flank movements should be successful, to advance our center with all the forces then disposable. About 2 p.m., General Hooker, with his corps, consisting of Generals Ricketts, Meade's, and Doubleday's divisions, was ordered to cross the Antietam at a ford and at bridge number one, a short distance above, to attack and, if possible, turn the enemy's left. General Sumner was ordered to cross the corps of General Mansfield, the 12th, during the night and hold his own, the 2nd Corps, ready to cross early the next morning. On reaching the vicinity of the enemy's left, a sharp contest commenced with the Pennsylvania Reserves, the advance of General Hooker's corps near the house of D. Miller. The enemy was driven from the strip of woods where he was first met. The firing lasted until after dark, when General Hooker's corps rested on their arms on ground won from the enemy. When I returned to the right and found that Hooker's preparations were not yet complete, I went to hurry them in person. It was perhaps half past three to four o'clock before Hooker could commence crossing and get fairly in motion up the opposite slopes. I accompanied the movement at the head of the column until the top of the ridge was fairly gained, indicated the new direction to be taken, and then returned to headquarters, not to the camp, but to a house further in advance, Fry's house, where I passed the night. During the night, General Mansfield's corps, consisting of Generals Williams and Green's divisions, crossed the Antietam at the same ford and bridge that General Hooker's troops had passed, and bivouacked on the farm of J. Puffenberger, about a mile in rear of General Hooker's position. At daylight on the 17th, the action was commenced by the skirmishers of the Pennsylvania Reserves. The whole of General Hooker's corps was soon engaged, and drove the enemy from the open field in front of the first line of woods into a second line of woods beyond, which runs to the eastward of and nearly parallel to the Sharpsburg and Hagerstown turnpike. This contest was obstinate, and as the troops advanced, the opposition became more determined and the number of the enemy greater. General Hooker then ordered up the corps of General Mansfield, which moved promptly toward the scene of action. The 1st Division, General Williams, was deployed to the right on approaching the enemy, General Crawford's brigade on the right, its right resting on the Hagerstown Turnpike, on his left, General Gordon's brigade. The 2nd Division, General Green's, joining the left of Gordon's, extended as far as the burnt buildings to the north and east of the White Church on the Turnpike. During the deployment, that gallant veteran, General Mansfield, fell mortally wounded while examining the ground in front of his troops. General Hartsuff of Hooker's Corps was severely wounded while bravely pressing forward his troops and was taken from the field. The command of the 12th Corps fell upon General Williams. Five regiments of the 1st Division of this Corps were new troops. One brigade of the 2nd Division was sent to support General Doubleday. The 125th Pennsylvania Volunteers were pushed across the turnpike into the woods beyond J. Miller's house with orders to hold the position as long as possible. The line of battle of this corps was formed, and it became engaged about 7 a.m., the attack being opened by Knapp's, Pennsylvania, Cothran's, New York, and Hampton's, Pittsburgh, batteries. To meet this attack, the enemy had pushed a strong column of troops into the open fields in front of the turnpike, while he occupied the woods on the west of the turnpike in strong force. The woods, as was found by subsequent observation, were traversed by outcropping ledges of rock. Several hundred yards to the right and rear was a hill which commanded the debouch of the woods, and in the fields between was a long line of stone fences, continued by breastworks of rails, which covered the enemy's infantry from our musketry. The same woods formed a screen behind which his movements were concealed, and his batteries on the hill and the rifle works covered from the fire of our artillery in front. 
For about two hours the battle raged with varied success, the enemy endeavoring to drive our troops into the second line of wood, and ours in turn to get possession of the line in front. Our troops ultimately succeeded in forcing the enemy back into the woods near the turnpike. General Green, with his two brigades crossing into the woods to the left of the Dunker Church. During this conflict, General Crawford, commanding 1st Division after General Williams took command of the Corps, was wounded and left the field. General Green, being much exposed and applying for reinforcements, the 13th New Jersey, 27th Indiana, and 3rd Maryland were sent to his support with a section of Knapp's battery. At about 9 o'clock a.m., General Sedgwick's division of General Sumner's Corps arrived. Crossing the ford previously mentioned, this division marched in three columns to the support of the attack on the enemy's left. On nearing the scene of action, the columns were halted, faced to the front, and established by General Sumner in three parallel lines by brigade, facing toward the south and west. General Gorman's brigade in front, General Dana's second, and General Howard's third, with a distance between the lines of some 70 paces. The division was then put in motion and moved upon the field of battle, under fire from the enemy's concealed batteries on the hill beyond the roads. Passing diagonally to the front across the open space and to the front of the 1st Division of General Williams' Corps, this latter division withdrew. Entering the woods on the west of the turnpike and driving the enemy before them, the first line was met by a heavy fire of musketry and shell from the enemy's breastworks and the batteries on the hill commanding the exit from the woods. Meantime, a heavy column of the enemy had succeeded in crowding back the troops of General Green's division and appeared in rear of the left of Sedgwick's division. By command of General Sumner, General Howard faced the third line to the rear preparatory to a change of front to meet the column advancing on the left, but this line, now suffering from a destructive fire both in front and on its left, which was unable to return, gave way towards the right and rear in considerable confusion and was soon followed by the first and second lines. General Gorman's brigade and one regiment of General Dana's soon rallied and checked the advance of the enemy on the right. The second and third lines now formed on the left of General Gorman's brigade and poured a destructive fire upon the enemy. During General Sumner's attack, he ordered General Williams to support him. Brigadier General Gordon, with a portion of his brigade, moved forward, but when he reached the woods, the left of General Sedgwick's division had given way, and finding himself, as the smoke cleared up, opposed to the enemy in force with his small command, he withdrew to the rear of the batteries at the second line of woods. As General Gordon's troops unmasked our batteries on the left, they opened with canister. The batteries of Captain Cothran, 1st New York, and I, 1st Artillery, commanded by Lieutenant Woodruff, doing good service. Unable to withstand this deadly fire in front and the musketry fire from the right, the enemy again sought shelter in the woods and rocks beyond the turnpike. During this assault, Generals Sedgwick and Dana were seriously wounded and taken from the field. General Sedgwick, though twice wounded and faint from loss of blood, retained command of his division for more than an hour after his first wound, animating his command by his presence. About the time of General Sedgwick's advance, General Hooker, while urging on his command, was severely wounded in the foot and taken from the field, and General Meade was placed in command of his corps. General Howard assumed command after General Sedgwick retired. The repulse of the enemy offered opportunity to rearrange the lines and reorganize the commands on the right, now more or less in confusion. The batteries of the Pennsylvania Reserve on high ground near J. Poffenberger's house opened fire and checked several attempts of the enemy to establish batteries in front of our right to turn that flank and enfilade the lines. While the conflict was so obstinately raging on the right, General French was pushing his division against the enemy still further to the left. This division crossed the Antietam at the same ford as General Sedgwick, and immediately in his rear. Passing over the stream in three columns, the division marched about a mile from the ford, then, facing to the left, moved in three lines towards the enemy. General Max Weber's brigade in front, Colonel Dwight Morse's brigade of raw troops, undrilled and moving for the first time under fire, in the second, and General Kimball's brigade in the third. The division was first assailed by a fire of artillery, but steadily advanced, driving in the enemy skirmishers, and encountered the infantry in some force at the group of houses on Roulette's farm. General Weber's brigade gallantly advanced with an unwavering front and drove the enemy from their position about the houses. While General Weber was hotly engaged with the first line of the enemy, General French received orders from General Sumner, his corps commander, to push on with renewed vigor to make a diversion in favor of the attack on the right. 
leaving the new troops, who had been thrown into some confusion from their march through cornfields, over fences, etc., to form as a reserve, he ordered the brigade of General Kimball to the front, passing to the left of General Weber. The enemy was pressed back to near the crest of the hill, where he was encountered in greater strength posted in a sunken road, forming a natural rifle pit running in a northwesterly direction. In a cornfield in rear of this road were also strong bodies of the enemy. As the line reached the crest of the hill, a galling fire was opened on it from the sunken road and cornfield. Here a terrific fire of musketry burst from both lines, and the battle raged along the whole line with great slaughter. The enemy attempted to turn the left of the line, but were met by the 7th Virginia and 132nd Pennsylvania Volunteers and repulsed. Foiled in this, the enemy made a determined assault on the front, but were met by a charge from our lines which drove them back with severe loss, leaving in our hands some 300 prisoners and several stands of colors. The enemy, having been repulsed by the terrible execution of the batteries and the musketry fire on the extreme right, now attempted to assist the attack on General French's division by assailing him on his right and endeavoring to turn this flank. But this attack was met and checked by the 14th Indiana and 8th Ohio Volunteers, and by canister from Captain Tompkins Battery, 1st Rhode Island Artillery. Having been under an almost continuous fire for nearly four hours, and the ammunition nearly expended, this division now took position immediately below the crest of the heights on which they had so gallantly fought, the enemy making no attempt to regain their lost ground. On the left of General French, General Richardson's division was hotly engaged. Having crossed the Antietam about 9.30 a.m. at the ford crossed by the other divisions of Sumner's Corps, it moved on a line nearly parallel to the Antietam and formed in a ravine behind the high grounds overlooking Roulette's house. The second, Irish Brigade, commanded by General Marr, on the right, the third brigade, commanded by General Caldwell, on his left, and the brigade commanded by Colonel Brooks, 53rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, in support. As the division moved forward to take its position on the field, the enemy directed a fire of artillery against it, but owing to the irregularities of the ground, did but little damage. Marr's brigade, advancing steadily, soon became engaged with the enemy posted to the left and in front of Roulette's house. It continued to advance under a heavy fire nearly to the crest of the hill overlooking Piper's house, the enemy being posted in a continuation of the sunken road and cornfield before referred to. Here the brave Irish brigade opened upon the enemy a terrific musket fire. All of General Sumner's corps was now engaged. General Sedgwick on the right, General French in the center, and General Richardson on the left. The Irish brigade sustained its well-earned reputation. After suffering terribly in officers and men, and strewing the ground with their enemies as they drove them back, their ammunition nearly expended, and their commander, General Marr, disabled by the fall of his horse shot under him, this brigade was ordered to give place to General Caldwell's brigade, which advanced to a short distance in its rear. The lines were passed by the Irish brigade, breaking by company to the rear, and General Caldwell's by company to the front, as steadily as on drill. Colonel Brooks' brigade now became the second line. The ground over which Generals Richardson's and French's divisions were fighting was very irregular, intersected by numerous ravines, hills covered with growing corn, and closed by stone walls, behind which the enemy could advance unobserved upon any exposed point of our lines. Taking advantage of this, the enemy attempted to gain the right of Richardson's position in a cornfield near Roulette's house, where the division had become separated from that of General French's. A change of front by the 53rd New York and 2nd Delaware Volunteers of Colonel Brooks's Brigade under Colonel Frank, and the attack made by the 53rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, sent further to the right by Colonel Brooks to close this gap in the line, and the movement of the 132nd Pennsylvania and 7th Virginia Volunteers of General French's Division, before referred to, drove the enemy from the cornfield and restored the line. The brigade of General Caldwell, with determined gallantry, pushed the enemy back opposite the left and center of this division, but sheltered in the sunken road, they still held our forces on the right of Caldwell in check. Colonel Barlow, commanding the 61st and 64th New York regiments of Caldwell's brigade, seeing a favorable opportunity, advanced the regiments on the left, taking the line in the sunken road in flank, and compelled them to surrender, capturing over 300 prisoners and three stands of colors. 
the whole of the brigade with the 57th and 66th New York regiments of Colonel Brooks' brigade, who had moved these regiments into the first line, now advanced with gallantry, driving the enemy before them in confusion into the cornfield beyond the sunken road. The left of the division was now well advanced when the enemy, concealed by an intervening ridge, endeavored to turn its left and rear. Colonel Cross, 5th New Hampshire, by a change of front to the left and rear, brought his regiment facing the advancing line. Here a spirited contest arose to gain a commanding height, the two opposing forces moving parallel to each other, giving and receiving fire. The 5th, gaining the advantage, faced to the right and delivered its volley. The enemy staggered, but rallied and advanced desperately at a charge. Being reinforced by the 81st Pennsylvania, these regiments met the advance by a countercharge. The enemy fled, leaving many killed, wounded, and prisoners, and the colors of the 4th North Carolina in our hands. Another column of the enemy, advancing under shelter of a stone wall and cornfield, pressed down on the right of the division, but Colonel Barlow again advanced the 61st and 64th New York against these troops, and with the attack of Kimball's brigade on the right, drove them from this position. Our troops on the left of this part of the line, having driven the enemy far back, they, with reinforced numbers, made a determined attack directly in front. To meet this, Colonel Barlow brought his two regiments to their position in line, and drove the enemy through the cornfield into the orchard beyond, under a heavy fire of musketry, and a fire of canister from two pieces of artillery in the orchard, and a battery further to the right throwing shell and case shot. This advance gave us possession of Piper's house, the strong point contended for by the enemy at this part of the line, it being a defensible building several hundred yards in advance of the sunken road. The musketry fire at this point of the line now ceased. Holding Piper's house, General Richardson withdrew the line a little way to the crest of a hill, a more advantageous position. Up to this time the division was without artillery, and in the new position suffered severely from artillery fire which could not be replied to. A section of Robertson's horse battery, commanded by Lieutenant Vincent, 2nd Artillery, now arrived on the ground and did excellent service. Subsequently, a battery of brass guns, commanded by Captain Graham, 1st Artillery, arrived and was posted on the crest of the hill and soon silenced the two guns in the orchard. A heavy fire soon ensued between the battery further to the right and our own. Captain Graham's battery was bravely and skillfully served, but unable to reach the enemy, who had rifled guns of greater range than our smoothbores, retired by order of General Richardson to save it from useless sacrifice of men and horses. The brave general was himself mortally wounded while personally directing its fire. General Hancock was placed in command of the division after the fall of General Richardson. General Mars' brigade, now commanded by Colonel Burke of the 63rd New York, having refilled their cartridge boxes, was again ordered forward, and took position in the center of the line. The division now occupied one line in close proximity to the enemy, who had taken up a position in the rear of Piper's house. Colonel Dwight Morris, with the 14th Connecticut, and a detachment of the 108th New York of General French's division, was sent by General French to the support of General Richardson's division. This command was now placed in an interval in the line between General Caldwell's and the Irish Brigades. The requirements of the extended line of battle had so engaged the artillery that, that the application of General Hancock for artillery for the division could not be complied with immediately by the Chief of Artillery or the Corps commanders in his vicinity. Knowing the tried courage of the troops, General Hancock felt confident that he could hold his position, although suffering from the enemy's artillery, but was too weak to attack as the great length of the line he was obliged to hold prevented him from forming more than one line of battle and from his advanced position this line was already partly enfiladed by the batteries of the enemy on the right, which were protected from our batteries opposite them by the woods at the Dunker Church. Seeing a body of the enemy advancing on some of our troops to the left of his position, General Hancock obtained Hexamer's battery from General Franklin's Corps, which assisted materially in frustrating this attack. It also assisted the attack of the 7th Maine of Franklin's Corps, which, without other aid, made an attack against the enemy's line, and drove in skirmishers who were annoying our artillery and troops on the right. Lieutenant Woodruff, with Battery I, 2nd Artillery, relieved Captain Hexamer, whose ammunition was expended. The enemy at one time seemed to be about making an attack in force upon this part of the line, and advance a long column of infantry towards this division. But on nearing the position, General Pleasanton, opening on them with 16 guns, they halted, gave a desultory fire, and retreated. 
closing the operations on this portion of the field. I return to the incidents occurring still further to the right. Between 12 and 1 p.m., General Franklin's Corps arrived on the field of battle, having left their camp near Crampton's Pass at 6 a.m., leaving General Couch with orders to move with his division to occupy Maryland Heights. General Smith's division led the column, followed by General Slocum's. It was first intended to keep this corps in reserve on the east side of the Antietam, to operate on either flank or on the center, as circumstances might require. But on nearing Keatesville, the strong opposition on the right, developed by the attacks of Hooker and Sumner, rendered it necessary at once to send this corps to the assistance of the right wing. On nearing the field, hearing that one of our batteries, a 4th U.S. artillery commanded by Lieutenant Thomas, who occupied the same position as Lieutenant Woodruff's battery in the morning, was hotly engaged without supports, General Smith sent two regiments to its relief from General Hancock's brigade. On inspecting the ground, General Smith ordered the other regiments of Hancock's brigade, with Franks and Cowan's batteries, 1st New York Artillery, to the threatened position. Lieutenant Thomas and Captain Cothran, commanding batteries, bravely held their positions against the advancing enemy, handling their batteries with skill. Finding the enemy still advancing, the 3rd Brigade of Smith's division, commanded by Colonel Irvin, 49th Pennsylvania Volunteers, was ordered up and passed through Lieutenant Thomas's battery, charged upon the enemy, and drove back the advance until abreast of the Dunker Church. As the right of the brigade came opposite the woods, it received a destructive fire, which checked the advance and threw the brigade somewhat into confusion. It formed again behind a rise of ground in the open space in advance of the batteries. General French, having reported to General Franklin that his ammunition was nearly expended, that officer ordered General Brooks with his brigade to reinforce him. General Brooks formed his brigade on the right of General French, where they remained during the remainder of the day and night, frequently under the fire of the enemy's artillery. It was soon after the brigade of Colonel Irvin had fallen back behind the rise of ground that the 7th Maine, by order of Colonel Irvin, made the gallant attack already referred to. The advance of General Franklin's corps was opportune. The attack of the enemy on this position, but for the timely arrival of his corps, must have been disastrous, had it succeeded in piercing the line between Generals Sedgwick's and French's divisions. General Franklin ordered two brigades of General Slocum's division, General Newton's and Colonel Torbert's, to form in column to assault the woods that had been so hotly contested before by Generals Sumner and Hooker. General Bartlett's brigade was ordered to form as a reserve. At this time, General Sumner, having command on the right, directed further offensive operations to be postponed, as the repulse of this, the only remaining corps available for attack, would peril the safety of the whole army. General Porter's Corps, consisting of General Sykes' division of regulars and volunteers, and General Morrell's division of volunteers, occupied a position on the east side of Antietam Creek, upon the main turnpike leading to Sharpsburg, and directly opposite the center of the enemy's line. This corps filled the interval between the right wing and General Burnside's command, and guarded the main approach from the enemy's position to our trains of supplies. It was necessary to watch this part of our line with the utmost vigilance, lest the enemy should take advantage of the first exhibition of weakness here to push upon us a vigorous assault for the purpose of piercing our center and turning our rear, as well as to capture or destroy our supply trains. Once having penetrated this line, the enemy's passage to our rear could have met with but feeble resistance, as there were no reserves to reinforce or close up the gap. Towards the middle of the afternoon, proceeding to the right, I found that Sumner's, Hooker's, and Mansfield's corps had met with serious losses. Several general officers had been carried from the field, severely wounded, and the aspect of affairs was anything but promising. At the risk of greatly exposing our center, I ordered two brigades from Porter's corps, the only available troops, to reinforce the right. Six battalions of Sykes regulars had been thrown across the Antietam Bridge on the main road to attack and drive back the enemy's sharpshooters, who were annoying Pleasanton's horse batteries in advance of the bridge. Warren's brigade of Porter's corps was detached to hold a position on Burnside's right and rear, so that Porter was left at one time with only a portion of Sykes' division and one small brigade of Morrell's division, but little over 3,000 men, to hold this important position. General Sumner expressed the most decided opinion against another attempt during that day to assault the enemy's position in front, as portions of our troops were so much scattered and demoralized. In view of these circumstances, after making changes in the position of some of the troops, I directed the different commanders to hold their positions, 
and being satisfied that this could be done without the assistance of the two brigades from the center, I countermanded the order which was in course of execution. General Slocum's division replaced a portion of General Sumner's troops, and positions were selected for batteries in front of the woods. The enemy opened several heavy fires of artillery on the position of our troops after this, but our batteries soon silenced them. On the morning of the 17th, General Pleasanton, with his cavalry division and the horse batteries, under Captains Robertson, Tidball, and Lieutenant Haynes of the 2nd Artillery, and Captain Gibson, 3rd Artillery, was ordered to advance on the turnpike towards Sharpsburg across bridge number 2 and support the left of General Sumner's line. The bridge being covered by a fire of artillery and sharpshooters, cavalry skirmishers were thrown out, and Captain Tidball's battery advanced by piece and drove off the sharpshooters with canisters sufficiently to establish the batteries above mentioned, which opened on the enemy with effect. The firing was kept up for about two hours. When the enemy's fire slackening, the batteries were relieved by Randall's and Van Reed's batteries, U.S. artillery. About three o'clock, Tidball, Robertson, and Haynes returned to their positions on the west of Antietam, Captain Gibson having been placed in position on the east side to guard the approaches to the bridge. These batteries did good service, concentrating their fire on the column of the enemy about to attack General Hancock's position and compelling it to find shelter behind the hills in rear. General Sykes' division had been in position since the 15th, exposed to the enemy's artillery and sharpshooters. General Morrell had come up on the 16th and relieved General Richardson on the right of General Sykes. Continually under the vigilant watch of the enemy, this corps guarded a vital point. The position of the batteries under General Pleasanton being one of great exposure, the battalion of the 2nd and 10th U.S. Infantry under Captain Pollard, 2nd Infantry, was sent to his support. Subsequently, four battalions of regular infantry, under Captain Dreyer, 4th Infantry, were sent across to assist in driving off the sharpshooters of the enemy. The battalion of the 2nd and 10th Infantry, advancing far beyond the batteries, compelled the cannoneers of a battery of the enemy to abandon their guns. Few in numbers and unsupported, they were unable to bring them off. The heavy loss of this small body of men attests their gallantry. The troops of General Burnside held the left of the line opposite bridge number three. The attack on the right was to have been supported by an attack on the left. Preparatory to this attack on the evening of the 16th, General Burnside's corps was moved forward and to the left and took up a position nearer the bridge. I visited General Burnside's position on the 16th, and after pointing out to him the proper dispositions to be made of his troops during the day and night, informed him that he would probably be required to attack the enemy's right on the following morning, and directed him to make careful reconnaissances. General Burnside's corps, consisting of the divisions of Generals Cox, Wilcox, Rodman, and Sturgis, was posted as follows. Colonel Crook's brigade, Cox's division on the right, General Sturgis's division immediately in rear, on the left was General Rodman's division with General Scammon's brigade, Cox's division in support. General Wilcox's division was held in reserve. The Corps bivouacked in position on the night of the 16th. Early on the morning of the 17th, I ordered General Burnside to form his troops and hold them in readiness to assault the bridge in his front and to await further orders. At 8 o'clock, an order was sent to him by Lieutenant Wilson, topographical engineers, to carry the bridge, then to gain possession of the heights beyond, and to advance along their crest upon Sharpsburg and its rear. After some time had elapsed, not hearing from him, I dispatched an aide to ascertain what had been done. The aide returned with the information that but little progress had been made. I then sent him back with an order to General Burnside to assault the bridge at once and carry it at all hazards. The aide returned to me a second time with the report that the bridge was still in the possession of the enemy. Whereupon I directed Colonel Sackett, Inspector General, to deliver to General Burnside my positive order to push forward his troops without a moment's delay, and if necessary, to carry the bridge at the point of the bayonet, and I ordered Colonel Sackett to remain with General Burnside and see that the order was executed promptly. After these three hours' delay, the bridge was carried at one o'clock by a brilliant charge of the 51st New York and 51st Pennsylvania Volunteers. Other troops were then thrown over and the opposite bank occupied, the enemy retreating to the heights beyond. A halt was then made by General Burnside's advance until 3 p.m. Upon hearing which I directed one of my aides, Colonel Key, to inform General Burnside that I desired him to push forward his troops with the utmost vigor and carry the enemy's position on the heights, 
that the movement was vital to our success, that this was a time when we must not stop for loss of life, if a great object could thereby be accomplished, that if in his judgment his attack would fail to inform me so at once that his troops might be withdrawn and used elsewhere on the field. He replied that he would soon advance, and would go up the hill as far as a battery of the enemy on the left would permit. Upon this report, I again immediately sent Colonel Key to General Burnside with orders to advance at once, if possible to flank the battery or storm it and carry the heights, repeating that if he considered the movement impracticable, to inform me so that his troops might be recalled. The advance was then gallantly resumed, the enemy driven from the guns, the heights handsomely carried, and a portion of the troops even reached the outskirts of Sharpsburg. By this time it was nearly dark, and strong reinforcements just then reaching the enemy from Harper's Ferry attacked General Burnside's troops on their left flank and forced them to retire to a lower line of hills nearer the bridge. If this important movement had been consummated two hours earlier, a position would have been secured upon the heights from which our batteries might have enfiladed the greater part of the enemy's line and turned their right and rear. Our victory might thus have been much more decisive. The ground held by Burnside beyond the bridge was so strong that he ought to have repulsed the attack and held his own. He never crossed the bridge in person. The following is the substance of General Burnside's operation as given in his report. Colonel Crook's brigade was ordered to storm the bridge. This bridge, number three, is a stone structure of three arches with stone parapets. The banks of the stream on the opposite side are precipitous and command the eastern approaches to the bridge. On the hillside immediately by the bridge was a stone fence running parallel to the stream. The turns of the roadway as it wound up the hill were covered by rifle pits and breastworks of rails, etc. These works and the woods that covered the slopes were filled with the enemy's riflemen, and batteries were in position to enfilade the bridge and its approaches. General Rodman was ordered to cross the ford below the bridge. From Colonel Crook's position, it was found impossible to carry the bridge. General Sturgis was ordered to make a detail from his division for that purpose. He sent forward the 2nd Maryland and 6th New Hampshire. These regiments made several successive attacks in the most gallant style, but were driven back. The artillery of the left were ordered to concentrate their fire on the woods above the bridge. Colonel Crook brought a section of Captain Simmons' battery to a position to command the bridge. The 51st New York and 51st Pennsylvania were then ordered to assault the bridge. Taking advantage of a small spur of the hills which ran parallel to the river, they moved towards the bridge. From the crest of the spur, they rushed with bayonets fixed and cleared the bridge. The division followed the storming party, also the brigade of Colonel Crook, as support. The enemy withdrew to still higher ground, some five or six hundred yards beyond, and opened a fire of artillery on the troops in the new positions on the crest of the hill above the bridge. General Rodman's division succeeded in crossing the ford after a sharp fire of musketry and artillery, and joined on the left of Sturgis, Scammon's brigade crossing as support. General Wilcox's division was ordered to cross to take position on General Sturgis's right. These dispositions being completed about three o'clock, the command moved forward, except Sturgis's division left in reserve. Clark's and Darrell's batteries accompanied Rodman's division, Cook's battery with Wilcox's division, and a section of Simmons' battery with Colonel Cook's brigade. A section of Simmons' battery and Muhlenberg's and McMullen's batteries were in position. The order for the advance was obeyed by the troops with alacrity. General Wilcox's division, with Cook in support, moved up on both sides of the turnpike, leading from the bridge to Sharpsburg. General Rodman's division, supported by Scammon's brigade, on the left of General Wilcox. The enemy retreated before the advance of the troops. The 9th New York of General Rodman's division captured one of the enemy's batteries and held it for some time. As the command was driving the enemy to the main heights on the left of the town, the light division of General A.P. Hill arrived upon the field of battle from Harper's Ferry, and with a heavy artillery fire made a strong attack on the extreme left. To meet this attack, the left division diverged from the line of march intended and opened a gap between it and the right. To fill up this, it was necessary to order the troops from the second line. During these movements, General Rodman was mortally wounded. Colonel Harlan's brigade of General Rodman's division was driven back. Colonel Scammon's brigade, by a change of front to rear on his right flank, saved the left from being driven completely in. The fresh troops of the enemy pouring in and the accumulation of artillery against this command destroyed all hope of its being able to accomplish anything more. It was now nearly dark. General Sturgis was ordered forward to support the left. 
Notwithstanding the hard work in the early part of the day, his division moved forward with spirit. With its assistance, the enemy were checked and held at bay. The command was ordered to fall back by General Cox, who commanded on the field the troops engaged in this affair beyond the Antietam. Night closed the long and desperately contested battle of the 17th. Nearly 200,000 men and 500 pieces of artillery were for 14 hours engaged in this memorable battle. We had attacked the enemy in a position selected by the experienced engineer then in person directing their operations. We had driven them from their line on one flank and secured a footing within it on the other. The Army of the Potomac, notwithstanding the moral effect incident to previous reverses, had achieved a victory over an adversary invested with the prestige of recent successes. Our soldiers slept that night conquerors of a field won by their valor and covered with the dead and wounded of the enemy. Thirteen guns, thirty-nine colors, upwards of fifteen thousand stands of small arms, and more than six thousand prisoners were the trophies which attest the success of our arms in the battles of South Mountain, Crampton's Gap, and Antietam. Not a single gun or color was lost by our army during these battles. When I was on the right of the afternoon of the 17th, I found the troops a good deal shaken, that is, some of them who had been in the early part of the action. Even Sedgwick's division commenced giving way under a few shots from a battery that suddenly commenced firing from an unexpected position. I had to ride in and rally them myself. Sedgwick had been carried off very severely wounded. The death of Mansfield, the wounding of Hooker, Richardson, and Sedgwick were irreparable losses in that part of the field. It was this afternoon, when I was on the right, that on the field of battle I gave Hancock a division, that of Richardson, who was mortally wounded. Early next morning, the 18th, Burnside sent to ask me for a fresh division to enable him to hold his own. I sent word that I could send none until I came myself to see the state of affairs, and in a few minutes rode over there and carefully examined the position. Burnside told me that his men were so demoralized and so badly beaten the day before that were they attacked, they would give way. I told him I could see no evidence of that, but that I would lend him Morell's division for a short time, though I would probably need it again elsewhere in a few hours. I instructed him to place one brigade on some heights that ran across the valley on our left, in order to cover the left flank, the rest on the heights and rear of the bridge to cover the retreat of his men, should that prove necessary. The division was accordingly sent to him, and towards evening I learned that he had thrown it across the river and withdrawn his own men, his excuse to me being that he could not trust his men on the other side. The evening before he was at my headquarters and told some of my aides that his men were badly beaten. Long afterwards I learned from Colonel Griff Stedman, 11th Connecticut Regiment, that on the night of the 17th he was with his then Colonel, Kingsbury, who was mortally wounded and lying in a house on our side of the bridge, close to it. Burnside came by and gave orders for the wounded to be removed still further to the rear, stating that the corps were entirely defeated and demoralized, and that the house in question would soon be occupied by the enemy. As Kingsbury was in no condition to be removed, Stedman determined to remain with him and share his fate. It is needless to say that the house was not occupied by the enemy, and that Burnside was in no condition to know the real state of his command, as he had not been with it but I have mentioned enough to show what his real opinions and state of mind were on the evening of the 17th and the morning of the 18th. Yet, in face of all this, he subsequently testified before the Committee on the Conduct of the War that he had, on the morning of the 18th, asked me for the reinforcement of a division to enable him to renew the attack, stating at the same time that his men were in superb condition, ready for any work, and that I had committed a great error in not renewing the battle early on the morning of the 18th. The real facts, so far as Burnside was concerned, were as I have given them above. But although his men were not, perhaps, in magnificent condition, they were by no means so demoralized as he represented them to be. I cannot, from my long acquaintance with Burnside, believe that he would deliberately lie, but I think that his weak mind was turned, that he was confused in action, and that subsequently he really did not know what had occurred, and was talked by his staff into any belief they chose. I have only averted to the very pernicious effects of Burnside's inexcusable delay in attacking the bridge and the heights in rear. What is certain is that if Porter or Hancock had been in his place, the town of Sharpsburg would have been ours. Hill would have been thrown back into the Potomac, and the Battle of Antietam would have been very decisive in its results. Brackets. 
in a monograph prepared by General William B. Franklin, in memory of General McClellan, that distinguished soldier thus speaks of the Maryland campaign and its results, and especially of the result of the Battle of Antietam. Without orders placing him in command other than the verbal request of the President, and without orders of any kind from anyone, he started on the Maryland campaign to find the enemy, who had been so foolish as to invade a state which had remained true to the Union. The victories of Turner's and Crampton's Gaps, of South Mountain, and of Antietam, were the results, the last battle followed by the hurried retreat of General Lee beyond the Potomac. History will some day tell why the Confederate Army was not driven into the Potomac instead of across it. It will show that its escape was not due to want of generalship of the commanding general, nor to the absence of necessary orders to subordinates. At the time of his death, General McClellan was about to write a condensed account of the Battle of Antietam for the Century Magazine. He had reviewed the events preceding South Mountain when his pen was arrested. From among the papers found lying on his writing table, where he had left them four hours before his death, the editor regards the letters of General Sackett, which here follow, as important to be published for the purposes of that history, which has not heretofore been written. End brackets. Letters from General Sackett. February 20th, 1876. My dear General, in reply to your note, I will state that, at about nine o'clock on the morning of the Battle of Antietam, you told me to mount my horse and to proceed as speedily as possible with orders directing General Burnside to move his troops across the bridge or stream in his front at once, and then to push them forward vigorously without a moment's delay to secure the heights beyond. You, moreover, directed me to remain with General Burnside until I saw his troops well underway up the heights in the direction of Sharpsburg, and then to return and report to you. I started at once as fast as my horse could carry me. I found General Burnside on an elevated point near the position of Lieutenant Benjamin's 20-pounder battery, commanding an extensive view of the battlefield. I gave him your orders, which seemed to annoy him somewhat, as he said to me, McClellan appears to think I am not trying my best to carry this bridge. You are the third or fourth one who has been to me this morning with similar orders. I told him I knew you were exceedingly anxious and regarded his getting across the stream and moving on Sharpsburg with rapidity and vigor at once as of vital importance to a complete success. General Burnside ordered assaults to be made on the bridge, which were for a long time unsuccessful. I had been at his headquarters for fully three hours when Colonel Key arrived from your headquarters with positive orders to push across the bridge and to move rapidly up the heights, to carry the bridge at the point of the bayonet if necessary, and not stop for loss of life as sacrifices must be made in favor of success. As soon as Colonel Key had gone, I suggested to General Burnside, were he to go down near the bridge, his presence among the troops could have the effect to encourage and stimulate the men to renewed efforts. He said he would, and immediately mounted his horse and rode in the direction of the bridge, but soon returned saying the bridge had been carried and the troops were crossing over as rapidly as possible. He likewise mentioned at this time that Colonel Henry Kingsbury had been mortally wounded in the assault on the bridge. General Burnside at once issued instructions for the move in the direction of Sharpsburg, but for some unaccountable reason things moved slowly and there was a long delay in getting the troops in motion. Colonel Key again returned with instructions to General Burnside to push forward his troops rapidly and with vigor to secure the heights, as every moment gained was of utmost importance to our success. I remained with General Burnside until his troops were well and seemingly successfully underway up the heights they having gallantly driven the enemy from the field for fully one-half the distance in the direction of Sharpsburg. Seeing this and everything apparently going well, I returned to headquarters, where I found General Fitzjohn Porter, you being away temporarily on a visit to the right of the battlefield. It was at this time past four o'clock in the afternoon. It was not long after this that the check and repulse of General Burnside's advance was witnessed. Often since that time I have thought what a serious misfortune was the death of the noble and energetic Reno. Had not that chivalric soldier fallen at South Mountain, Antietam certainly would have been, in its results, a very different affair. It would have been one of the most, if not the most, complete and important battle of the war. I am, General, very truly yours, D.B. Sackett, Inspector General, USA, to General George B. McClellan. New York City, March 9, 1876. My dear General, I will state in respect to a conversation had in my presence between General Burnside and yourself that late in the evening on the day of the Battle of Antietam, I was with you in your tent when General Burnside entered. 
The position occupied and the condition of his command became at once the topic of conversation with you two. As I understood the matter, General Burnside desired to withdraw his troops to the left bank of the stream, giving as a reason for the move the dispirited condition of his men, stating further that if he remained in his present position, an attack was made by the enemy, he very much feared the result. You replied, General, your troops must remain where they are and must hold their ground. General Burnside then said, If I am to hold this position at all hazards, I must be largely reinforced. And, if not much mistaken, he mentioned the number of men necessary for the purpose at 5,000. You then replied, with emphasis, General, I expect you to hold your own and with the force now under your command. At this point, other general officers arrived and I left the tent and heard nothing more of the conversation. Afterward, in looking over General Burnside's testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, I was a good deal surprised to read, I went to General McClellan's tent, and in course of conversation I expressed the same opinion that the attack might be renewed the next morning at five o'clock, and told him that if I could have five thousand fresh troops to pass in advance of my line, I would be willing to commence the attack on the next morning. This statement brought back to my mind vividly that evening's conversation after Antietam, the conversation between General Burnside and yourself as I heard it, and General Burnside's testimony before the committee, differ widely. I may be mistaken, but it has always appeared to me that the conversation to which I was a witness, and the statement made before the War Committee, must have referred to one and the same matter, the fighting condition of General Burnside's command on the night after the Battle of Antietam. I am General, very truly yours, D.B. Sackett, Inspector General USA, to General George B. McClellan. End of chapter 36